Right, so hmm. um, there's obviously three cameras. That one will look at you specifically. You can see that in the top left-hand corner. That one looks at all of us, and yep. that one looks at me. Nice. But we're not. I'll do a bit of talking to camera, especially during the intro and the outro. Yeah. But typically, all it is is us have a chat, and the camera angles. I then pull that in as a single file, layer it three times, and pick the camera angle that's yeah. best. Yeah. Yeah. Similar to what you guys used to do, yeah. basically. I mean, if I need to wink at the camera, then I'll look at that one. And <laughs> yeah, that's the one to look at, basically. That's the one that's focused <laughs> on me. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for joining us on what we've now called Sagas from the Great Hall. I can't remember who gave us that name suggestion, but thank you so much. You are a legend. And today we have another special guest. So you've probably seen the War Hipster episode. You've probably seen the Siege episode. If you're watching this at the day it goes live on YouTube, thank you so much, because it goes live to our members five days early for early access. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. You guys are incredible. If you're watching this after the fact, you can get early access to these episodes in the future if you become a member of the channel. Uh, but otherwise, we do put it out for free for everybody anyway. And this one's going to be going out for free for definite because we do have an incredibly special guest. Uh, I'm humbled and amazed that I have you sat with me. Welcome, Mr. Peachy. Thank you for having me. Hello, everybody. I, 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 I'm a little bit blown away by it, quite honestly. Why? Uh, you came on our channel. So, well, no, I know. <laughs> some, some people probably, most people probably know, some people won't know. Uh, Peachy is formerly of Painting Phase fame and probably more prominently, Warhammer TV fame. Mm. And that's where I obviously started watching you was back on Warhammer TV ages and ages ago. So to have you sat here in my little humble studio, three episodes into my new series, I was like really excited for this. I love how you say humble studio, it's amazing. It, oh, it's like we've got axes, we've got furs. No, not real furs, Peter, before you get like, you know. There they are. Yeah. Oh, they, oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real deer fur. Just <laughs> <laughs> a foe. They are foe ethically foe. sourced real deer, deer furs. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. are ethically, ethically sourced. They are ethically sourced real deer furs. Yeah. But yeah, um, uh, we started, I, I wanted to do a show like this for ages and we didn't have the space previously because mm. of my old studio was in the garage, as we spoke about when, when I came on the painting phase. Uh, and I really wanted to get it going. And then when you started doing your talk shows on the painting phase, inviting guests, I was like, the bastards, they've done it before me. <laughs> it took me ages to get this studio and get it. Anyway, uh, here we sorry, are. Sorry. We have PG here. <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to talk about kind of where you came from, where you've got to, where you are now, what you're looking to do in the future. Uh, and then what we do have uh, on every single one of these episodes is we do have the Thane's questions. Th Thane's unfiltered, I like to call it, because I'm like, you can ask him literally anything. Ooh, so yeah. far, they've majority been sensible. Oh. Majority. I'm disappointed. Yeah, James. Disappointed things. James from Siege got asked if he'd accept sexual favours as a payment for commission services. Mm -hmm. Josh got asked weirdest place he'd had sex. So that's about as weird as it's got so far. Ah, right. Yeah, okay. I know. Good I keep telling them they can ask anything. <laughs> but we'll have a look at that. I haven't looked at the questions. We'll get to that part later. Uh, so, uh, one of the most exciting. Well, th this is actually probably a month later than we would have liked. Yeah, yeah. But that's because stuff's happened, mm. and you now have your own brand new, shiny, sparkly, sparkly. YouTube channel. Yeah, that's that's mad. I, I When we chatted last time, it was like I was going to come down, because half terms are great, because normally getting childcare cover and all that kind of stuff is a bit, bit of a nightmare. But I was like, yeah, I'll just do it during March, half term, February yeah. half term, whenever it was. And I was like, uh, Liam, I've left, I've got to... I'm starting a channel, I don't think I can do February half to <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get loads of stuff. I need to make some videos and shit. I, I kind of made myself a bit of a, I, I don't know what you're going to call it, a bit of a mountain to climb because I was like, I've left, it was like start of February left and I was like, I want to launch in March. Yeah. And then I had a four weeks of learning, editing, Premiere Pro, filming, and that was fun. So, mm. so if we talk about the YouTube channel quickly, Peachy Tips it's called. As always with all the guests, I'll link everything below. Mm. Not that you'll probably need it, but I'll link the YouTube channel below, I'll link the Instagram page below. It's called Peachy Tips, and it's about, well it's a bit of, so far from what I've seen, it's a bit all over the place. It is a bit all over the place, yeah. <laughs> so you so, don't really say it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of things I want to do, is one, just scratch some itches, get some paint guides out. Yeah. Um, and because it's called Peachy Tips, the kind of, there's going to be a lot of that, like hacks that I've learned things to help stuff get on the tabletop, because there's way too many guides, which are all good, by the way. I'm gonna put that out there. There's lots of guides out there that teach you how to paint models really nicely. But there's not many guides that help you get from not knowing anything about painting to knowing something about painting. Yeah. And a lot of us don't have much time in the evenings, because we might be at school, parents, college, uni, whatever. Um, and a lot of these guides that you see, someone sat for eight hours doing a, a film, it's great. That's an eight hour model. Yeah. But that's a rank and file guy. You've got to do 10 more of those. Yeah. So that's eight hours worth of work. So it's not ideal for someone that doesn't have much time or just wants to get stuff on the tabletop. So I'm trying to do a bunch of hacks, videos to cover that, but also just other random stuff that I, I like doing. Like I want to do a video on Sharp, which I've done. 
that. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, what, what, uh, that's at least one every, I, I reckon one a quarter, maybe. Okay. <laughs> I mean, one reasonable. shot related content or a Sean Bean related content. Um, but yeah, then there's other stuff like talking about like some of the processes because I, I asked my patrons what they, they'd like to see and they want to know more about like how I go about creating colour schemes, how I go about creating narratives. So I was like, oh, that'd be an interesting video. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just trying lots of different styles as well to see if some do better than others. But really, at the end of the day, I want to do lots of painting as well. So it's a bit of a mix. And across a month, I'd like to do a broad spectrum. A few people have said it's better to keep to one subject, like 40K or Warhammer. I think if I start broad, then people understand that and it won't, I won't be tied down to any yeah. kind of like weird limits. So in a, in a month, there'll be a 40K related content, which could be used for anything. There'll be Age of Sigma or Warhammer related content, which could be used for anything, something historical, and then something else. Yeah. I mean, I want to you know, do guides on how to paint G.I. Joe. I want to do guides on how to paint, I don't know, Infinity or anything like that. There's so much stuff out there and I'm just scratching the surface off. But yeah, it's a mix at the minute. It's well, I mix. think the thing is, so we, uh, historically on the channel, predominantly, almost entirely focused for us, at least on 40K. And we have recently started to get quite excited about the new announcement for Age of Sigmar 4, mm. uh, Edition 4. And we're getting, um, we're getting some stuff ready for that. It's actually been uh, genuinely, for me specifically, I think Joe's found this the same, it's been quite refreshing and quite invigorating because, hey, what, there is a world outside of 40K. Now, 40K forever has been our main focus. And I think mm. because it's such a big portion, it has such a dominant sort of... Uh, has such a domination of the hobby, f the sort of scene in general. I feel like it's easy to forget that bolt yeah. action exists and Napoleonics exist and all these other games exist. Um, so I, I, I've on a couple of occasions, I think, found a little bit of a, uh, I've had a bit of a burnout feel. I guess is where I'd go with it. With 40k, where I'm like, I don't really want to talk about 40k yeah. today, but my channel's 40k, so I kind of have to. Yeah, yeah. And you, you sort of battle through and you get through it. So I know people have probably told you focus on one thing. I'd actually always nowadays when I talk to people, advise the opposite. Yeah. Because the diversity probably keeps it fresh for you. And you'd be like, so yesterday, uh, we do hobby, I do hobby streams on Monday nights now. Uh, and yesterday I was like, I should finish painting the Stormcast I started painting last Monday, but I don't want to. And I, was, I, had, to, I had a 10 minute battle in my mind. I was like, I should, because people would expect it, but I don't want to. And I found on YouTube, if you're doing the stuff you want to do yeah. and having more fun, yeah. it's just better content. Well, people can see you enjoying it. Exactly. And that's the key. So a lot of the stuff I've done at the moment, I've just it's just stuff I want to do or try and I've enjoyed doing it. Um, whereas like with Workshop, when I was there, um, it, we used to call it organised fun um, <laughs> because it was like, you must do this or you must feature this. Like, like for instance, like Warcry came out. That was like big and popular. I really enjoyed Warcry. I was getting into Warcry. And then suddenly I was like, no, you must stop caring about Warcry now, you need to care about this new thing. I was like, but I like that thing. <laughs> I've enjoyed doing that thing. I have no, I, I, I'm not interested in Underworlds whatsoever. I like the models for under, Underworlds because yeah. I use them in Warcry, but you know, I don't, I care, don't care about, about the game. game. Yeah. yeah, and it was always like, no, you must do this thing. I was like, I'm just gonna paint some stuff that's Underworlds and say it's for Underworlds or whatever. But it was, it was always a bit sort of, I don't know, fake and I didn't like that. And I just want to do stuff that I enjoy doing. And there, there is a big, I wouldn't say a big problem, but I found like so many other channels suffer with, if it's not 40K, they don't get the, the views. It's true, it's um, true. And I'm, and I'm trying to not let the views bother me at the moment. I think it depends on, so I actually, I think it depends on uh, why people are watching the content in the, first, exactly. in the first instance. So if they're watching the content because they're 40K fans, then yeah, you'll, you'll typically notice a drop off in views, I think, if you do something different. Yeah. If they're watching, what we're trying to do is we're trying to sell the people the, and we're trying to sell the presenters to the audience. So if they're watching the people and they're engaging with the people and they, uh, they sort of feel relatable at least, um, they'll typically watch them play anything. Yeah. And that's what we've been trying to do over the last six months is be like, hey, we're a bunch of people just having fun playing with dice. Uh, so it doesn't actually matter whether we're playing Bolt Action yeah. or Warcry or Sigma or 40K or whatever. Um, hopefully people will see. And it, so far the feedback's pretty good, that's working. Yeah, yeah. So I think like, I, I, I don't think focusing on a single thing makes a lot of sense. In the, uh, I guess in the early stages, it's probably the quickest route to growth yeah. we found, yeah, definitely, yeah. because you get like the real focused audience coming in. But yeah, so, so have you found what we are now? Currently at the day of filming, depending on when you're watching this, we're like <laughs> mid-April mid nearly. Yeah. Have you found the YouTube journey so far? Good. Uh, not many knobheads. Uh, so, that, that, I, I, I mean, I'm still in the honeymoon period. Yeah, exactly. So, I was about to say, uh, wait. <laughs> there's been a few like people, but one of the things I've, I've tried to do is when I've released a video, I'll try and release it to the patrons first. Yeah. And I want to give them the chance to give feedback on the video. And if it just gets slated, I won't put it out to YouTube. Um, okay. I, 
a lot of the stuff I'm doing, and this this is my angle, and I, and I know a few other content creators do it. They they focus their efforts on the patrons because they're the ones that are supporting them. So I'm I literally go, this is what I'm planning this month. What do you guys think? Or you got any ideas of videos you want to see? And then yeah. I'm doing some shorts this week because it's it's a busy week. So I'm just doing a couple of shorts on like painting black armor, quick ways of painting black armor, quick ways of fixing. Because I did a video where I was doing like edge highlights and it looked awful and I was like how to fix your awful edge, highli edge highlights on a model and I was like that makes great content it's useful because so many people scuff up on like the yeah, edge yeah, highlights yeah. so actually it's more beneficial um but yeah so a lot of my focus is on on stuff for the patrons and they're quite honest and they give me feedback early days it's like oh you're a bit blue on the camera or it's a bit dark or this that and the other and then I had a not a meltdown but I had a bit of an issue where <laughs> my, nothing would just export yeah. I'd, I'd do a video and it wouldn't export. It panned out that, I'd, and I didn't know this, that Premiere Pro saves us a second amount of it. Yep. So you've got double the amount of storage being used. Yep. And I didn't know this. So I had like five or six videos. I was like, where's all my storage space come? Which is why it wasn't exporting. And then I discovered that and a few people helped me out and stuff like that. So that side of the journey, like learning editing uh, is new. YouTube, I kind of, I've got my head around to a certain degree. It's just the get the thumbnail right and the yeah. title really. Um, I use something called VidIQ, which kind of rates your titles. And I'm like, oh, I thought it was really catchy, but VidIQ says it's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? And AI Should knows I... best. Yeah, AI knows best. <laughs> and then sometimes I just ignore it and it does all right. So yeah. I think sometimes it depends on the topic. And I've, I've been like watching loads of videos like, actually, it doesn't matter about the length of the title as long as the first few words that you see before it goes dot, 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 dot are the things that people click on. That That's the important. But you could have... Because some people will like go, this is VOD 0013. And be like, oh, that's a invigorating title. I'm going to watch that. You could add that at the very end. You could then go, how to send cheese into space. Episode. VOD, yeah, yeah, yeah. 0083. Um, which, obviously, I'd click on. Because I'm like, I want to know how to send cheese into space. That's yeah. amazing. Well, the moon's made out of cheese. Yeah, well, exactly. Absolutely. Well, you're sending it back. We're giving it a bit back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it is interesting. YouTube is is like yeah, like we said earlier before we went live, like you know, finger in the air. It is well. So we, like I said, we did, we recently celebrated the channel's seventh birthday. Oh. I've been doing it for seven years. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've That's been awesome. doing it seriously for two and a half years, but we've been doing it for seven years, and for the whole seven years, it's finger in the air. What's very interesting is some of the things like that thing you said with Premiere Pro, where it. Does, I, I went through that. I've done that whole thing. And I'm sat there going, I remember that. I remember that years ago going, how have I got no space left on this hard drive? What's going on? And my mate, who's a video editor, was like, have you deleted all your cached files? Uh, have I done what? Yeah, I went yeah, and found yeah. it's like, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Andy Bradbury, because he did the exact same conversation with me. Yeah. He was like, well, do this, do this, do this. I was like, thank you so much, Andy. Because <laughs> my mate, John, who, uh, so he owned a video production company. When I got started on YouTube, I'd been filming with him originally. That's why I was like, oh, I want to have a go at this myself. So I sort of fundamentally understood how YouTube worked because I've been doing some of it with him. Mm. But didn't, I'd never edited a video before, never recorded a thing in my life. So I, I said, which is the best software? He said, Premiere Pro, because he does it for a living. Yeah. And so I, I bought it, downloaded it, and he took me through some quick tutorials so I could get going, which was great. It was incredible. And I'm always grateful to him for that. Showed me some shortcuts and set some things up. But I never knew that it did things like so, so And I, what, I've, what I always love, one of the things I love the most is going, I want to do this. Yeah, yeah. Whatever this might be. And I don't know how, and, but there's a world of knowledge out yeah, there on yeah. Google and on YouTube, and you, yeah. can you can almost always find out how to do that. Yeah. And when you do it, what makes me laugh the most is, well, I don't know if you've had this experience yet, but what makes me laugh the most is when you spend four hours to work out how to do something, and you do it, and you put it on, the, you put it on YouTube, and you're like, no one's noticed. <laughs> Yeah. No one, no one knows how much effort's gone yeah. into that that little thing I've just done. I did exactly that. So I, I tried to build up a, a a repository of videos. Panned out. I only managed to get three or four done before launch. I was hoping to get like eight or so. Yeah. But because of like issues of like editing and stuff, I, I was being a bit too ambitious. I think. Okay. But I got three Space Moon videos, and I was going to launch them all in one go. And then someone said, "Don't launch them all in one go." Someone else said, "Yeah, it might. You know, there'll be something for someone to watch straight after." So I decided to space it across a weekend. But I thought, oh, "I'll do a trailer. I'll do a trailer, and I'll just take some of the bits of painting from each of them, and then knit it all, knit it all together, yeah. and make. Oh, can I make them flat? You know, when there's like beats in the music, can I make like the thing change? Is that a thing?" So I typed a really long sort of question into uh, into Google, and there was a. A YouTube video that showed you how to do it, and it was like the easiest thing in the world. I was so proud because, like, it just every time there was like a beat in the music, it changed from one bit of footage to the next. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is amazing. No one cared. <laughs> you care. <laughs> I care. But I think the thing from that is, and this is the, the thing I'm trying to do with every video, is learn something new or tweak something yeah. or get better at something each time. Um, and 
my audio was a bit awful to start off with because I couldn't get rid of this crackle, so I'd have music running at the bottom, yeah. like quite silently. I'm so embarrassed about my dwarf video. So I did it on my, my PC, it was fine. Put it on my phone, sounded fine. Then when I hit live, my wife started, because she's very supportive, she started watching it on YouTube as well. And I always get cringy listening to myself. I'm like, can you? I used to. I'm like, can you just watch that somewhere else? <laughs> and then she starts watching it. I'm just talking about like my experience of dwarves. And I just wanted to talk about dwarves anyway, because um, Old World was coming out. And there's two key points where the music just goes really loud and you can't hardly hear what I'm saying. And I just cringe and I had to hide in like a spare room, just like, I can't stop it now because thousands of people have watched it and this is so awful. So many people commented, but really at the end of the day, it was just a learning. Oh, I absolutely hate and love those moments at the yeah. same time. And I hate them because they happen. Yeah. But I love them because you learn. And we, we, I've said this to a number of people. I said this to when we had James on the channel. My very first ever video that I made, the very first ever one that I made for 40K YouTube channel, it's not, it's unlisted right now. You can't go and find it because I hate it. <laughs> I absolutely hate it. But it, like I've said, I've said this a few times on the channel before, I've kept it because if I'm having a bad day and I can't get something to work or I'm having mm. a technical issue or whatever, Luce would be like, Watch the first video. Yeah, I'm like, I don't want to watch the first video. You put it on for five minutes. You go, okay. Yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've I, come light years from there. I'm like that when presenting, and when I was training up the new presenters that are still at uh, Warmer TV, because um, it's hard sometimes presenting to camera, especially when that red light's on. I mean, you don't have it on yours, but when that red light red light goes on, there's an extra added amount of pressure to yeah. talk to the camera, especially when you're in this very formal setting where you. And that was the thing I always found with like uh, the workshop. Uh, tutorials, I always felt they were quite formal. I couldn't really truly be myself when I was painting. And that might have been the format that was made or whatever, but I know the guys struggled. And I could see them getting a bit sort of like, oh, this is really hard and struggling on words. I was like, you know what you need? You need to watch my very first video. So I put my very first video on. It's god awful. For a laugh, right, just watch How to Paint Tyranid Warriors. And I literally look at the camera and go, I'm really excited about this video. There's no excitement there at all. I've had no sleep because my son's just been born. There's like a massive daylight bulb or beauty lamp in, your face. in my face. Yeah. I'm suffering from hay fever at the same time as well, <laughs> so I'm streaming. I was not excited about that painting video at any moment in time. Yeah. And, you, and it comes across, I'm just like, I'm, it's deadpan, it's awful, it's horrible. Everything about it is god awful. But uh, it's, it's a reference point. Now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so, so we're doing a bit of everything in terms of content. For painting. Now, yeah. I, like, I love the concept of, uh, of painting. So we were talking about this a little bit before we, mm. we sat down here with Joe. Um, who has watched tons of painting tutorials himself because Jay's our main painter here. And he said something which I 100% I agree with and I didn't think about it until he said it, where he talked about the work, the old workshop tutorials. Mm. Obviously, you were involved in some of them as well. And it's like, you watch them and they're incredibly detailed and they look fantastic. And the minute you finish and you're like, that's amazing. And then you have to do that on yeah. 47 other Marines. Yes. The yeah, same yeah. standard. Yeah. So we had Josh here a few weeks ago, the war hipster, um, and there's a show up with him that we did a, a three hour interview with him. He uses, his base that he uses on every single one of his models is contrast. Mm. Uh, and then he does the plus part where he goes in and layers afterwards. And his idea or his concept behind what he wanted to do was basically make painting more accessible for yeah. people. Yeah. So it sounds a little bit like you're kind of aiming at the same thing. Yeah, uh, it's, as an army painter, there are, th th there's, and I used to get this with like some of the army painters that would come in, they, they would, be so focused on the individual and not the army. Yeah. When you paint an army, it's that that it's that sort of spectacle that heavy metal would have for one figure that gets close-up photography. Your effort isn't going to be like you're painting everything to the neatest you can possibly. You're not picking out all those crisp highlights. You get you you're cutting corners, but you're looking at the army as a spectacle. Yeah. And that army is taking you a tenth of the time, quarter of the time, or whatever. Um, and there's so many like cheats and hacks and little efficiencies that you can do. Um, like one of the first videos I did, I don't know if it was 40K, but it was like showing how to paint space marines faster. And the, it's a big bugbear of mine, but there's so many guides out there showing you how to paint white. And I guess, you know, for like golden demon levels, you will start from black and then do gray and then a lighter gray and then a lighter gray mm -hmm. and eventually work yourself to white. Or if you're painting armies, you could just spray it white and then use what I call like the best white shade in the world, which is soul black gray. Apply that all over, because I've done so many videos now with like clone troopers, storm troopers, white scars, where I spray them white, pick out all the black bits, pick out all the red bits, pick out the guns, then tidy up with white because there's no wash on it. Because sometimes when you apply like washes, it changes the tone, right? So when yeah. you, it's harder to correct. So if you just get all the messy bits done in the base coat stage, washing with soul black gray, everything's done. 
it's like you don't have to worry about it. You could, you could literally just spray. I mean, I've done it many times with like clone troopers. I've, I've like sprayed like 10 clone troopers and done them in an evening, put the wash on, let them dry overnight. Well, I'm excited to see what you do because I've seen a, a bunch of tutorials. I've watched a ton of myself and uh, it has part of what you've just yeah. said in it. Like, it, like how, to paint, how to paint this space marine. Step one, uh, we said this with Josh, four easy steps. Step one, apply these 18 airbrush shapes yeah. <laughs> in order. It's not step one, is it? That's step yeah. one to 18. And, and I follow the guides, and I, you know, I followed, I followed GW guys in the past. I followed other painting guys from other people, and I paint a model, and it looks great. Yeah. And then I look at the, the shelf of the yeah. other twenty, and I'm like, I mean, oh, I don't want to. I guess that's the thing. Sometimes it's got you've got to learn or understand what that guide's for. If it's just to show one model and paint one model really well, then cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. If it's if you're trying to get from that, like I've seen like an Instart guide where it's like the highest end version of a, an Instart panel. Um, for, your, for your scenery, it's like, yeah, but you've got like 75 more panels to do. That, yeah. that, that is not achievable, but there's plenty out there that can help out with that. So I, I'd never like dismiss them um, as like great paint guides, but sometimes it's what's relevant to what you need. And I, and I think sometimes like people, viewers as well as presenters, sometimes forget who they're aiming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I know what my, my clientele is, is like people that don't have much time and want to get stuff painted. And I've had people request, like, we want to see some paint guides of you painting to the highest ability. I'm like, why? What are you going to get from that? I mean, I could show off my highest ability. I think that's probably what it is, though, isn't yeah. it? It's probably just a show off, yeah. ultimately. I mean, I mean, I can do that, but I don't know what I... I mean, other than maybe how to take things to the next level, Yeah, it's useful, and I might look at doing that anyway in guides, but I'm not sure what me showing off actually helps with you. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I want to do, so my dwarf video is... is for an example, and I'm still in debate, and I'll, I'll probably put a poll out on YouTube. In that video, it was just me talking about dwarfs, but in it, I just just, start, just went, I'm gonna stick a paint guide in it. I'm just gonna stick a paint guide in it, no one knows it's there, I'm just gonna stick a paint guide in it and see what happens. And the reason why I did that was like a mentality that I learned from uh, books and box games when I was at workshop. We used to do separate paint guides that would go alongside the codex. Okay. No one bought them. Then they started introducing the paint guide into things like the Age of Sigma Army books, because it was you're already buying the books, the contents there. So I thought I'd try that with the dwarf thing, and so many people had commented, going, "Wow, that was a nice surprise." I don't normally watch paint guides, but that was quite enjoyable. And I'm like, "Do I do that with every video, or do I not?" So I'm, it's something I'm still debating about. My wife's like, "No, do it as a separate but thing." She's got two videos. That's all part of that finger in the air, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. See what works. Yeah, because that would differentiate content at least from other people. Yeah. Um, because I feel like sometimes a lot of painting guides at least can feel quite similar. But I've often found, like I say, a lot of them are probably to a high level they're only. So Joe's been great for me with this, where he, he army paints for us and he paints very quickly to a, to a very good standard for what we need for camera. Mm. And the, for early days, I'd see some of the models he'd paint, I'd be like, well, there's no real like heavy edge highlighting there. He's like, no, Liam, because I'm painting the whole fucking army <laughs> and you want it ready in three weeks. <laughs> And then you put the whole arm on the table, you're like, ah. this looks really good. Yeah, yeah. You don't need all those edge highlights. No. This looks really good as a cohesive force. Granted, if you pick up the individual model, yeah, yeah. probably not going to win you a pin at Golden Demon. Yeah. But as a cohesive force, it looks amazing. And yeah. I think more people, I think there should be, my personal opinion is there should be more people out there that are encouraging people to aspire to that level yeah. rather than the Golden Demon kind of level. Yeah. Because I think it's just more accessible and it's easy to get, well, to get your hands on. I, I mean, I'm, you know, there's no sort of stat out there that I can pull up on, but. From being on that side of workshop and knowing how much tournaments are done and the numbers they looked at, like tournament gamers and Golden Demons, there's like, and this is probably being kind, uh, there's like 80% of people that probably don't do high end painting yeah, absolutely. and tournament play. They do like just fun games, armies for fun, and yeah. probably like most people don't have a couple of hours a, a, a week or something like that. And I, I know that is like, you know, 70% of the stats are made up, and that's probably like a made up set. Definitely, <laughs> um, but I, I generally think that it's, it's a large proportion of the hobbyists just want to paint stuff and play games with. Um, and I remember when I was uh, in in the studio because I'd do armies and every map were great because they'd come along and go, "How do you do that? How have you painted twenty guys in like four days? We're still on like two. So they appreciated the different skill set, and I was appreciated their skill set. Theirs was very inspirational, mm -hmm. aspirational, like the the, the things they can do. Um, but they also appreciate what I did. But then you'd get the odd hobbyist that was like a manager or a staff member that would pick up your, your, your figure from your regiment or whatever and see it as like a piece of rotten fruit. They'd be like, oh, 
oh, oh, and then put it back down. You're like, all right, mate, <laughs> why'd you neck in? It's just a soldier. It's meant to be in a unit of 20, not on its own. Yeah. But, you know, I don't paint the leather, I don't paint the pouches, I don't paint the boots because you never see them. Because no, well, when they're all ranked up and they've got shields and banners and stuff like that, you're never going to see the belts and the boots. Yeah. It's just a waste of time. I used to know a guy who used to highlight underneath the model, like all the bits, like underneath the shoe sometimes. I'm like, why are you highlighting underneath the shoe? You never, because they'd paint like grips. Oh, this, this, like, is where, <laughs> this is where I think, and we, I spoke about this at length with James, and, I, and I, I think sometimes social media hasn't necessarily done the hobby any favours, mm. because things like Instagram put in front of you all these incredible looking miniatures mm. by these amazing painters, and then suddenly it feels like that becomes what you see as the norm yeah, for yeah, like hobby yeah, painting yeah. Or, or miniature painting. And so you feel like, well, I should be painting pouches and highlighting little ammo pouches. Yeah, yeah. Why? If you don't need to, no one's going to see it. And I, the amount of people, I, I've, I've recently gone back to, a lot of people are going to hate me for this, and people are like, oh my God, sacrilege. But I've recently gone back to just sticking shields on. Yeah. And, and someone said, well, you can't paint behind it. I was like, no. It's shadow, innit? You fucking can't fucking see it. <laughs> Who cares? It's a shadow. Who cares? Uh, yeah. some, that makes some people itch when you're gluing, I'm gluing all the shields and all my cavalry on Age of Sigma right now. I'm like, I, I can't see behind it. If I can't get my brush there, I can't see it. So yeah. fuck it, who cares? Yeah. Um, and that, I'm getting into that actually now and I've started to enjoy painting a little bit more because I feel less stressed now. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a standard I need to get to or I want to get to for at least for camera. Um, but actually, does it need to be something that someone's going to pick up at a painting competition and go, that's in with a chance of winning? No, it absolutely doesn't. I mean, if I take my historical sort of like game inside of things, there's so many like really beautiful painters out there that do historical. Kevin Dallimore is one of them, really nice high art highlights and stuff, but he does it for photography. He's like the heavy metal of, because yeah. people want him to paint stuff for their website, right? And for their box packaging, he's going to make a good effort. But I bet you, if he was like doing it for himself, and yeah. I know like Dave Andrews, you know, he used to do lots, he's got huge armies, but he just base coats most of it. He just puts the effort in the face. It's like, it's, it's a wash and maybe a bit of a tidy up. Because you've Focus got, like, on the focal points. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And w when you've got like nice uh, sort of grass tufts and you've got like beautifully painted faces and you've got banners and stuff, it looks amazing. I, I don't sit there for ages like picking out all the pouches and the muskets and stuff like that. I just like a bit of brown, a bit of silver, a yeah. bit of grey. It looks fine. A bit of a wash. Done. Um, and yeah, I've, I, one of the recent videos I did was a markings one and, I, and something I try and do with the channel is show the mistakes because that was something I wasn't really allowed to do at workshop because it was like, oh, you know, we don't, we don't show mistakes because it looks like you've done it wrong. I'm like, no, but I want to show how to correct the thing if you do it wrong. Oh, p please. So it's like, <sighs> you're right. <laughs> It's one of my biggest bugbears about the workshop videos. There was a couple of occasions where they did, mm. if you slip and you get it on the white, this is how you correct it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, maybe they're going to turn a bit of a corner here. Uh, right, because yeah. I, I, like, I, I, again, I had this conversation with Josh, guaranteed, because and we said this up there, right? Yeah. So paint this part of the model in gold and paint all the gold detail, and then you get the, the whoosh, go, and everything's done. You're like, <laughs> huh? <laughs> that's all perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so I'm going to do, I'm going to pause the video, I'm going to start doing that a bit, and I start painting the gold, <laughs> right good okay so how do i how do i fix this bit now yeah, 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 <laughs> just yeah. fuck it up and they don't show you and i was like if, if you just had if you get the gold onto this bit of white armor this is what you do to fix it mm. it would have been so helpful but they never kind of showed that at all and i wonder if that was by design like if it was on purpose i assumed it was it, i think it's a quality thing it's almost like it, it I, I don't think it lessens the quality i think it, it helps the quality and you're always going to get like the people out there that like go, oh that's a really bad paint job and i got that to a certain degree with the markings one I purposely went in quite close because I was doing tiny little shields, showing real basic ways of like using a bit of masking tape. And I, I always put it out there as well, if you've got better ideas, drop it in the comments yeah. because some people have some great ideas. And one of the things I've never really thought about because I've done lots of markings over time and I've sponged it, is people say paint the colour that you're originally that's down there and then, then sponge over because it gives it a better seal. And when you take it off, you don't get like any bleed. But I don't mind a bit of bleed because it looks a bit chipped and battered depending on how much bleed you get. Um, there's one where I do like loads of like checks, but it's a really tiny shield. I blow it up really large, so it's quite bobbly and textural. Um, and there was like a couple of comments like, that's the worst check paint job I've ever seen in my life. I was like, yeah, it's also like a macro lens that's zoomed in really close <laughs> and I'm showing you how to fix it. But bearing in mind that when it's on a figure, it's like two arms lengths away and you can't, <laughs> I think you're overthinking it, dude. <laughs> this is army painting checks, not yeah. sort of like uh, heavy metal masterclass painting checks. Um, but I, I expect those kind of things, and because there are a lot of people that are set in their ways and like certain ways of painting, and don't like change or like how other people approach it, that's that's totally fine. But I definitely like to show the mistakes, and I make so many mistakes. I am a messy painter, and I and that's how I get my speed. Yes, yeah. I'm messy initially, and there's a little bit of tiny up here and there, 
But over the years of being quite messy, I've got quite fast and I've got a better muscle memory and I've carried on doing that. I make less mistakes now, but I still, what I'd consider quite a messy painter. But you know the cheats to, to yeah. solve that mess. Yeah, exactly. Well. I know that if I don't go all the way into a crack with like my flesh, I don't care because it's going to get a wash on it. That wash is going to go into the crack and darken that crack down. So I don't need to paint it as much. Uh, so there's so many little things that you learn over time that yeah. you can just like cut corners on. So you've talked a bit about workshop. Mm. Obviously, that's where I, I think most people would probably uh, accept the fact they probably predominantly know you from workshop from your time on Warhammer TV specifically. Yeah. That's certainly where I first saw you uh, before you then left and joined and joined Painting Phase. But I assume, I mean, I, I think it's probably knowledge. You didn't start in Warhammer TV. No. no. So uh, what was the what was the Games Workshop career Ooh, in well, a nutshell? It, everything I've done is by mistake or accident. <laughs> Uh, uh, honestly, there's like literally no sort of like, I'm going to be a YouTuber. There was no sort of like grandiose, my grandiose plan when I left uni was to be an illustrator. Okay. None of that happened. Because it's hard to be an illustrator at, at workshop because it's such a, not a dog eat dog, but there's so much talent. I knew I'd never be able to achieve that. And not with that attitude, obviously. But, <laughs> uh, but my, my skill set was okay. Um, I did a lot of like line drawings, like black and white line drawings and like that. I went to uni to learn how to do like some of the more important things like oils and this and that. They don't teach you that at uni. You actually leave uni thicker than what you went in. <laughs> I, I, more I, brain cells. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, honestly, I, I, li I left uni learning, knowing less about drawing than what I went oh, in wow. with. Because uh, they took, they, they, I'm going on a tangent here, but. Oh, we're, I, we're good at that. Don't yeah, worry, yeah. Go for it. So this whole idea, I, I was going to go to uni because I did it at college. I enjoyed it. I was going to go to uni, illustration. And I wanted to get better at doing like the fantasy art style things, learn about like anatomy, learn about oils. This is what I expected. I kind of alluded to when I was having my interview. They just wanted children's stories and it kept telling me to tone my style down. It's no one does fantasy art anymore. It's all about children's story. No one does fantasy art. I'm like, okay, it's a dying breed. Well, look, look now. Mm. Um, <laughs> eat those words. Eat those words for sure. And it was, I mean, children's stories always me around for sure. I get where they were going at. But I'd like do like almost like comic book style covers all the way through these like like critiques would have and they'll be like constantly going, it's too complicated, tone it down, simplify it. And then after like ten or twelve of these critiques, I just did stick men. Okay. Honestly, it was a stick man I did. Oh legitimate. I literally did a stick man. Flat stick man. And they were like, that's it. And I was like, I've come I've spent nine grand in my three years of uni to <laughs> learn how to draw <laughs> stick men. <laughs> Great. So then a job came up at workshop uh, to be in retail. So I was like, oh, that's a foot in the door. I'll carry on drawing and doing yeah, this yeah. outside around that. Uh, got into retail and then kind of retail kind of just blew into its own thing. And I went down this route of leaving uni because I finished becoming a full timer um, mm -hmm. because there was an opportunity to do it. So I became a full timer, started painting more stuff and dedicating my time in the evenings to painting armies and things for the stores. Did a little bit less drawing, got a little bit less, you know, use it or lose it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then I was asked to go on the management training course. I was like, well, that sounds fun. So I did that. It, it, the, the long scope of that was my manager at Derby wanted to be a regional manager or sell manager at the time. And he wanted a replacement and he wanted me to replace him eventually. Um, but you have to go and train around the country and do other stuff. And then when that job came up, I got that job, went to the Derby store, became a manager of the Derby store, met Duncan. Um, oh, that's where that yeah, that's started. where that guy came along. Oh wow! Uh, so uh, gave him an intro. I think it was my Imperial Guard versus his word bearers. Had a great time, and then uh, he came to a, a recruitment day. Got the job. Um, it was before I left actually to do management training. When he got the so you got both the job. worked in retail at Derby. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. wow! Um, there's a couple of people that actually uh, one of the guys is in charge of or a department of IT, and one of the guys in Forge World used to be full timers and key timers at uh, uh, Games Workshop Derby as well. So yeah, we've. Quite a, 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 nice, a nice little hub for, for people. I guess it's close by as well. It's like, what, 20 minutes on the yeah, train yeah. or 30 minutes on the bus from, from Knott's. But yeah, so I, I, I was doing the management stuff. And the problem with management is, certainly in retail, you can, I enjoyed the store that I was at, but a lot of my buddies were moving off to do other things. And the, man, the regional in charge was not the same one that was the manager at the time at Derby that moved on. It was a different regional. It wasn't very nice at all. Used to get anxiety when the phone would ring because you, you'd like the phone would go and be like, Oh, it's going to be him again, isn't it? So you'd pick up the phone and you'd be like, Oh, hey, Games Workshop, no, Chris speaking, how can I help? He'd be like, Ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. How's it going today? I was like, oh, it's Nine o'clock, just opened up, just doing the diary jobs. Okay, okay, okay. Is there a reason why no one's in your shop? I was like, It's nine o'clock on a Monday. Because <laughs> <laughs> a lot of workshops were in a tertiary zone. Yeah. And I was like, You know, it's, 
it's a weekday, you know, it's perfect time to do the jobs in the diary and get the store looking ready for like, you know, Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, Wednesday nights, and the weekend, because I had loads of events on at the weekend and like, yeah. evenings and stuff. He's like, can I have an adult conversation, please? And I'd be like, what? what? And th this is what every phone call was like. He's like, is there a reason why no one's in your shop? I was like, yeah, because it's Monday. He's like, no, no, I want an adult conversation. You should be putting events on. Who's going to come? At nine o'clock in the morning. Nine o'clock in the morning. Wow. On a, on a, on a regular, because everyone's at work or at school or at college. The only person that would come in on a Monday is the guy that went to the job center and he'd spend his money. And I always told him, why are you spending your money here? You should be using it to like buy food. And he'd be like, no, no, I've got some money to put aside for food. I'm like, oh God's sake. Yeah. I couldn't tell people what to, to no, but, for, but you know, it was always that weird sort of a, a old retail was like, no, don't spend your money. <laughs> Take, keep your yeah. money, don't spend your money. We still have some ethics. But, but yeah, but yeah, <laughs> this manager was just, oh, he used to give me anxiety. And there's a couple of managers that suffered under him. And, the only sort of like, I guess, progression was wait for him to die or move on um, and then take his job. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to be in retail forever. And there's some amazing managers, don't get me wrong, amazing managers that have been in retail since I was there as managers and do great stuff for the stores. I just wanted to do something a bit more and I like painting. Yeah. And a job, before the job came up in the studio, I moved to Warhammer World, kind of forced to a certain degree. It was like a, an ultimatum, move or get fired. Um, so I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I stepped down from management, moved to Warhammer World um, to be a full-timer. I'm a manager that asked me to be a manager, Chris. Um, he was managing Warhammer World at the time. And he was like, oh, do you mind being my what, second? What, the shop? Yeah, the shop. So he okay. was like, oh, do you mind being my second? So when I'm not on holiday, you can run the training sessions. I was like, yeah, sure, because I was a trained manager. I used to, to do that stuff. Um, so I you know, had a great time there. I was only there for a few months, and then a job came up in the studio to be an army painter. I was like, oh, I like painting armies. Uh, I like painting toys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply that. So I applied for it and then got the job. And yeah, uh, I just was there. I, I, I would say my best time at Games Workshop was 2008 to probably 2000. The early days of Warmer TV as well was, was good fun, but certainly 2016. So it was like an eight year span um, because it was just like working with really talented people in the studio. There was like Dave and Mark, uh, Dave Andrews, Mark Jones, who like did a lot of scenery. Um, Dave made a lot of the scene, like the plastic kits, as well as did like great sort of like kit bash builds. There was other army painters I worked with. Duncan was one of them. A guy called Steve joined the army painting team. Um, God, loads. And just in general, just working with studio people, it was like eight years of just like amaze. It so, was so amazing. So what was a typical day then? Because you keep talking about being an army painter. Yeah. Now I, I can assume some of it's for things like um, the exhibition or some of it's for, I don't know, White Dwarf. But I felt, I always feel like well, that you're going to run out of stuff to paint. It's changed a lot now. There's like so many departments have their own army painters and painting studios. I think there's like four painting studios now at Workshop. By that time, there was heavy metal and the army painting team. And let's say when I, I use this as a great example because it's it's I, my first sort of job, so it's fresh in my head. I joined when the Chaos Warrior book was coming out. When they brought out the Plastic Knights. Um, they brought out a load of like random stuff like Warhounds. The Demon Prince hadn't been released by that point. Yeah. I turned up and I was given like a load of stuff and it was just to test the water to see how, how fast it was, what kind of quality I had. And my manager literally put a unit of 20 Chaos Warriors in front of me and said, you've got a week to paint them, but you need to paint them like this old Nurgle color scheme like that. Try and get as close to that color scheme as you can. I was like, okay, cool. So I sat down there, three days in, done them. I was like, I've done them, is that all right? And he was like, well, that was quick. Uh, here's, can you do another unit? I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do another unit. So I did another unit. Again, trying to like look at heavy metal, ask them what their recipes were, look at their recipes and go, my God, that's mental. <laughs> that looks like that color. That, that's why I just like ignored their recipes and tried to find a color that was just one pot that I didn't yeah. have to mix. Uh, a great story was like, Daz did a flesh tone for Drakari, uh, or at the time Dark Eldar. Um, he was like, oh, I've mixed a flesh tone. It's like. 10% fortress grey, so much percent of den of stone, so much percent of like graveyard earth, shadow grey. There was like all, all these different colours mixed into this big tub. And I looked at it, I was like, oh, oh it wasn't den of stone. I looked at it, I was like, that looks like den of stone. He was like, what? I was like, yeah, den of stone, you know, the foundation paint looks just like that. Do you mind if I use that instead? Because it's a separate army, it won't. It saves me wasting your stuff. And he went off to the cabinet, grabbed it, it was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it made a colour that exists. And I was like, Sorry, <laughs> I just know my paints because I worked in retail. It was like, oh, yeah. cool. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was fun little stuff like that. But on average in a week or, or a project, I'd probably say, is usually heavy metal at that time would do the front ranks, usually the first one rank or sometimes the first, second 
well, the second rank as well. And it'll be my job to do the ranks after that. There was times when I'd do the back three ranks and they'd just do the front, depending on how they were doing for time. And rank two had to be a little bit better than rank three and four. Um, and then I had a bit of a dynamic change with some of the army books because they wanted to feature more armies that had different colours. So it'll be like heavy metal are doing the box content, which is going to be a small force because they're going to do like, I don't know, let's say the Skaven, they're going to do the clan rats in this colour scheme with, there'll be a unit 20, there'll be some storm vermin, probably a unit of slaves, they'll do some of these guys, some of those guys. So it'll be a small force, can you do an entirely different force with more stuff in it? I'm like, yeah, sure. So then I'll plan an army, plan a colour scheme, find out how much time I've got, usually a month, and then just sit and paint stuff for about a month. And usually it'll be like, what, three, four units of like big blocks of inventory, a whole bunch of war machines, a couple of monsters. Never really do that many characters because they'd always do like the characters unless it was specific to the faction, like a couple of champions or leaders. Um, so like Empire is a great example. Did an Empire army, made a couple of characters for the Empire army, like an odd wizard that hadn't been covered by the many wizards that Heavy Metal had done. Yeah. There's no point in me doing Carl Franz because they're going to do a better job of Carl Franz. Carl Franz leads Old Dove, but, you know, why should I paint... Like, Carl Franz when it's already been done very well yeah, by yeah. someone who's doing it for the box packaging. I'll just do something else. So that was, for a time, what it used to be. And then when I started managing the Army Painters, it was, because there was about 10 of us, you'd get like two, three different projects going off at the same time. Like Wade would come in with like a 40K ask. There'll be like Ben with like an Age of Sigma ask and then some other random project. And you just divvy it out. So what was it for? Was it, for? it was for like articles or books? It was or? for books. Um, so we, at the because miniatures kind of had a deviation from, because it used to be the design studio, so there was like the art, artists were in there, the graphic designers were in there, the sculptors were in there, um, people that made the paint and the brushes. All in one room? All in one room, it was just oh, called wow. the design studio. Then there was a bit of a schism where they went, right, we want miniatures to be a separate thing, we want books, anything that goes in a box or a box, um, so like card game or a box set like Silver Tower, that's that department. Anything that's just like sculpting and box art, is this department and anything that's anything else is this department so it was like three separate departments which i still think actually caused more communication errors than solved them so they, so they went more siloed it doesn't at yes. all sound like games right? yeah yeah it seems like that just makes it less collaborative oh it was so when we because the army painting team was in like a weird sort of like where do we go? Yeah. Because who do we belong to? Yeah because we're, we're currently and i remember the manager at the time um we i sat with him and i said you want us to go down to miniatures, because miniatures, you, we're, we're, we will be painting miniatures. I get why you'd say that, but the miniatures are being sculpted by sculptors and they want to talk to every metal because they're doing the box art. The stuff that we do is more useful for the books, like White Dwarf and you know the armies and the collections that are gonna go in those books, as opposed to being any use to miniatures, because yeah. you know sculptors are then gonna talk to the box packaging painters why do they need to talk to us? We're just going to paint loads of stuff. Yeah. We're, we're probably going to ruin their models because I clip detail off and sculptors hate that <laughs> <laughs> just to speed up. Um, and he was like, yeah, well, you know, it's been decided you're going to go down to miniatures. And we went down to miniatures and then the manager at the time would be like, yeah, we're going to do a wood elf army. I was like, cool, well, they're doing wood elves upstairs then. They're like, I don't know. Brilliant. Oh, okay. So we, we painted a wood elf army. We'd send a wood elf army up. They're doing necrons and something else. <laughs> I'm like, okay. What, uh, like White Dwarf? And... Yeah, yeah, White Dwarf. Their book production was like something entirely different. And eventually there'll be a wood elf book come in and then they'd use the army. Yeah. And there'll be like some conflictions like why, because there'll be like a new kit come out or there'll be an add-on pack. It's like, why is the add-on packs not on these? Because it was done at a different date or this, that and the other. So it was just very clunky. And then I think one of the managers got a bit annoyed with that and then made a new army painting department upstairs, which initially was like a bunch of paint guides. Um, and they, I really love these paint guides, but this is when I was talking earlier about like the paint guide was separately from the codex. I owned a few of those. Yeah, I loved them. They were I thought they were great. Uh, I think the store staff didn't know what they were because they weren't allowed to open them, which is why they probably didn't sell very well. Okay. But they were like £12 for this paint guide that was like a complement to the codex and it yeah. had like four different colour schemes in. Um, we put a lot of time and soul into that and it was fun, but it didn't make any money, which is fine. You know, at the end of the day, you've got to... I what that. I find ironic is 40K players in 10th edition have gone, oh my God, they're putting painting guides inside these books. This is incredible. Age of Sigma players are saying, we've had that for ages <laughs> yeah. and we have a lot more pages. And some of us older people are going, you should sell painting guides. Yeah, yeah. No one bought them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we ended up making cheaper ones, which were thinner, which were like four quid. It yeah. was then, because you were like, oh, if you're going to spend 12 quid on the codex, I imagine that the days when it was 12 quid. <laughs> uh, you, you might as well spend 12 quid on a paint guide if you're really into painting the army. 
and then no one would buy them. So we made these really thin ones, which was like four pound, which was the same as the card, uh, like the combat cards, or not combat cards, what do you call them? Um, data sheet, data yeah, cards. Yeah. Um, so it was about the same price as the data cards. So we did like a Stormcast one, an Orc one. There was like a Burn and a Prospero one. There was like a few that we did in, you know, to support books that came out. No one bought them either. Uh, so, but everyone wants them in the code. But everyone wants them in the code. They're happy to pay thirty pounds for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah. So I mean, that was that was a great time. We moved up, and that was when nothing was. It was really weird. Nothing was gelling down in miniatures. So we moved up. There was like three of us in a room doing these paint guys. Then it then all the guys from, which must have been an awful time in what was the painting team down in miniatures, were all made redundant because no one needed them anymore. I'm glad I made that move to go upstairs. Yeah. But then they all got rolled in anyway. Okay. Um, and there was a couple of heavy metal guys that were like still like in limbo because I think they were training, there wasn't enough spaces for them. So they joined, which was great because they had a different dy- dynamic and they did like some of the nicer paint guides. Mm-hmm. Also did the characters as well. I mean like Aiden did like Smaug at the time. It was like a guy came in and went, Peachy, we need Smaug painting. Can you guys fit in? I was like, Aiden, can you fit in painting Smaug? He's like, yeah, I've got two weeks. I was like, cool, two weeks, bye. Uh, so we get Smaug, airbrush it, get it done. I go. I think that's been damaged now. I think the wing's been broken a few times. I've heard stories. Um, <sighs> I but love that model. So I would much. say that that time in the army painting team was the best time of my life as well. Oh wow! Um, okay. Because the guys were great. Um, I was still learning, being a creative manager as opposed to a retail manager. So you know, I was a bit naughty. I suppose I used to lie to my manager about how long things took. I was very scotty in my approach uh, because. The guys needed a bit of leeway sometimes with like because we had no sometimes no visuals on what things look like archonauts not archonauts carriage and overlords right we had images of the boats no one could tell us what size they were yeah and we were like that's a two-week job it would end up being one of the small ones yeah. <laughs> it was like not a two-week job it was like I, I, I a mean, three-day job looking after you guys isn't necessarily being naughty I no mean. no i mean we, we we never missed a deadline but we always gave ourselves a bit of breathing space yeah and by that point as well we had like an idea of how long when people were trained as well, it was like, if you can paint 10 space rings to this standard in one week, you're golden. And one of the things I wanted to avoid, because this is what heavy metal would do and some of the old army painters would do, is they would stay behind to put some extra time in, do it through their lunch. And I was like, no, no, no. In, in your own time, you do your hobby. At lunch, you eat food. Yeah. I don't want you doing any extras. Unless you've definitely hit the deadline and you just want to add an embellishment. As long as the deadline's been hit, I don't, I don't care what you do after that, or, you, or you're definitely yeah. going to hit the deadline. There's no sort of... And the reason for it was I wanted to make sure that they could hit the workflow because you can't tell what people are doing in their own time then. If they're spending like 37 hours a week painting to this standard, but actually they've done an extra 12 hours in their own time, then they can't... They, they need coaching to be yeah. able to do this in, yeah, in 37 hours. So that's why I was like, don't, while you're training, don't do extra stuff. You can do extra stuff once you know you can hit the deadlines. Because I did that. I mean, I did a unit of high elves. I put some transfers on all the high elf shields. I hated it. I still had half a day left, so I just repainted the shields and hand-painted a sort of burning uh, phoenix on 40 shields. That was my choice, because I didn't like the transfer. I I just thought, oh, it doesn't quite look the same. I want it to look like this. There's a really cool piece of art where it's got like a cool-looking phoenix and in the end i did like a stylized w with an s and then just filled it out to try and make like a some kind of burning phoenix doing that once or twice you kind of get a rhythm eventually so across 40 actually was quite nice so that was the example i gave them like once you've got your your times set then you can do that extra thing like put some checks on a shoulder pad or or a knee pad on a space marine but it becomes a choice rather than a necessity though yeah yeah so there's been many times where there's so many stressed painters because they're doing stuff in their own time but the managers don't know this, so they're assuming that they can do this job in yeah. the time that they've allotted, which is like, you get four days to paint a box of 10 Space Marines, but it actually takes eight days because they're doing loads of extra time in their, in their own time. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, it was a big no-no for me. I was like, no. Yeah. Um, but we always used to have like a bit of a buffer zone because I knew workshop and the managers, there'd always be like a last minute project that would come through. So having that buffer zone was just there for that. There was once, what, we had this project to do a, a set of, um, I think it might have been Dark Imperium, it was one of the sets, but for Dawn of War, mm-hmm. and base it for Dawn of War, because they were looking at doing some stuff for Toys R Us, to go in Toys R Us, God bless Toys R Us. Uh, rest in peace. I think it's gone now, hasn't it? It has gone. Um, but we, we did like a load of stuff for that, and it was like a two-week project. And 
everyone quite enjoyed it. Everyone had a squad each. We had like two weeks. Everyone had a squad each to do some stuff. We all had the colour palette. We all knew what we were doing. Yeah. Did it. We're like, that looks cool. Oh, we're not going to do it now. Everyone was like, oh, we spent so long doing that. You didn't. You spent two weeks and it was free time. So enjoy the practice. <laughs> uh, so that, that's why having that buffer time was great because you'd always get like the random project come in. Or sometimes, as has happened, things get taken off a sprue. I don't think people know this. You know, sometimes on the back of a box it says contents may vary. Yeah. That is to cover if like a thing on a sprue gets taken off but it's not been taken off the model. At Harlequins was a great example. There were loads of like separate masks to go on the front of your Harlequins. Um, more than what there is in the set currently. And we painted loads up and then one of the guys from Ministries came up and went, we've had to take eight of the masks off. And just our look, most of the ones we put on the figures, because they're all resin at this time, they're not plastic, were the ones that have all been taken off. So we had to snip off a load of faces, glue on some new ones and then repaint them. It was like, ah, that happened all the time. Just like things get taken off the sprue. So I think, um, I think from the outside looking in, because I've only ever really been on the outside looking in, it's what's, what I find quite interesting and quite fascinating is so many people that I talk to, especially in the YouTube space right now, at some point worked for GW. Mm. So Jay worked for GW in one of their shops. Josh worked for GW. I find it really interesting. But from the outside looking in, I've always, and I talk about this quite a lot on my, on my content in general, I always feel like Games Workshop is, for want of a better way of putting it, a complete and utter clusterfuck <laughs> at Nottingham. And it's always, it always feels like it's kind of all over the place and it's last minute and everything's not quite... It, it, there doesn't seem to be a lot of organisation structure to what they're doing. How often did you get sort of last minute projects and stuff? Or did Quite it, a lot. Did they change it? Like, uh, there are, Don't get me wrong, there, there are some like departments and some managers that are on the ball. Yeah. And sometimes someone's so good at what they do, they get promoted and then someone takes their place and is not as good as what that person was. Yeah. Um, that happened a lot, and but they've got to learn as well. Um, but I think when there's so many different departments, it, it's... it's very much like was a small company and is now like corporation but still small company mentality. Yes. And with that, everyone wants to own their own thing and does, doesn't like change and doesn't like other people interfering. Um, and it can get quite disconnected because this department has said, you can't do that. So like say Forge World were like doing like um, codexes and indexes and stuff like that for their, their range of resins books and box games didn't like that because that's their job and you're not going to play test them and it's forge and you always end up like doing like weird stuff with your rules and we we want to take that it's like no you can't do that it's ours so you end up getting these sort of like microcosms of departments like no this is our thing no no this is our thing <laughs> which doesn't help um yeah. but most of them just want the thing to be done right yeah but everyone has a different idea what that looks like as an end result i think miniatures is great from a production point of view because they, they've nailed down plastic production. They know exactly what they're doing with that and how long things take. Some of the other departments are still learning that now and it takes a little bit longer. Uh, a friend of mine has worked through a few departments and he, like the miniature had more time to make to sculpt, whereas like another department he had had hardly any time and yeah. there was like a big pressure on to getting like scenery kits done and stuff. Um, but I do think there is a massive disconnect between lots of different people and also it is the old Chinese whispers thing, right? This person said this thing, the paper trail disappears. I mean, a great example I had, I remember walking down a corridor in marketing, one of the managers going, you did a, um, a little sort of like build, didn't you, for like you killed him, you, look, you like killed him, don't you? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, have you ever thought about doing a board? I was like, no, I've thought about it, like a bigger board. Um, that'd be quite good fun, like for me, for me ventrilins to go into. I was like, oh yeah, 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 we should talk more about that. That turned into an email a week before an article went up going, where's your board? Oh. I was like, what board? <laughs> I was like, we had that conversation in the corridor and you said you're going to do a board. I was like, no, no, no. You said it would be a cool idea to do a board. There was no commitment to doing a board. <laughs> I never said I was going to do a board. I never even had plans to do a board. He was like, no, that's not the conversation I remember. And I was like, is it? Is that the case? Because oh. <laughs> where's the paper trail? Because yeah. <laughs> I definitely don't remember having this conversation. Um, so a lot of that would happen where people would... I wouldn't say that was gaslighting. That was more, I think, someone being really busy and misinterpreting yeah. what had happened but you would get the odd gaslight which was like no you definitely said this i was like and then as as someone myself like a doubt again did i say that yeah. you start doubting you, yourself you're like pretty sure i didn't say that let's just check emails oh, i didn't do an email you need to get better at sending emails because then you've got the, the the paper trail but I, I think a lot of the heart's in the right place but sometimes it's a bit it is a I think a lot of people will be glad to know that because I think often, uh, for, again sitting on the outside of, of games workshop specifically at one world i think a lot of people often feel like 
or they get to the point where they feel like the business doesn't actually give a shit and mm. they just kind of want to make as much money as they can. Of course, any business wants to make yeah, as much money as they can, absolutely. I think often it's very nice to hear stories from internally where people are like, no, actually, they do care. They, they want to do well. Yeah. They don't necessarily do a good job sometimes, yeah, but they yeah. want to do well. <laughs> so I think that's always quite refreshing. Yeah. Oh, the Curse City example is great because everyone had a different interpretation of what that would be, and we're saying this before we went live. Um, like, Books and Box Games thought it was going to be like Blackstone Fortress. It was going to be, you know, a thing that would be supported for a long point of time, somewhere in procurement, you know, because of like what getting it from China, the prints from China, it wasn't going to be doable. And then someone in marketing misinterpreted whatever, and then it was like, no, it's never, it's a, it's a one off. It's like, is it a one off? I don't remember it being a one off. And then all this sort of like internal debate, it's then released. People like me, Wade, Nick, and Ben are like, you can't talk about Curse City. What, what do you mean? People can ask lots of questions about it, you can't say anything. I'm like, what? We don't know what's going off ourselves, so you can't talk about it. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> What's going on? That sounds amazing. <laughs> so I was like, ah, okay. <laughs> so it sounded like some people needed to sit down and write a good chat. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we're we're getting like lots of comments, and we're like, we can't can't talk about. It. Just ignore the comment. I'm like, we can't ignore the comments because there's so many of them. It's Twitch. It's live. It's full of people asking about Cursed City. And it's like you can't. And then that makes you like a doofus. Yeah. Because you're like ignoring the. At uh, that point, you're the face of the company. Well, you are. Well, yeah, right? absolutely. So, so, but before, but, but before we get to that particular hmm. moment, so you were in, you were managing the army painting team. Yeah, yeah. You've gone upstairs, upstairs, and then then there was a, a transition to Wama TV, yeah. which was a whole new concept, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I've missed that a little bit. When I was painting, being the army painter manager, um, I was asked to look after the photographers as well. At first, I was a bit like, "Oh, that's a bit weird," but the three photographers in books and box games did a lot of the content and used a lot of our, so they did a lot of photography that used a lot of our stuff. And they had ideas of scenery they'd like to see and all this kind of stuff. So it made sense to have them in all the meetings. So when we're talking about armies and scenery building, they'll be like, oh, it'd be really cool to get some low level stuff mm -hmm. to hide bases. It'd be really cool. We've, we've got this idea for like one of the books. We've got this narrative that the d designers are after. Is it, are we able to get a piece of scenery that features that? And we're like, yeah, sure. So that made sense. So I went and, uh, the, and at the time the, the photographers were told, well, I was, Told that it was a bit like a, a schoolboy's locker room in the photography studio because what people won't realize, and it's still mad to this day, is the photographer's to, photography studio, I can't get my words out, is like seven different departments, all with their own different managers, all in one place. And Ooh. it's like uh. five, at the time, there was five or six setups, seven different departments, all needing to use that space. No one had ownership of the space. Um, so what I did was I moved my desk into the photography studio just to be with this locker boy mentality, just to try and you know sort it out. I, I generally just thought they were just annoyed because they were constantly being ignored and treated like idiots. And often they'll be told like, why is that? Why is that 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 photograph's not good enough? It needs to change. What they don't realise is the amount of effort it takes to change that photograph. So you'd get like um, this rule where you can't have models going into the gutter of a page, and it'd be like. Okay, if anyone's not sure what a gutter is, it's just the bit in the middle. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. if model goes into the gutter, it's like it's a big no-no. And I'm like, why does anyone care about that? All models have to be facing like this. You can't have a sword in front of a face. That's fine if you're doing a squad of 10, right? When you've got 500 figures on a board that's taken five days to set up, if one sword gets in front of a face, someone picks up and goes, reshoot. It's like, do you oh, know how really? long that took to set up? So I, I then sat with like a couple of the guys, like Chris Merrick, who is in licensing now. I was like... Talk to me about how, how you set up a, what they call DPSs, double page charts. So we just did it together. You'd like look for the viewfinder. You'd be like, okay, that's in the way there. So you then go, move that guy. No, oh my. Move that guy. It took ages. So when they would like give the timeline for the photography, it would be like a, a month for the book. It'd be like, why is it going to take a month to photograph these pictures? But it's like, you've got five DPSs, which are five days each. I'm having to do those in three days, but you've got like so many half page shots, so many paid shots that go across like that. I could probably use a DPS setup to do that, but then you've got 55 data sheets in there as well that I have to have photographs for. So there's so much work. And when I sat in there, I understood that. So when I used to go to the sort of scheduling meetings, I was like, no, it's not doable. Like, what do you mean it's not doable? I was like, you can either have no uh, data sheet shots and have a really cool sort of like DPS, this and the other, or you can have all your data sheet shots and have some rubbish photography. It's entirely up to you. I'm giving you some options here, but you can't have all of it. That's, yeah. that's just it. And I, I, I think I was probably like seen as a bit of a boat rocker at the time, but I was more, I wasn't defending the photographers. I just realized that they were getting a really bad time. 
because people would come in and see them sitting down, but that was their job because they were sat down on the Mac chatting with a mate whilst they're like sorting out the curves and balancing the light and stuff on, on videos and then getting ready to do the stacking and stuff. A manager walking over, they're all sat down talking. So I'm like, well, yeah, because they've done the setting literally up. literally their job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, once I got the idea of what was going on from the, in the photography studio, yeah, they sometimes would be like, you know, having a bit of a chat and a, and a waffle, but no, no other department, no different. Um, and then the other thing was like, seven departments using six setups and one of those setups didn't work because the camera is a bust but no department would pay for the camera because it's like why should my department pay for it well who owns it no one owns it so how do we get it fixed uh well someone's got to pay for it exactly so i've got six managers here all with their own photographers someone needs to pay for it because we don't have a photography budget so he's gonna pay for it oh my <laughs> lord that so blows yeah, my mind. yeah so i wrote a proposal to do a photography studio and it didn't really go anywhere because we, we found like efficiencies to, to cut down time because across the business, this still makes me angry. <laughs> like, every, so there's the golden angle of a figure, right? A sculptor will make a figure and he'll have an idea of a golden angle. He'll communicate that to the heavy metal painter. We'll paint it and have, they'll have a bit of an idea like this is the golden angle. This sort of like this sort of ratio of position here is where I'd like the, the model to be shown off to its best, usually with a face facing towards the camera. That's told to the photographer. The miniatures photographer will then go and take that photo, make it look beautiful, shot on white, beautiful. Why does it need five other departments to do the exact same shot for their own publications? Why can't they just use that one photo that miniatures took? No, that's our, that's our photo, you can't have that. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh wait, so, you, so you, when you have a single photo, yeah. you then had five people taking the same yeah, photo? Yeah, yeah that, 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 that one model was photographed. Every model that's on a shot on white was photographed at least five times. By, by different... For web, for books and box games, for White Dwarf, for Forge World, for miniatures uh, photography, for marketing, that's six. So I did... Um... <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the same right. photo being reused. But it was the same photo. It was the same photo being photographed six different times by six different photographers. So, uh, when you said to me about there being different photographic departments, I was already kind of a little bit like, well, that doesn't sound overly efficient, but I guess if White Dwarf want this shot and yeah. then the website wants this shot, that kind of all makes sense. And the website has things like the, the spinny model. Yeah, 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 but, absolutely. But I did not for one moment think that all of the departments would literally be taking the same shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so, that is mental. So sometimes White Dwarf would want to do their own terrain shots. And it's like, why don't you just use the ones books and box games use? And they're like, no, that's ours. You can't use that. It's like, why? And it's like, can we not use that photo you guys are doing? Because that's cool. No, you can't use that because that's a white dwarf asset. And then marketing will have their own photographers that do their own stuff and, that's and videography mental. and whatever. It was. And at that time, I was just like this, you know, I probably lost more hair. But my son <laughs> was not lot far from being born. Um, and a job came up to go into Warmer TV. And I, I think I'd add my fill in management this time because the only painting team, great. They could do... That I, they didn't really need me anymore. They, they knew what they were doing. The photographers in the army painting department, books and box game, awesome. All the photographers, you know, you were all great. Um, they were all awesome, but it was not them. It was having to deal with all the bureaucracy around it. And like, I used to get so stressed when a camera would break or a light would not work or like a power box would go out or the batteries needed replacing. I was like, oh, who's paying for this? Yeah. So you'd go through the houses every time and you'd have to then get like some kind of like uh, CapEx form filled out and then some department had to pay for it. I tried to rotate the departments. It was, it was mental. Um, and then, yeah, a job came up to paint Toy Soldiers again, but for TV, I was like, oh, you know what, I miss painting. Uh, I'll apply for that and working with Rhodes as well. Uh, and that was more through necessity and I luckily got the job. A lot of where I've gotten, I mentioned at the start, was through luck or mistake. Um, and good mistakes, not, not bad yeah, mistakes. Of course. Um, you know, I, I never intended to be a, a manager. I never intended to be an army painter. I never intended to be a, a YouTube presenter. It just all happened. Yeah, opportunity uh, comes up. Why not? Exactly, yeah. I gave everything a go. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it was the photography studio killed me. Sure, yeah. <laughs> that sounds infuriating. It was, it was. At the very it? least. I know, I know a lot of the photographers and they're, they're always like, because oh, they, they were a forgotten department and I felt so bad because they were really hard grafters. They used to put a lot of hours in. And yeah, sometimes, you know, they could go, go off on a tangent, but I don't care because they're having fun, they're enjoying the job and they're still hitting the deadlines. They're also arguably one of the most important aspects of the promotional material that exists in the hobby. Because if you think about it in yeah. general, the first time anyone sees any of the miniatures is normally nowadays a Walker Markle. 
uh, okay, sometimes we see the reveals on yeah, videos yeah. at like big events and stuff, but typically it'd be a walk on article and then you'll see it on the website and then you'll see it on the box art. And all three of those stages are photography department yeah. who aren't looked after or supported apparently no. at all. Yeah. <laughs> the thing I always just find wild about photography as well, and I've learned a lot from those guys just for like doing my own little shots and stuff, but you'd see like all these models in a in a in a cool battle shot, you're like, well, that's cool. And you set your table up to look the same, and then you take a photo, it looks it looks trash. It's because the models are so well placed and so well considered, and they're not like really close together. They're quite a distance apart from each other, but like the line of sight gives you a sense of different perspective. Because yep. actually, in reality, when you turn it that way, like that's how far away they are from each other. Um, so they're definitely not in unit, unit coherency, which will make people go mental. <laughs> uh, well, having <laughs> having taken some photos in the past for army shots. It's very hard. It is, yeah. Like the amount of times you're set an army up and you'll take a photo, and people keep asking us to bring army shots back on the on the streams, and we're looking at doing something in the future. But my expertise is 100 percent within with video, not with photographs. Yeah, so yeah. we're going to try and bring something. What about three sixties? Yeah, we're going to try and bring something more dynamic in yeah. video back for army intros. Because taking photos, I hated it. The amount of times you set the army up, it looked cool. You take a photo, you, you bring the photo up on the computer, like that looks. Shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I mean, just a mess. I've done it with myself. I've taken photos and I've used them in like my videos, and they look fine on my phone. I've used my phone, and phone, the phone camera is really good. Um, but when they're on a larger screen, it's like, oh, and it's 4K. It's like, oh, that's yeah. really blurry. But actually, yeah. it's on the peripherals. I can cope with that because even like the workshop ones, even though they stack them, you, you do want some things blurred because yeah. you need a focal point. Um, so I think that's nothing. Not everything can be super clear. Um, some things have to be a little bit more uh, blurred out because yeah. it draws you in. Um, but yeah, I learned loads from, from that department. It was great. But yeah, Warmer TV, that was the next step. Oh, that was a yeah, new child, uh, no sleep, uh, height of summer, so hay fever, uh, and then learning just to talk to a camera. Uh, Which is in itself yeah, very fun different. and interesting. I like chatting, I like talking, but to a machine that doesn't answer back, I find it really hard. Yeah. I had to give it a name. I don't know if we did yeah, end up giving a name, but we ended up giving one a name, which was Cameron. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was for a time. Brilliant. And put googly eyes on it. That, that helped uh, Suggs and Hattie when they were doing their filming. Um, yeah. I think they named it Cameron. Might have been Cameron. Well, I remember the Ron first Suggs. time, my first ever foray into YouTube was with my friend Johnny, who I mentioned before. He ran a channel called Visicast back then. And he, like I said, he ran a video production company, right? So when I first started filming anything with him, Rocked up to his his place and he'd set up all of his gear and he had a he's got like a bri a big camera not yeah. like these so we are we use DLS DSLRs because they're basically prosumer so there is they give you a relatively high quality shot yeah we film everything in 4K um, but they are actually quite accessible in terms of cost and size at whatever I and mean, he had this big Canon video camera thing I remember like I can talk to anyone and I can talk forever and I was I've always been relatively confident with people in general. I remember the first time I stood in front of that camera and he was like, right, here's your mark where you're gonna stand because he used to mark everything out, all professional video person. And he'd be like, right, you talk to that and it's just a black abyss. <laughs> it's just this hole, yeah. right, of yeah. nothing. <laughs> and you sit there and you go, so introduce yourself. You're like, hi, I'm Liam. Yeah. Like, I, I don't have any eye contact. I don't yeah. have any reaction. I don't have, like, there's no body language. No one's talking back to me. And I hated it. Yeah. And I remember we, I also took a friend to film with him for ages and was like, Okay, so when we when we we've done some I've done a load now. So just to give you some tips, like look past the lens, don't look at them. I'll stand behind yeah. the camera for you. Talk to me. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I was like, no, honestly, it's really hard. There's this this bigger blip. No, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And I think we filmed his army intro about twenty seven times. Oh no! Because he couldn't say the words, and yeah. he was like, "This is terrifying." Yeah. I was like, "Yeah, no, it's really bad." So the that's thing I found the experience. hardest is internally you have to you have to go louder yeah. and more enthusiastic. And I, I did this with the, the newer TV presenters. I was like, you have to punch out a bit more. You have to imagine in your head you're like a bank holiday salesman. The reality is very different. Because yeah. I, I was in a good place where I could actually sit and record them and then show them the footage after. Because they'll be like, first of all, like me, just like, hi, I'm Peachy. Welcome to this video. And I'll be like, oh, that's really dead. You know, it's not, yeah. no energy. You need to boost up the energy. So we go, okay, hi, I'm Peachy. Uh, welcome to this video. It's like there's, there's still no energy. Yeah. Got to boost it up. So you'd be like, you know, push push it in. You know, go 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 mad. Imagine you're shouting at someone, something like that. So they'd like hire it a little bit more, hire it a little bit more. But once they got comfortable doing it and then going like bank holiday salesman, you'd watch the footage and they're like, oh, that's just like me talking normally. I was like, yeah, I know, because in your head, it sounds different. Yeah. Um, so you have to push it out more. It's weird, but that's that's what I learned in the early days. Was I had to just go a bit more over top than what I normally would. But actually, the camera sees it, 
not yes. quite like that. It's very it's, bizarre. It's, you, you are, trying to get through to people, like, you are actually constantly performing. That's what yeah. you're doing, essentially. Yeah. You are performing. And like, you, have to, you have to be a bit more articulated. You have to, you have, you have to you're, you're doing a show. Yeah. You're acting, you're performing at the same time. And people, people really struggle with it. And I, like, the amount of times I put people on camera and they just kind of become this withdrawn... Mm. We, I used to film battle reports and it was, it was, it was really interesting as well. Not only do, does, is that a thing that you have to do, but what I also found quite interesting was people would be themselves and then you put the camera on and they go, Shh. yeah, yeah. Like, oh, this is really hard now. <laughs> and then you turn the camera off and they're all like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. no, 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 I don't, other way around is what I really want. <laughs> so don't really tell me to put the camera on. Yeah. <laughs> We're not recording yet. We're no, just no, going to chat. About, no, no, talk about, yeah. just ignore this. Yeah. yeah. Just so dry run. <laughs> so, was, so was Duncan, was Warhammer TV, when you joined Warhammer TV, was it already a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Duncan had been doing it for a few years with Roger. Uh, I pretty much think that they, they sorted that style um, that we saw. Um, whether that's the right style or not, I mean, I'm not going to disagree with the way that they did their thing, but it certainly didn't. It worked for them, yeah. but I don't think it worked for me because I noticed when I left warmer tv people said oh i didn't like you when you were on warmer tv you i always thought you were a bit sort of stale and a bit stagnant and you were just trying to take the limelight of duncan i was, like, well, I was just working with a guy you know, my job. he can't do it all on his own yeah. give the guy a break um and then when, when i was able to be a bit more myself like on the painting phase then that i think was quite evident that that style worked for them and was, not for me was that a, was that a conscious restriction on that you did though or was that like was that a, a gw saying oh no it was uh, that that's the style i had to do because there was a few times um <laughs> when roger and Duncan went on holiday because usually your editor and because i i worked with a guy called dermot um who has edited stuff for me in the past um he started when i started and he didn't really know much about editing well i think he knew a bit but he was still quite new to him mm. so we were both like going on what are we doing i don't know i'll just talk to the camera and you film and you'll be like oh you know you need to punch it out a bit more i'll be like what does that mean <laughs> so we learn a lot um and then like we do stuff that was i still think it's mental duncan it's mental um when we used to do the build guides for underworlds um the duncan and roger were doing one take and they'd have like 20 sets because if duncan fluffed it up they have to start from the beginning and we're not talking building one figure the whole underworld's warband in one take and I think that was more for an efficiency for Roger as, a, as opposed to Duncan. Yeah. When they went on holiday, I had a set to do, and I was like, I can't do it all in one take. I'm going to struggle. Can, can we just build one at a time? And if I pull up to camera and then start clipping, cut, and then I can then pull up to camera again, because you see me pulling up to camera from that angle like that, and then we can cut it, and then I can just pull it up to the close-up camera, and then we can just clip it out and just do one figure as a take. And like Dim was like, yeah, I think we should do that. It's much easier because we didn't have many. Um, we didn't have like twenty-seven copies. We only had like three or four. Yeah. So it was even more like the stakes were higher. Yeah. Like, don't get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't clip out that detail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not on them. Uh, I mean, I always found it really weird that the, the easy build kits we showed how to build, and we never showed the complicated kits. Yeah. It's always like these are really obvious. Uh, well, not to everyone. Fair. Um, but yeah, we did this, and they came back, and like Roger was like, uh, I don't like that. And I was like, oh, sorry, but it was really easy for me. I was like, no, no, you have to do it in one take. I was like, oh, okay. So it was like, you know, I mean, that, they have a process and we followed the process, but me, sometimes me and Dim would try things on the run holiday because that's the only time we could do it, um, which worked for me, yeah, but didn't work for Duncan. And I think that was the thing that we end up finding out and finding a middle ground. Near, you know, certainly for the first year, it was like, no, this is how you do it. This is how we're doing it. This is what we've worked on. This is how you do it. Okay. But then as time got on, I got a bit more experienced. So I was able to go, I actually want to do it like this. And they were like, oh, okay. But I still wasn't, there was still that workshop style, which was really awkwardly like look to the camera and then do like an awkward intro and then bring up the model and then begin painting it. Um, for two years, uh, this was probably explains why I got neck injuries. Um, I had to sit in a right-handed setup because I don't think Roger could be bothered to to change the setup. He's even said that in, in joking, which is fine. So I just couldn't be bothered because it takes a lot of time to change the setup. Because at camera angles, etc. Yeah. yeah, yeah, literally everything would have to like mirror. Yeah, and uh, to put me in. So the camera that I talked to there when Duncan did it would have to go there. And I think in the end they did find a little way to to make it a bit more efficient. Certainly when we moved offices because we had like a space that could like move around a bit more. 
but certainly for the first two years, I was like that when I was painting, because my ear and my head would get in the way, because this was designed for Duncan, because he's right-handed. Well, of course, yeah. So when I paint, my hand's going to be in the way of the model, because I'm left-handed. So I have to paint like that, paint like that, and then I have my neck at a weird angle. And it was not comfortable. Doing eyes on Marathi was one of the hardest things I've ever to do in my life. Um, <laughs> it was just so hard. Um, whereas, like later on, the, the camera was there, so my hand didn't get in the way, so I could like pull up a bit closer yeah, yeah. and like, paint a bit more comfortable. But yeah, painting like that was just really hard. I always felt that the Games Workshop painting tutorials, no matter who did the, the tutorial, it, it was you will fit into our tutorial rather than. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's yeah. always the way it came across. Yeah, so yeah. I always feel like sometimes the presenters have felt. Dare I say this, and I'm not trying to offend, but I felt a bit wooden in place yeah, because they, yeah. they're just basically copying a style and format rather than being themselves. Yeah. And I think what, what we found is, I mean, Duncan's obviously come away from workshop and done his own thing. And do you know what? It's basically the same. Yeah, right? yeah. It's no different. I think that's the thing. It's they made the style, which was then enforced. Yes. And um, then you've come away, uh, Suggs has come away, other people have come away, and you're like, oh, they're very yeah. different in yeah, the way yeah. they present and the way that they are on camera compared to what they were on one of my videos, which yeah. I've always found quite interesting. And I, I suppose now, if I was if I was to look back at it, even though it was communicated, this is the Games Workshop style, I disagreed with it being the Games Workshop style. I just think it was a very good style for Duncan and Roger and worked for them. I know it never really worked for me. I, I got comfortable at it because I'd done it long enough by that point that it was just like going through the motions. Yeah, um, it's a day job, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and it was more about communicating the stuff on the model, and it was always about content is king. It shouldn't really be about your face. You were just there to introduce the video and say goodbye at the end. Um, and there was always that danger, certainly after Duncan left, that it became like, oh, we don't want celebrities. We don't want to make celebrities because we'd have the Duncan situation again. Which was just like, and this is the thing, the biggest bugbear of mine is whoever, because I know there was a few managers that are against Duncan going off and doing his own thing. They didn't like it. They, it got their backs up, maybe. You know, that as a personal thing. Maybe there's a more professional thing that I wasn't privy to. But a bunch of managers had their backs put out of joint because Duncan left and mm. took his celebrity with him. It was always going to be the case because he was the first painter for Warmer TV. He was the first face for painting videos. That's fine. And then it kind of cracked down on the presenters after that to like, mm, you know, you can't be saying that, you can't be seen doing this, you can't be doing that, or you gotta be careful. Are you doing it for you or are you doing it for business? Are you doing it for the business? Are you putting Games Workshop first? We're like, there was always like that kind of stuff. I was like, I just wanna paint Toy Soldier if that's all right. Um, and then there all these restrictions were put in place. So you, you're very sort of like, that's fine, okay. I, Cause I wanted to teach the presenters just to be themselves a bit more and find out about them, but it was the style. But I was just had this notion that if you encourage the presenters to be themselves and they grew to be something bigger to then go off and do their own thing, if you treated them with like a different attitude and a bit more respect and happily made that as a, as almost like part of the pipeline, then you now have Duncan who's a positive force, who still is a positive force for workshop in the community. You'd have like Suggs who's a positive force. Yeah, she has opinions like I do in the community, all you need to do is just nurture that and go, there's two options. You can stay here and continue doing the videos for the rest of your life if you want to, or you can work yourself to build up a, you know, a channel of your own and we will support you with things and this, that and the other. Because then you know you've definitely got these people out there that are positive forces for Well, I think also, if you think about it, if you, if you take the latter approach and you support people in that transition out to doing the, their own thing, or arguably even to some extent encourage it, hmm. promote it, work with them, people that you know that you can work with because they've worked with you before, yeah. what you then do potentially is monumentally increase the size of your talent pool for people that are likely to apply for that in the future. Because yeah, yeah. people will go, look at this incredible stepping yeah. stone. Yeah, yeah. And they might actually stay and do 10 years, yeah. but they might also go and do their own thing. And then another person goes, well, I want that job. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I think I think we have a, you know, we joke about this a lot, but there's a sea of content creators for Warhammer now, which is incredible. Something that I never thought would quite happen. There's literally millions so of channels. Yeah, yeah. There's so many people that want to do this thing. Now, if you if you could say to any of these people, especially some of these people have monumental amounts of talent, loads of incredible ideas, they're very good, and perhaps their channel isn't exploding for whatever reason, because you know what, we spoke about it at the, hard, mm. at the start, YouTube's hard, and you're yeah, very yeah. much sticking your finger in the air, and some of us get very lucky, and some people don't. So I think if you said to that person, hey, look, you can work for Workshop for four or five years, right? Because you're currently going nowhere with your channel at the moment, at yeah, least, yeah. you know, with respect. You can work with Workshop for four or five years, and then when you try and do this again, it's going to work. Yeah. It just will, because yeah, you're yeah. good, you know. 
I think I think the amount of people that go, I'll give that, I'll give that yeah, a go. Yeah. I'll throw myself into that. But then, but then, workshop then has these people out there that they they know and trust to communicate their message. Yes. Um, and you know, whether people call me a, shit, a workshop show, I was there. For, there was a reason I was there for twenty years. Yeah. Because I enjoyed the job. I enjoyed the people I worked with. Some of the decisions were always weird. But then, tell me a business that doesn't have that issue. That exactly right. right. Um, there's always me people you don't like working with. Tell me a business that doesn't have that issue. It is a business yeah. at the end of the day. It's a job. Um, but I wanted to grow my skill set when I was at workshop. And when the new presenters turned up, we had one editor who was our videographer and four new presenters, well, me and three new presenters. Bum in the chair, that videographer stroke editor could only film one person and edit one video at a time. Yeah. Um, but we've got four people and they're like, well, that four people means four times the amount of content. No, it doesn't. It's the same amount of content. You just got four different faces. Why? Because you've got one videographer who's also the editor. So he's gonna have to edit the video that I do. Sorry, film the video I do and edit. What are the other guys doing in that time? Well, they can be um, planning for the next video. And when they're doing their video, what are the rest of us doing? Yeah. So, you know, you've got this leapfrog effect for sure, but that guy's still only editing like two videos a yeah, week or whatever. Um, so in the end, I said to, said to Joe, I was like, I'll, can you teach me how to use, operate and set up the cameras? Um, because they had like a little command and control center, you used to call it a bit like what you've got here with like all your, your, your screens and stuff. And I made a few mistakes, granted. I overwritten Emma's uh, ash waste paint guide by accident because I wasn't paying attention. Sorry, Emma. Um, <laughs> it was a good job. You did a good job. Uh, but I learned, I learned stuff. And what I was doing was it, it benefited me because I was able to instantly give feedback because I could see not just them talking in reality, but you could see how it looked on screen. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, let's redo that bit. Or you didn't have to wait for the whole thing to be filmed and edited and then review it then have to redo everything again. Yeah. You could just see it as it's going and you can see when they're getting the model up to the uh, the screen and they're starting to paint. You can see when it's drifting off or it's just not in the center. I'm still guilty of that because it looks like you're drifting off to a side, but it's actually because you're pulling it naturally close to yourself. So inevitably it drifts one yeah, side yeah. or the other. Um, so it was useful for me from a feedback coaching point of view. It was useful for Joe because he could edit whilst I'm filming. So we actually got twice the amount of content than what we normally would have got out. And then I said, I'd like to learn how to do editing. And I think there, there was this spike of fear that I'd be, go off and learn all these skills to go and start my own channel. I never intended to leave and start my own channel, but because they refused to teach me these skills, I left and oh, right, okay. to start my own channel. So it ended up being like, you know, cutting your face off to spite your nose kind of job. So that, that, I mean, that answers where I was going with it. So obviously, like I said, most of us didn't know about that huge portion of career beforehand, hmm. unless you've watched some of the episodes you've done yeah. previously, of course, which... Um, I, I was going to ask those questions anyway because some of my audience might not have seen that. But Warhammer TV happened, and I feel like there was, for me, there was a bit of a. It's interesting that the, the setup wasn't for you, and you know, and you went through that process of this isn't really me, but I'm fitting the, yeah, the Duncan yeah. format because I feel like for me at least there was kind of a golden era of Warhammer TV, yeah, yeah. which was you and Duncan doing. Oh yeah, yeah, we tutorials. we loved doing stuff together. And there was a couple. I remember there's a couple of comedic videos around leaks and stuff like yeah, that, which yeah. were just fantastic. And I was like. Oh shit! Gaze Workshop was developing a sense of humour, yeah, yeah. which for for a person who's been in the hobby for years and years and years was like this hasn't existed before. Yeah, so yeah. Warhammer TV was a big leap in itself, anyway, because Games Workshop. Like people complain about Games Workshop now. I'm like, do we take you back 20 years? There was no Facebook team. There was yeah, no social media yeah. team. There was no videos. There was no walk. Like, it was nothing. Yeah, you had this is your codex, and you might have to use it for four editions, and we're not going to FAQ it. And we, and I'm like, you can have that, Games Workshop. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I feel like there was a there was a golden era with with you two doing. Um, doing Warhammer TV, and then Duncan left. And I, I felt like, as a viewer at least, there felt like there was a bit of a shift yeah, yeah, in, in kind of the feel around yeah. Warhammer TV. Um, and obviously, not long after you left as well, that was kind of compounded when they went for a phase, at least, of not showing any faces at all. Yeah, yeah. Just, and, I, and there was controversy about that. Um, it, it's, honestly, it's childish doubling down on the situation. When me and Duncan used to do lots of stuff, like you said, rightly to camera. There was like the contrast videos, there was the, the jokes, like the open day kind of things where we sat out with like, there'll be Christmas ones, we're in bed together in pajamas. I loved it, Pete. That stuff you know, was great. All sorts of, I mean, it was fun. We weren't there trying to like stroke our egos and build a reputation. We were just doing it because it was fun. We enjoyed exactly. working together. But then, you know, whatever reasons, and there was many, Duncan had enough of the nonsense and the bureaucracy and the red tape and all this, that and the other. And he just, well, I'm bad enough. I'm, me and Roger are just going to go off and do our own thing. And they went and did their own thing. And I think because of that, they're like, no, he got too big for his boots. You guys can't get too big for your boots. We're not going to do those kind of fun videos anymore. It's about 
just painting, just do painting, that's your job, just, just stay in your box and do your painting. And then I left, it's like, faces are a problem, they're getting too big for their own boots, their faces are on camera, they think they're better than they are, there's an ego there, we need to remove the ego, get rid of faces. Uh, and then Suggs left, and it was just like, hands, this is problems, you cut off the hands, get rid of the hands, they can't, they, it's just be a floating brush. Uh, it, it was just doubling down, as opposed to like going, why are these, why is this town yeah. leaving? My, my reason for leaving, there's lots of other things around, I mean, there's like, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back at that time, but the big thing, I just wanted to try new stuff, I want, there was like, this menta stupid mentality in workshop is, the only way to progress is become a manager. Not be good at what you do yeah. and be better at what you do. It's like, oh, um, this guy wants to get more money. Make him a manager. It's like, make your best painter or your best artist or your best graphic designer a manager. You've now lost your best graphic the thing, designer. The thing is, Peachy, I, I legitimately think that that is something that is probably prevalent in a lot of business. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I've, certainly... I've worked in the engineering world. I was in the army, and it's the same. Yeah. It's the same. Promote them. Yeah. yeah. But then they're not doing the job that they're good at. Yeah, and like which yeah. is what the job they like doing. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I'm not, not, don't get me wrong, there's some amazing managers that are also great creatives and can work on that. But not everyone is. I mean, I've seen some good ones, I've seen some terrible ones. Um, but I wanted to learn how to do videography, learn how to edit, so then I could get better at understanding my side, yeah. like the presenting. And I've learned that now from doing PG Tips, the things I can tweak and the things I can do and go, that looks stupid. Because I wouldn't see that <laughs> yeah. in an edit. Yeah, the yeah. editor would just get rid of that, and I'd never see all these things. So I'm seeing all this stuff that makes, I wouldn't say makes me a better presenter, but at least helps me become a better presenter by going, that was stupid. Why did I do that? Why do I keep looking left? What's left in my room? Yeah. Oh, it's a really cool shiny box of toys that I keep wanting to paint. That's why I keep looking left. Move that box out of the way. Um, we, we do it with the guys here. I, for, for the longest time, I was like, everyone who plays, I want you to be able to produce. It's not because I want you to produce, it's because yeah. I want you to know, hey, that thing you do when you shake the dice right by your microphone, it's fucking annoying. <laughs> and when you're the presenter, when you're the producer, you've got yeah. the headphones on, you go, oh my God, that noise. It's like, that's what the audience hears. It yeah. doesn't sound too bad for you when you stood up there. And that, that like, I, want, I wanted people to do the producing job just so they could go, when you do that, that's really annoying because I've got to change camera angle. Yeah. So when you're next stood up there, you're thinking, that was annoying when, when yeah. that person yeah, did yeah, to me. Yeah. So now, you know, now it's you a similar to, to you going, yeah. that looks stupid, so yeah. I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I just want to improve my skills. That's it. And I know Louise wanted to do lots of stuff, and she had like great ideas on social media because she understands the internet far better than I ever will. Yeah. She's got her own story to tell for sure, but um, she would obviously give advice and say, oh, we should do this, we should do this. But it was always like, it was shot back at her, like, oh, it's because you want to grow your. Yeah. Your but the thing was, she was hired in because of her clout at the time. She had a big following. They wanted her in. Wama TV to be the Wama Plus presenter because she had quite a huge following. Bear in mind, at that time, she was a photographer and an artist in, in Ford World, but she had this massive social media presence because she understood how social media worked. And when she was doing the stuff for Wama TV, she had like these great ideas on how you can promote it, this and the other. She was just shut down. So she got annoyed with that for a certain, or as one of the many reasons for leaving. But, you know, it's like, it was always because she was trying to grow her ego. She is the most. Ego does not come into it with Louise. Yeah. Um, some people might argue differently because they've seen a difference. I, I've known her for a, a fair few years now. She only does stuff because it's because she wants to do it and it's fun. She does things for fun or to help. That's it. It's never about herself. And yeah. inevitably things happen. It's like, oh, she's done really well. I mean, you know, she overtook the painting phase in like a space of a month. Well, I've, I've met her maybe twice, possibly once, maybe twice, and almost quite a shy, reserved character on the whole. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. She, she can get a bit gobby at times. Uh, and sometimes you, you, you're four conversations back with answering because uh, she, she dive, she literally she starts the conversation, moves on to the next one, moves on to the next one. You're like, I've still got an answer for the first three, but I'll, I'll wait. Um, but, you know, I love her to bits and she, I'll always, you know, promote her because she's amazing. She's like super pure, always doing it for the fun and the love of Warhammer. And she's doing, she's promoting Warhammer. Yeah. And it's, you know, and she liked Old Hammer and that's fine. And I think it was like, you don't talk enough about New Hammer. She's like, I do, but I also like Old Hammer. I like Warcry and I like Necromunda. Yeah, but PG got to talk about Underworld. How can I fit that into Warcry or Necromunda? Because yeah. <laughs> that's how I used to do it. I was like, I need to find a way to fit the thing you want me to talk about into that. Because we all know every model is a Necromunda model. Um, there's a way to fit in there. Yeah, um, so I could use Warcry as another avenue if I, if I was struggling with the Necromunda uh, thing. But yeah, so you know, she she's great and... She left for her reasons, but 
it's weird. It's I, I find that the thing is, I find that what I find very interesting is in in what I would consider probably relatively quick succession. Duncan left, you left, Louise left, and um, for me, I, as a as a viewer, I'm going, what is going on behind the scenes? Because mm. I don't, for one, I didn't genuinely for one minute think they've 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 gone. I can be bigger. I can be better. Yeah. I feel like people that have been involved in a company like that for so long, yourself, you said, you said it yourself, right, 20 years at yeah, the workshop, yeah. and then choosing to leave, there must be something going on as to why all these people that are moving into these Warhammer TV spots are then leaving the business and going and yeah. doing their own thing. So it is interesting that it's a case of all you wanted to do really was edit, and arguably, it sounds like, at least from my perspective, that their experience with Duncan meant they said no, meant you left. Yeah. Which is... Self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Exactly, right? <laughs> Bang, shooting foot. Yeah. That's what, I mean, what's what's happened. I never there. expected, I always expected to retire at Workshop. Okay. Um, that was always like, I loved working there, I loved the products. Um, sometimes I didn't like always working with certain people, but you, you're professional, right? You work, you, you find a way to work around folks. Um, but I always expected to retire. It was never like my first choice to, to up sticks and go. And certainly for someone who's got like a mortgage, a child, mm. and you're the main breadwinner of the family, uh, having that conversation with the wife going, I, c I can't do this anymore. There's an opportunity here for me to go to. Um, that was that was a tough time, but you know, we, we got through it and we, we she, she now understands, because I she said this to me the other day, uh, Mrs. Peach did, God bless you. Uh, she was like, I never knew that you were like, I, mean, I hate using the word like, oh, big in the hobby, but I'm, I've been lucky because I was at Warmer TV and I went to the painting phase. But she 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 just thought I was just a guy that sat behind a desk and painted. Yeah. And she didn't realise that if I went and did YouTube YouTube stuff for money and earn you know like Patreon like get supported on Patreon do stuff for YouTube it would it would make money. She just thought, nah, it's just a hobby in it. Yeah. Um, she didn't understand like the kind of following I'd generate and how um, that would work for you know running a business and stuff. Whereas now she's seen like the peachy chips. Chips, peachy. Oh, there's that's a, a spin-off channel. That's a range of merch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the channel uh, peachy tips um, has like took off. She, you know, she's like, oh, I had no idea. I was like, well, you wouldn't do because you don't. You're not into the hobby. It's yeah, not yeah. your thing. Um, so I understood why it would be hard for you to understand. I mean, she still struggles with like using the internet, let alone uh, understanding how the algorithm works. This, that, and the other. But she's done really well. Like, like since launching the channel, understanding all these yeah. these nuances and how things work, and like you know, looking at the analytics and watch time hours. Well, she becomes rate. she becomes your work colleague at this yeah, point, right? Yeah, You're absolutely. the one she's the one you vent to, <laughs> and she gives me lots of ideas as well. She's like, you know, it's uh, Valentine's coming up soon. You know, it's uh, International Women's Day coming up soon. You know, it's this coming up soon, or oh, it's uh, National Tea Day. Yeah. I'll be like, oh, maybe should, maybe should I do a post for that? Maybe should I do that. And like you know, the April Fools' video was just. I always want to do something for Halloween and April Fools' anyway, but. Thank God Liz reminded me because I'd actually forgotten <laughs> April Fools was quite close and I had an idea, which was the video I did. Um, so I was able to do that. Um, but yeah, she's really useful for like as a marketing expert, even though she doesn't understand that field particularly well. She knows what she likes as a consumer. Yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I think I mean, sometimes it's important to look at it from that perspective yeah, as well. Yeah. What do people want to watch? Like, we, I, I often encourage, I get a lot, I actually get a fair amount of messages from people saying, I want to start a YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. And one of the biggest things I always say to people is, like we said at the start, you have to do what you want to do because yeah. it'll be more fun. But I often think it is interesting to look at it from the perspective of the consumer and what does the consumer want as well. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, so I, having that sound, like Lucy's great for that for me. She's similar, yeah. right? Yeah. She doesn't give a shit about the hobby. Doesn't care. Yeah, same. Tried yeah. to get Mrs. into Peach, it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and decided it was a silly hobby. And she didn't like it anymore. Um, <laughs> you have to snip this thing out. You have to start painting it. Don't like it. Yeah. Uh, and she was like, "I've got these all. Can I just dip them?" I was like, "No, <laughs> no, you can't just dip them." Um, I mean, there's a video in there somewhere. I'm sure. <laughs> but, this is, but this is also where sometimes on on the, on the talking head streams, I can turn to her and be like, "Hey, this thing happened, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put it to you in layman's terms, not hobby related." But in layman's terms, but essentially what I'm giving you is the exact amount of information. What's your reaction as a person who's not involved in games workshop or the hobby? And she'll be like, seems perfectly reasonable. I'm like, cool, we're all overreacting. Or she'll be like, that's fucking ridiculous. Like, absolutely what we anyway, yeah, yeah, having yeah. that kind of perspective has also been really helpful, yeah, I think. Yeah. No, that's, that's a it's a good soundbite to have someone that yeah. doesn't have that sort of, I guess, bias yes. to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. So but yeah, that was that was definitely a, a turbulent time, but I de I Certainly expect to retire there, and yeah, decisions were made, and I, I went off and did. Music. So, do you, do you think there was in your mind uh, thoughts about leaving workshop for quite a while before you made the decision I to go? I think it was about a year and a half, and I think it was a little bit after Duncan left. There was a radical change, and it, it was even probably to the point before Duncan left because I understood why he left. Um, 
I didn't agree with it at the time, and I, it was a bit of a sore point for me for a time because my best mates just left and yeah. gone, and it was always like, oh, because we, you know, riffed off each other all the time. It was, yep. it was, it was fun working environment. I've now lost my wingman. Uh, technically, I'm his wingman. He's Maverick. I'm the guy that dies in the plane. <laughs> uh, I look like him too. Uh, so, uh, so I'm Goose. Uh, not the new film. He survives. Uh, spoilers. Oh, tangent, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just letting you rip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, go. but yeah, I think it was definitely, a, things were getting weird before he left. And yeah. then after he left, it was like, oh, free reign to, to do my own thing. And it wasn't really. Yeah. I, I had a little bit of free reign, then it kind of got like proper stamp because, you know, people got a bit annoyed and other people were brought in that had a different idea of how this should work and other people were brought in had a different idea. And I think the thing that killed me, not that I have an issue with Warmer Plus, but the way that they handled the Warmer TV team when Warmer Plus was launching, it was almost like the annoying cousin that you just leave in a corner. Um, and me, all me and Joe wanted to do was just make videos. We just wanted to make videos whilst they're doing all their thing and making Warmer TV, sorry, Warmer Plus, awesome. Getting all the battle reports sorted out, getting all the masterclass stuff sorted out, and whatever other content they're gonna do. And me and Joe will just quite happily paint, do cool paint guides yeah. for YouTube. And as as it would be, he would get pulled away to to work on like the bat reports or whatever to do some editing. So I'll be like sat there twiddling my thumbs. I've just written a whole paint guide for painting this character. I'm like, oh, it's not gonna get painted then. I'll go and prep the next one. I'll go and prep the next one because I've got one in two days' time. I'll go and do that. Do that. Yeah, I'm ready to film. Oh, they need the cameras for Warmer Plus or at least the light and that camera. I was like, oh, we're not filming today. I was like, no, no, no. Oh, wait, another two days. Sounds idyllic, right? Turn up to work, being paid, not doing any work. I hated it. Yeah, I would I, 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 I would put a lot of effort into like writing these guides and stuff, and I could have just sat and just painted my own armies if I really wanted to, and no one would know any different because everyone was downstairs filming, but it didn't feel right for me. I wanted to be contributing. I wanted to be doing like paint guides for, for the audience, and because that went on for like six months, and I probably did like five or six paint guides in that time, um, it had a massive effect on the views as well, because for a time, like when me and Duncan were doing videos, we'd put a video out on the day, we'd get 25K views in the first hour or two hours or whatever, which is really, really good. The shorts did really well. Um, so our shorts, so at the time they were called Tip of the Days. Um, and it was great. And then because we had this massive hiatus of just like not much videos, when we started doing videos again, it was like 1,000 views in a week, 2,000 views in a week. Oh, your videos aren't doing very well. Might have to look at like, you know, other options, so I'm like, am I going to lose my job? Yeah. Am I going to lose my job? Then eventually, you know, I had a, there was some stuff that happened indoors, which I won't go into, uh, but involved HR a lot. Um, oh. And, oh, I know, yeah, but it was just like... juicy stuff. Uh, the juicy stuff. Well, I mean, you know, I don't know how legal it is, but stuff happened in the department, and some people were pulled into meetings, this, that, and the other, and it just got very awkward. And I, I was very honest about what I witnessed, what, what my thoughts were, and by doing that, actually had a negative because it was like, some people were like, oh, Peach is a bit un un unhappy. I never whinged in my life at workshop about anything. Um, I, I whinge a bit now, because uh, I'm 40, I'm allowed to. Yeah. Um, but I never really whinged, and this was the one time I was like, look, this, this is what's happening, and it's not good enough, and I'm not happy because of this. You know, I'd, at this point, I'd rather just, if, if I'm not gonna be doing my job, go off and do something else, I, I, you know, I've worked in, Retail, Asda, and QuickSave, and Sainsbury's, and stuff like that. I, I'm happy to work for them um, because that feels better than what I'm doing now. Yeah. And they're like, "Oh, oh okay. Um, well, we'll have a think about that." And then there was this kind of idea to revamp Warmer TV and get some new presenters in, which was like positive. But I'd already died by that point. My soul had left yeah. the workshop by that point. They'd already like killed me off. I did speak to a couple of managers openly about my feelings, and it was like, "Yeah, but you're just painting dolly men, though, aren't you?" I'm oh, like, "Cool." You're not really listening to what I'm saying. You're just, <laughs> I remember that next time you're stressed yeah. uh, and your manager's getting on you and you're having to pass that on to me, I'll just remind you that you're just managing people that paint dolly men, aren't you? Um, so I, I kind of killed my enthusiasm to want to do anything more for these people that didn't actually care um, or at least perceive they didn't care. Whatever they thought, I don't know, but it was very much a business direction to go one way. And then there was this revamp to get some new presenters in. I was like, cool, I'll train them up. But in my head, I was like, I'm training them up. And then when I'm done, I'm, I, when I'm, I'm happy and I've trained, I'll stay a bit longer because I planned to go before Christmas. But I stayed until after because they were starting after Christmas, stayed with them for a couple of months and then went off to work with Pat uh, the painting phase. 
So he, so, so that was, so that's next step. So next yeah. step for Peachy after after Wyman TV was painting phase. Yeah. So you're you're probably thinking about it for eighteen months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At what point did Pat come to him? But like, I got so this great idea. He had already left by that point. Because uh, because like, yeah, he worked as a videographer or something, didn't he? Yes, he was. Like he uh, was a videographer on on Bat Report and editing as well. On Bat, no, he wasn't video videographer. He just did a lot of the editing. I think. Okay. Um, I might have done some videography. I can't remember. Uh, but mostly editing, uh, like multicam editing and stuff like that, because they had obviously lots of cameras going off at the same time. And he'd been there for about six months and shut off to do his own thing because um, he did weddings before yeah. he t started. So he carried on doing weddings. And he grabbed me one day and said, oh, would you fancy doing something together? Um, you know, I've got this channel because he'd been showing me some some videos and stuff and stuff he was working on. I was like, that's cool. I like your logo. It's wicked. And then, yeah, you know, we, we looked at Because he'd already started at that point and I was already looking at, doing my own thing and I was showing yeah. some videos and stuff I was working on uh, as an idiot. I'd done a, uh, I'd used my phone, I'd done a paint guide and he was like, what's that for? Is that a shot? I was like, no, it's a video. It's like, you need to turn the video sideways for YouTube. I was like, oh, of course, yes, orientation is important. Uh, so I was like, you know, learning like the bare bones at that time, <laughs> um, doing a little bit of editing on an app on my phone and stuff. And I was enjoying it. But then you know, we, we decided, you know, he asked me to come and work with him. He would pay me a wage. I was like, cool. Um, had all these ideas, and then yeah, that was that uh, for a year. But sadly, as things happen, um, he had his own way of doing stuff, or wanted to do his direction for the painting phase. I had my own ideas of what I'd like to do, so we kind of like yeah, twenty twenty four split, split ways. I always found the painting phase decision interesting because Duncan went and did his own thing. Yeah, Louise went and did his own thing. Yeah, and I think I think I probably speak for a lot of people when we say. When you when you uh, announced you were joining the painting phase, we all thought it was a brand new channel. Yes, Joe yeah, said the yeah. same thing. Yeah, I've heard a few um, people say that. And it was only when I looked back over the channel's history and because I went back and watched a lot of the old videos, I was like, oh hey no, Pat and Jeff did it on their own first yeah. for a, a, a period of time before you then joined. Um, and you were there for what, like a, a year, I think. Yeah, was, about a year, I say so. Like slightly over like a couple of months, but yeah, it was like yeah. sixteen months, I think. Yeah, and they um, and they kind of erupted because they had the big. I, yes, I, I yeah. think I kind of, I think I kind of, I'm going to be mildly controversial. Go, cool. go. I for think it. I kind of understand GW's trepidation. Yeah. With people getting a degree of Warhammer into fame, fame yeah. and then disappearing and doing their own thing. Yeah. Because if you do look at uh, the success that Louise has had, the success that Duncan's had, the success the painting phase had when you joined. Yeah. Um, there's there's precedent there, right? Yeah. If people are on Wama TV, they leave, uh, and they sub sub subsequently get a monumental following on social media themselves, and they make money for themselves, yeah. which potentially, arguably, could even be money that Workshop are making themselves through yeah. things like ad revenue and, and, and what have you. So I guess I kind of get their trepidation if you look at the history. Uh, I just find it always very interesting with any kind of business where they don't go, but why are these people actually leaving? Yeah. And is there a way we can turn this into a positive or we can fix the problem? So an interesting thing, after talking a few times on the painting phase, when we had the, uh, Louise on, we, we interviewed Louise, and there was a lot of comments. I, I, every job I ever had at workshop was the most I've ever been paid in my life. So I had no comparison. So to me, it was a lot of money. Yeah. So when I was managing staff, I was on 19K, but for a time I was on 16K. I'm then told that that's not a lot for a manager in charge of 10 people. That's, that's a pittance. But to me, that was the most money I've ever earned. But then looking back, going, actually, I was on 19K at the highest when I was a manager, and I was managing 10 staff, and there was another manager who had one staff who was on 40. Uh? Mm hmm Okay. Why? And I've been here longer. Uh, and then that's you know, when you start joining the dots. Um, if after seeing, so I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm a bit risk adverse, um, but also, you know, I like to have a bit of a challenge as well. Duncan had the support of Roger because Roger was an editor, videographer, and they'd got their share, share save scheme. So they yep. had a lot of money. So they're like, we're going to go do our own thing, see how it goes. And I think they kind of knew from seeing the videos that they'd made, how well they would do. Um, Louise understands the internet. So you've and got, has Rob as well. And has Rob. He's been doing it for... Yeah. You know. But she um, she definitely understands it better than I do. They, uh, Duncan had a, de a, a very good support network and a big title because uh, yeah. he was there before. I think if, if Duncan was just to do it on his own, he may not have left. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that's... I'm not putting words in Duncan's mouth, but of I course. think having Roger there is like support. If, if it was the same, like both me and Dermot at the time, were like flush with cash, we could have probably, I would have felt more confident. Yeah. But doing it on my own, not very confident. Yeah. Didn't know much about 
editing, didn't know much about videography, didn't know much about the internet. But then staying that bit, little bit longer with Warmer TV, understanding that, I kind of understood it a bit more, started doing some videography. Uh, although it was for the purpose of workshop, it ended up benefiting me in the long run. That was never the case. Um, but yeah, and it was never something I really wanted to do. It was not sort of, I, I was always very, uh, and some people say Stockholm Syndrome, very loyal to workshop. Yeah. But those few times when I had problems and I opened up, that loyalty was never repaid. Yeah, the support wasn't there. Yeah, so I, I, I've, I've always, and my mate Steve would agree with this, I'm, I'm super loyal until you aren't loyal to me, then that's it, you're done. Yeah. Um, and then I just move on and find someone else that actually cares. Um, and that was certainly, well, not workshop, and there's lots of great people there, but the department I was in didn't support me yeah. when I needed it. Um, and then I was like, oh, yeah, I'm done, I'm done. Why, why am I coming in here? a pittance because it was a pittance when I look back now and I think that's the thing I'm going to get to is like if they paid their staff better because there's a lot of money that goes around that business because a lot of staff do get paid very well depending if you're a sculptor or this only but honestly and I've heard this a few times a lot of those sculptors could probably just go off and do their own Patreon and make 10 times what they make at workshop but they're loyal to the brand they're loyal to the business they want to see it flourish and grow that's good because they've got that support network and they're, yeah. they're happy and they're comfortable but they could probably make more money if they did their own thing, but then that requires a whole set of extra bravery and skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's always that could, not necessarily will. Yes, exactly. Um, so, you know, there's lots of like anomalies that could go in your favour or, or go against it. And I, I always wanted to stay there and, and, you know, retire there. And if I was paid a bit more, maybe I would have balanced it out. I don't know. But actually, it wasn't really... it. And I think this is the key thing for anyone watching as well is, most people that go to workshop don't do it for the money. Mm -hmm. They do it because they like the products, they, they like the, the community, they like the idea of what Games Workshop is because they're brought up on it. I could have, I, at the time when I joined the Army Painting Team, I was also applying for the police. Um, and I'd gone to the recruitment day, did all the process of like being a police officer. And I remember having my interview, uh, someone had dobbed me in uh, to the managers at workshop in the design studio. And they're like, oh, such and such, I said, you, you applying for the police as well why should we why should we give you a job in the in the design studio I was like well you're both paying the same I'm not getting spat on and stabbed and I'm getting paid to paint toy soldiers so if if I got offered both jobs I'd certainly come for this one yeah because it's what I've always wanted to do I, I don't think the poli if police is just an option um because you know I was in retail and as much as I was enjoying it this opportunity came up and I thought I'd give it a go because at the time I applied which because it's a long process when you're applying for the police your job wasn't available. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can't, it's a bit off to suddenly like go, I'm not going to do this anymore, I'm not going to go to the recruitment day because you, if you do that, you can always like redo certain yeah, things. Yeah, 100%. And get back into it. So that I, once I explained that, I'm like, oh, okay. And then I ended up getting the job. Um, but yeah, I, I probably would have probably not put as much heart and I don't know, uh, you know, past Peach probably would have done, previous, present pre Peach, Preach, um, would be like, oh, would I have put as much effort and soul into it? Being a police officer and I would do being an army painter, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I definitely didn't do it for the money. I did it. It's interesting. I, there's a bunch of content, I say a bunch, there's a few content creators who have made uh, significant amounts of content out there in the past, often with you know the typical clickbait titles hmm. about GW and paying staff. And it's not something I've ever touched on yeah. because I don't feel like I'm in a position to. Yeah. It's a couple of reasons. I don't run, I own the business. I've never worked for the company. I don't even know the staffing or, or the salary structure. But it's really, it's really interesting to hear from a person who was there, who was, I think a lot of people would probably agree, quite the face of Whammer in general, mm. because I think that's what we would have assigned to you and to Duncan and to Louise over the course of those years, at least. These are the people that legitimately represent the business. Yeah, they yeah. are the face of Games Workshop. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't be able to tell you what Daz Latham looks like, yeah. or you know yeah. those, sorts of, those sorts of names and those sorts of people. Um, Which is a shame. <laughs> absolutely, that's a wonderful human yeah, being. Yeah. I love the guy. Um, but I find it—I always find it interesting when, you, when we when we place you in that kind of high regard in that company, mm. and you're saying you didn't really pay me enough. Yeah. Like that, I always find that fascinating and interesting. And I think there's perhaps some of us, some of us at least, thought people like yourself and Duncan would have been on slightly more rock star wages comparatively with other people. I mean, yeah. I mean, I've I've, I've heard this a lot, and I'd I'd always feel like weird having that conversation as well because. Honestly, I don't think I'm equipped to talk about the wage for workshop. Oh, I'm not dick. I'm just. No, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just uh, it, it, like looking back now, it's like, it's always the most I've ever earned. Yeah. So to me, that's like, 
oh, money bags today. It's very subjective, isn't yeah, it, yeah. ultimately? But I'd, I'd done lots of jobs beforehand, like when I was at uni, college, you know, part-time jobs, working in hospitality, cleaning hotel rooms and stuff. That was like pretty much pocket money to pay for, like my um, fund my um, college and, and university. This was the first job I ever had as a full-time yeah. salary. So each year when I got more money, to me that's always the most I've ever had. I've never been able to compare that to other jobs in the business. Whereas a graphic designer would come into workshop on a graphic design wage that's very competitive, because what you what you're gonna it's graphic design. Yeah. You know, as much as I love painting toy soldiers, I can do that for a computer company or I can do that for a yeah, yeah, kitchen yeah, company, um, and probably get the same amount of benefits if if not. I mean, obviously with workshop you do get different benefits for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I never w expected to be get more money. But now looking back, I think if they paid the staff a bit more money, then maybe I, I don't. I left for different reasons, which was that loyalty was never repaid and yes. there was issues. Um, whereas, well, I, I think that's I think that's very important, though, isn't it? I think like if you're gonna if you're gonna be paying not what people would necessarily consider a high enough wage in general, what what I've always said when people have asked me about it, what I've always said is. You know what? They've always got staff. They've always got people that want to work yeah. for Games Workshop. Yeah. It's because you, it's because you're working for GW, yeah, you're working yeah, for the yeah. mother company essentially. Yeah. And I feel like you can get by on that if your place of work is fun, it's interesting, it's engaging, it's collaborative. You're looked after, you're respected, and when you have problems, you're cared about. Yeah. If you do all those things, guess what? As a business, you can get away with paying a little bit less. Yeah. Because the whole package yeah. is like making you feel respected, loved, cared about, and important. If you fall down on a couple of those you can get away with falling down a couple of days if the money's higher, yeah. is what I've always found yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, and I, you know what, I would have, I would probably go as far as say, I'm joining the police force or I'm painting toy soldiers and they pay the same. At that point, painting toy soldiers looks like it's paid quite well. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> you're not getting spilled yeah, on a yeah, spell yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was like a two year <laughs> training police officer was on 16K and I was coming in on the studio on 16K. And a lot of retail staff were on like 11, 12. Managers were on 14 at that time. So 16K was like, Oh, you do get paid a lot more in the studio. Yeah, and then I think as as the years have gone on, wages have become a bit more. I don't. I don't even know. I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I know like some sculptors are on thirty eight, some sculptors are on twelve, some sculptors are on eighteen, and it's, I guess that's like levels of skill. Is that levels of years? Yeah. But the the other thing that I always thought was unfair as well was like you'd have like an heavy metal painter that had been with a company for twenty five years that was on the same wage as someone who turned up two two days ago, and I'm like so. That doesn't, so all your years of experience count for nothing then. Yeah. And I had that when I was in, in the iron painting team, which I didn't at that time care about because I was enjoying my job. It wasn't about the money. But I was on the, I was literally, as, as the army painting manager at that time, I was on one grand more than the staff for all that extra crap that was thrown at me. Yeah. Um, which after tax was not a lot. A pittance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look, when I look back at that, I was like, oh yeah, that's a bit awkward. And, I, and, and there was one time, Certainly, I say a two-year period where I added all the years of service of the staff, and I still would have been there longer than all of the entire team added together. Um, and I'm on like one k more than than them. Um, but that, again, at that time, money wasn't the thing I was thinking about. It was like growing the team, enjoying my life. Yeah, which I did. It's you know, from a very selfish perspective, I'm glad that you're out and and doing your own thing because one, I get we get to see Peachy be creative and do Peachy yeah, things yeah. rather than rather than kind of doing the corporate games workshop stuff. I get to have you here, we get to have these chats, which is yeah. great, um, which is amazing. But I just genuinely sort of think, I, I'm genuinely a little bit sad inside where we have a, we have an individual who potentially would have been a GW lifer, yeah, 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 who yeah. now isn't, yeah. who could have potentially influenced the business, the, the company's decisions, the things they do, to probably our benefit. Because yeah. we've spoken in the past, right? We have lots of similar out, outlooks on the hobby and the way things should be done and the way things should go. And they've kind of lost that person. Yeah. And I think that's a bit sad, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's a few that have left, and you know, when you talk about like with me, Duncan, and Louise leaving, there was lots more people behind the scenes that of left course. at that period as well. Lots of artists. It's the tip of the iceberg, yeah, really, yeah, isn't the, it? The, essentially, there's a couple of staff that have been there for, um, well, since time began, since the business began, that are in debate, and I've not, I know this because I've spoken to them. I'm not going to chuck any names out there, but they're like, do I retire, wait to retire, or do I leave because I'm sick and tired of this place? And they're people that were there from day one. Yeah. And, it's, and that's sad that, you know, like I skipped five, six years from when I was in the studio and everyone was just like, it was a great time. Yeah. Um, like I said, there was a golden era. And we talk about that, you know, these people that are looking at retiring or leaving um, were like, they were the best times of my life. That, that period was, was great. And even before that, you know, when 
it was like fifth edition, fourth edition, third edition for Warhammer or whatever. You know, the older editions. Uh, I have to go by editions of Warhammer as opposed to 40k because I always get scuppered on 40k weirdly. Um, but yeah, you know, looking back, I've seen so much good people become disenchanted and less of what they were when I was there. And it's, it's sad to see it because of attitudes and behaviours and whatever so do nonsense. You, do you still keep in touch with people that are working there? Yeah, I, if I can, I try and go once a month to Bugman's okay. and then just have a tea and usually there's always someone walking past. I don't even need to go on my phone to drop a message to my mates that you normally walk past because if I pick it right, I get the tea run. <laughs> uh, it's like 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock. Uh, so if I can get it right, I, I, I will see most of my, my buds there. So there's a couple of people that won't look at me um, and they're managers and that's fine. I, I expected that. I don't expect people to be like, you know, bringing out the klaxons and stuff. But yeah, yeah. Most of the people I was there for and enjoyed being at workshop for are the people I go and see which is the vast majority. All the staff in the store, love them. Cleaners, kitchen staff, love them. See them in the car park, have a good chat. People in the studios, people in the sculptures, people in Warmer TV. I still have great relations with the, a lot of the folks in Warmer TV. It's just, just a couple who just won't talk to me. That's, it's totally fine. On the, that's on the whole, I guess, really good. I guess. I'd say 99.9% .9 of the people at workshop still talk to me. Well, that's great. <laughs> I mean, I think when you leave a business, especially considering the circumstance and the way it kind of works moving into your own space, I think you're always going to piss someone off. That's yeah. That's probably going to be the case. I mean, I don't know if this was wise or stupid, um, but I, I told... Because when I left, it wasn't really the people because the management changed quite a lot. Yeah. The managers that were in charge at the time when I left, when I handed my notice in, I would probably argue had nothing to, to do with the situation. They, they had just inherited a whole load of dung. Uh, <laughs> and were just like, oh, great. Um, and that's like Helen and Adam and, and, and whatever. So they, they had like lots of, uh, lots of crap to deal with. Um, but I, I literally just went up to, to one and was like, I'm going to be handing my notice in in six weeks' time. So you've got 10 weeks notice, if that makes sense, because I need to add a month's notice. Yeah. And the reason for that was like, because you want me, because I've got a game on Warmer Plus where I'm using my Venturing Nobles against Simon's Votan. I'm doing this scout video, which is going to be an evergreen video with the new presenters. So maybe I shouldn't be on that if it's evergreen. You probably won't want my face on it. Is there anything else you don't want me in? Or, yeah. you know, avoid? Um, because, and they were like, why are you handing your notes? And I explained. And they're like, oh, I guess we're not going to be able to change your mind. I was like, you could try. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, try. <laughs> they, they didn't. <laughs> uh, but they were, you know, they were, they were good and they, they accepted. So I, I, I'd like to think I left amicably um, and gave, I mean, they, they gifted me a sword for God's sake. I got a sword, a, a, a sabre that's got like my name engraved on it, then like 95th Ventrilli and Jaegers on the other side. Oh, wow. Emma put, was a lot of work behind that. So uh, the blue head uh, presenter yeah, lady, yeah. Emma. Um, she she organised a lot of that. So yeah, I, I left with a sword. So it wasn't, and obviously no car park fights, which is a shame. I, I want a sword. <laughs> Emma, I want a sword. Yeah, I got gifted a sword. Uh, I think you're supposed to cut yourself if you draw it though, because you know, or you give people a penny when they give you something sharp as well, don't they? That's I don't know, I don't know. Old wife. I just know I want a sword. Yeah. That's it. You got, you got Gimli's axe then. Okay, so, <laughs> I mean, I still, I, you know what, I, I say this on content all the time, I'm, because I, I hear, I, I, I've heard and I've read and I've watched content about GW and, and reasons why people like yourself left and stuff like that. And I, th I still think to myself, you know what, it's not all doom and gloom. No. Because at no. some point they're going to have to go, we're not doing this quite right, and they'll fix the problem because they're a business and the business needs to survive. Exactly. So I think on the whole, even if, and this sounds awful, please don't take this the wrong way, but even if people like you and Duncan leaving eventually means that they go, yeah, we should probably approach this differently. It's a net positive in the end, yeah, yeah. at least. I think they're starting to do that again because I'm starting to see uh, presenters on thumbnails again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they understand thumbnails a bit more now as well, which is great. They, well, they, went, they went from, I found they went from you guys to no faces and anything on stream or on content yeah. now to th presenters in thumbnails. Yeah. I was like, this is a positive move, yeah. I, I think anyway. I think personally. for Emma and Adam, because um, Lizzie was one of the presenters, she, she does something behind the scenes now with like, um, important stuff, releases, <laughs> I, on, uh, sorry, important <laughs> it's important stuff. paperwork, admin schedules, uh, all words and numbers, uh, but you, you do a good job. Um, she doesn't, she's not a face anymore. Uh, I yeah. think she got a lot of stick, which I'm against as well, I'll come to that in a second, but um, I've got a lot of time for all three of them because, you know, they, they started and they felt like, you know, like I was bringing some children to the world of like the Warhammer 
TV, you know, it was like, I'm leaving this with you, I'm gonna go off now, uh, inherit this yeah. and enjoy it. Um, and I think they got a big poop stick. Yeah. Um, and there was lots of like negatives. When I left, when Louise left, there was just people like in the comments whenever a video had comments and were just like ripping into like Adam, Emma and, and, and Lizzie, which was not fair. Um, Adam, really, really good painter. Um, too good sometimes for some of the guys he was doing. We talked about that, I had jokes sometimes. i will be like, dude, you said, you know, you're doing some chipping, less is more than it does the swash and it's completely coated in chipping. It's the opposite of what you've just said about two seconds ago. So, like, oh yeah, well, you know, I really wanted to do this and I got carried away. I was like, yeah, 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 that's fine, that happens. Um, Emma is like, she understands the paint range, she's been in retail, she knows everything there is to know about painting and she was like peachy kind of level. So she could just go in and just do like, paint into a certain standard, which was, I'd say the right standard for most hobbyists. Adam yeah. could push it. So perfect for like warmer plus. And then Lizzie, um, she was quite new to the hobby, but I actually thought that was really good because she was coming in with, I'd say quite basic skill set to start off with. But as she developed, you could see yeah. by just a bit of time and muscle memory and just working at something, how good you can get in a short space of time. And that's like, to me, like the great sort of like, if you watch these videos, and work on them, because she'd watch some of the old videos of mine, <laughs> and like look at like how to do a certain thing, and then she'd do it, and like find a tweak and do it better. It's like, cool, that's what you want. Yeah. That, th this is in safe hands, see you later, I'm off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it, they just got rinsed in the comments by mean 12 year olds in the basement, I think. I mean, it's usually have, case. I, I get it quite a lot. You we all, all do. You all get it lots. Yeah. People that will sit behind, hide behind yeah. their keyboards and they'll go, this is terrible, this is wrong, you've done yeah. this wrong. I'm like, cool, let me, let me watch your fucking video. Yeah. <laughs> you should be able to do it, you dickhead. Yeah, uh, there was uh, one which was like, these are the worst painted models I've ever seen in my life. And I was like, well, not that bad, are they? <laughs> I've, I mean, I've seen worse, and they've been painted by dogs. Uh, <laughs> but okay, you probably don't have many dogs painting models for you. No. And then, I didn't realise they had a, uh, obviously got a YouTube channel. I was like, oh, you know what, I'll have a, I don't, I don't mind doing this. I'll have a little look. And they got models painted. I was like, mm, I feel less guilty now. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I don't normally do that, but I was just like, yeah, I don't know where you, what, because I had this once in retail. A guy came in. Uh, it's that kind of blindness to your ability. Um, and people do suffer from it. This guy came in and we used to do stuff for the cabinet. Me and Duncan. Duncan's good at painting, right? We can put Is that he? on the table. I'd say he's okay at painting. Uh, he's all right. Uh, I'd say I'm, I'm all right as well. You know, yeah. I, can, I can push it if I need to, but you know, I get lots of stuff on the table. This guy walks in, he's just like, who paints the models for your cabinet, mate? I was like, oh, we do. He's like, yeah, you wanna, you wanna get someone that knows what they're doing? Uh, I paint models. Uh, I'll send you some stuff through. You can uh, look at it and you can pay me. I was like, first thing I made, I was like, who is this joker? What is yeah. it? I was like, okay, we'll bring something in then, show us what you can do. because. The time I was like, maybe you could be a key timer. You could do some extra stuff for the cabinets. It's a bit ballsy to come in and just mock the stuff that we spent a couple of uh, evenings doing. But sure, comes in. He's got like gambling on horseback, metal figure, banner. It's not sculpted. It's just like flat. I couldn't tell if it was a horse, a white poo, a Dalmatian. <laughs> it was. It was a mess. And like no co colours were bleeding into other colours. And I'm like looking at it going, what is this guy seeing that I'm not? Yeah. And I'm like. Now we're good, mate. It was like, we don't want missing out on their rubbish. And I was like, cool, no worries. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But I, I sometimes think that with like people in the comments that maybe have that disillusion. Um, and I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. Just seeing that once, because I didn't. I thought they're just people just doing it for to be mean. But actually seeing someone physically come in, say the stuff that I Duncan's mean, painting is bad, and then show me something that is actually my six-year-old could do better. That's a ballsy move. Yeah, yeah. I often feel like in the comments it's because they have the safety net of being behind that keyboard. Yeah, yeah. And that user Oh, there, there is that, yeah. And you have no idea who they are. Coming into the shop, fair play to that guy. I mean, I... I He's got bollocks. I, I, <laughs> I did... Uh, this is why I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I was like, bring the model in, because I was like, so taken aback. I was like, I mean... That takes a lot to say that, so <laughs> yeah. show me what you've got. <laughs> yeah, I, I for, wait, for ages, my old business partner, Winters, he used to be like, in the comments section, like, don't feed the trolls, don't feed the trolls, yeah, don't yeah, respond yeah. to them. And I did that for ages, and then I, I got to a point where I just got so sick and fed up of shitty comments, because as, you're, as I'm sure you're learning, as I'm sure you learned from the point, you probably knew this from Warhammer TV, yeah, let alone yeah. from the painting phase, and now from doing it yourself. The level of time and effort that goes into making this content 
and we do ours live, there's a ton of time and effort that goes into to making this right from the point which we go live. There's so much time, there's so much effort, there's so much money that goes into it, there's so many things to think about, there's so many things that go wrong that you can't ac- account for, spikes in music, yeah, and yeah, microphones. Yeah, yeah. I, it hap- and then when someone goes, oh, I wish you'd, been, wish you'd have just done this little thing, you're like, all this time and effort that still wasn't fucking good enough. So I got to a point where I got so sick and fed up of, of people chipping at me with this stuff. I was like, I'm going to start feeding these trolls. <laughs> and I go, I go, I'm a horrible, Feed them poison. I'm a horrible person in the comment section to some people now. Yeah. Um, but only if they've started by yeah. being a horrible person, yeah, quite yeah. frankly. So it's like, yeah. it's, it's matching. Game, rather. Right. Yeah, fair game's fair the game, right way to put it. So, uh, so we did GW, we joined Painting Phase, did that for, what was that, like a year? It was, yeah, it was, uh, 16 months-ish. Yeah, so I started in October, finished in Feb. Yeah. So, I don't know. And that's when I first I first met you properly was when I came yes, down to do the, yeah, the show. Yeah. The then, then, then I left because it was all your fault. You, don't <laughs> say that. <laughs> Literally in the Thane's WhatsApp chat today was, hang on a minute, Liam went to painting phase and then Peachy left. <laughs> it's all his fault. I'm like, how else do you destroy yeah. the competition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Coach me, said, you know, come and work for me. So I'm now here. Well, I, uh, did, I, I said you could have Joe's wage. I said uh, that. What, oh, Joe, sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that was like, that was like fourteen months. Obviously, that's yeah. when we got together to do the interview, um, and some of the content there was was great as well. Like yeah, some of those interviews yeah. were really really good. I watched I watched a fair few of them with some of again with some of the other people that worked at workshop. Yeah. who perhaps I don't know if we would have seen their insight if you hadn't bought them on because I assume it's because you worked with them in the past. Well, most of the time it was like people reaching out to me because they worked with me or are aware of what I was doing with the channel. Yeah, Pat's channel, um, yeah. but there were contacts that I made, and I'd, I'd reach out. I mean, I reached out to like artists and stuff. Some of them couldn't make it. Some like I wanted to get Matt Ward on. Matt was like happy to come on, but then because he still does stuff for workshop, he was like, "Oh, actually, my contract might stop me from doing it." Um, because he got a lot of stick at one point, unjustifiable. And I'm sure there'd be people in the comments going, "Yes, he's an awful person. He's not. It's just Reddit telling you lies." Um, but <laughs> no, <laughs> shock. <laughs> it was on a book that you probably didn't agree with, but it wasn't just all him. Um, but there was all that kind of. So we, you know, there were some people I wanted to get on, we couldn't quite get on, and then lots of people that I knew that would like reach out and like, oh, you know, if there's ever space, just let me know because I've got like ideas. Like Tom Hibbard was a great one. Not many people would know who Tom Hibbard is. Did he do the one about contrast? Contrast, right? yeah. I, that was one of my favourite ever episodes. Yeah. Fascinating. Absolutely. Glue yeah. to that episode. The comment section was lots of people going, oh my god. I now understand a bit more about Workshop, yeah. and I'm less angry. Um, and I think it did Workshop a favour, because Tom was not shilling, he was just talking facts. Yeah. Um, uh, his ex-employees, yeah, he yeah. need to shit. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and you know, I was there at the time, and sometimes you, you, you mem- remember things different, and I said a couple of stuff in some of the videos, and he reached out and said, oh, just to let you know, some of these things you said wrong. And I'm like, oh, cool, fantastic, I'll correct that. Um, and he was like, I was like, actually, it would be cool if you came on. And he was yeah. like, I would love to come on, because I would like to talk about contrast, I'd like to talk about this, it's like, amazing. Um, so I had, had him on, and there's other people from across the business that people won't know. I'm a big fan of Paul Hicks's stuff. Not many people know who Paul Hicks is, but I bet you they've seen some of his models because he does a lot of historical stuff. Um, uh, Fenris Games, you know, he, he was new one to me. And then when he sat down talking, all the stuff he's done in his career was insane. And I was like, fascinating. Like my wife like loved that one. James Hewitt, I used to work with him. And he did a lot of the, um, So here's a good example. I think Games Workshops, and this is probably going to offend some people in books and box games, but I think some of the writers have become a bit inbred because a lot of people are coming in from reading workshop stuff and then just feeding back into that. So it's the same gene pool of information. I get it. James Hewitt and lots of other, like Dave Sanders, Sam Pearson, who was involved in Warcry, uh, uh, Dave Sanders did Underworlds, which is not a game I play, but I've heard a very, very, very good game system amongst many other games I've played. Matt Ward coming in from other sort of stuff, you know, and like Alessio doing lots of other stuff. They made like Middle Earth strategy battle game. Or people coming in from playing lots of other different games, understanding lots of different hobbies, and then using that knowledge and bringing it to Workshop have made some of the best games Workshop's ever made. Yep. There's a lot of people coming in now which have only ever read Workshop. Stuff. And I remember um, having a chat with Wade, and he was like, I want to get people to think a bit more about history and how they can influence that. Because that's how a lot of workshop stuff was done. It was like satires of history yes. or like using elements of like this battle and then turning it into something that feels a little more 40K. Because um, it has a sense of reality to it and it feels real because it's actually taking elements from this bit of yeah, history yeah. and that bit of history. 
um, like the video where I talk about the Venturini Nobles, that wasn't just me like, oh, I'm going to stick some pink with white and then stick some feathers on. It was like, I'm drawing on my experiences of Austrians and British Napoleonics and bad guys from Flash Gordon and pulling all these things together to make the Venturini Nobles. That's how they came into being. Um, and I think it's it's losing a bit of that, that it's becoming a little bit shallow in its in its depth. It's not... In Ford World, you can, you can probably argue... It's almost a got, victim of its own success. I guess so, yeah. And it's... You know, like James Hewitt was great because he had lots of different insights and he played lots of different games and he was obviously a great guest and my wife really enjoyed listening to that one and I really enjoyed just watching it back. Not, I like to watch myself. Um, yeah. uh, but just, you miss stuff when you're interviewing. So when you watch it back, you're like, oh yeah, he did say that thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's a really interesting point. Because um, one of his things was, and it's, and it's really true, it's like the rule set is a mechanic to sell the models. Um, but there is the background side of it as well, which is what, what people get invested in. Games Workshop has two big things, the background and the models. Yeah. The rules are just there to so you can play with the things that they're really into making. Um, but the background's a big thing. I'm just very worried that the background's becoming a little bit more shallow. Citizen Sigma is a great example of it's not. I think the Age of Sigma team get to have a bit of creative flair because yeah. they're constantly generating new stuff. Whereas, I don't know, I've, I, I worry if 40K is going to start just like... Because even when I was in books and box games, it would they rush out the codex. Not like we're not going to, you know, properly yeah. vet the codex, but it's like we want to get 20 codexes out by this year, reuse as much text as you can, but then you'd have a, like a little bit of flair added to it, but a lot of it was reused stuff, reused footage, reused photos, reused text. Um, and I just think a lot of the new stuff isn't as in-depth as it used to be. 40k, uh, if I'm if I'm going to be quite honest and frank at the moment, and I think this won't be a massive surprise to my audience, actually, 40k has me mildly concerned mm. right now. Um, so we are very excited about the new Age of Sigmar edition. Um, be, and part of that is because it looks cool. The model yeah. range is phenomenal. The lore's developing into quite a nice place right yeah, now, yeah. which, you know, it didn't necessarily start in a great place. It's developing into a really nice place. Some of the lore that's been expanded has, has just got really interesting. Um and the game, third edition, is a game currently. It's, a lot of people say is the best, is in a fantastic place. Mm. And what they're promising with fourth is that they're going to take third and they're going to tidy it, and that's about it. Which sounds all fantastic and great. But part of the reason why my head's been turned by uh, by Age of Sigmar in general is because 40k. So you, uh, what's, what I find really interesting is you just said the rules are a, are a mechanism to sell the models, and I feel like with 40k right now that's not doing a good job, necessarily, <laughs> if, I'm being, oh if I'm being honest. Yeah. The rule set is, I, I say this, I've said this a million times and I stand by it, I'm having tons of fun, but because of the people I play with, it's not my most favourite edition. Yeah. In fact, of the last four editions, it's my least favourite edition. Mm. And I ran a poll recently, I say a poll, we did kind of a bit of a, a Q&A session with the audience on a live stream recently where they ranked 7th through to 10th, and, and it was all too common that the least favourite was 10th edition, oh, which I felt was mildly concerning. Which was the favourite? Uh, the favourite often uh, was was between seventh and probably ninth, oh, interesting. which I thought was quite yeah. interesting in itself as well. Uh, but tenth often was the least. There's some people that had tenth as their favourite, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but I I have mild concern for forty k at the moment because the I, I think the edition I, we spoke about this when I was on the painting phase actually. I think the edition is kind of focused towards competitive and tournament play, and, and I feel like it it does that well at mm. least. Mm. But in terms of a mechanism of delivering. Um, mono, model sales and delivering narrative, I don't think it does a great job. That being said, one of the, where, where I'm leading to, the question I'm going at with this is, uh, we've, we've just spoke a lot about your time and workshop. We're going to wrap this part up soon, actually, yeah. do Thane's questions. Sorry, I've waffled a lot. No, no, it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> He's trying to beat, Josh said he'll be very upset if we beat his podcast time. We're going to do that, Josh, just so you know. It's going to be the, my new favourite guest. Um, and we'll go into the Thane's questions. We'll yeah. have a quick bathroom break before I'm going to make tea and stuff. Yeah. But what I want to ask is, you've got 20 years experience at workshop. Yeah. You left and joined the painting phase. Obviously, you've just said you're now going to do your own thing and, yeah. and run YouTube and Hopefully that's wildly successful for you and we're here to help as much as we can. But if we go back to Games Workshop itself, do you have any concern about GW and its future based on your experience? Are you like, you know what, it, it's too big, it'll be fine or? I think there's an element, it, it will always be fine because it's big. People always buy into it and pay for models. Yeah. I think with a lot of mistakes they made over the years, my wife often says like, how are they still existing? If it wasn't because of the customers and the fan base, they wouldn't exist. If it was any other company, yeah. I think it's at the point where it's just it's just a snowball now, just going down the hill and just keep building momentum and getting bigger. Um, my biggest concern, though, um, after seeing Jervis go and some of the other writers, I'm not saying all of them because there's some amazing writers still there, but I do wonder how um, 
they're directed in the stuff they do, but narrative um, feels like when I was at there in the golden era, it was a bit of everything. Um, but there was a couple of managers that were very into tournament and then they became a bit higher up and then it was more tournament match play, then more tournament match play, more tournament match play, which is fine. Don't have any issue with that because you're nice. it's nice to have a set of rules that everyone can agree on. Although sometimes it sounds like no one can agree on them. Yeah. Um, but the narrative is really what I do. I, I, I tell a story of models. I yep. don't, I paint them, I have fun painting them. There's a story already in what I'm doing with the painting. I don't play a game to win, I play a game to tell a story. And I've said this a few times with like other podcasts and like friends, like I rarely remember the outcome of the game because it's not the outcome of the game I'm after, it's what happens in the game that influences the next game we play. So usually when I do like a war cry campaign with my mate Nige, um, it's not really about who wins, who loses, like, right, this has happened, so this is now what's gonna tell the story of the next game we play. Um, so like my witch got kicked down some stairs, had a hip broken, uh, which was one of the roles on the injuries. She yeah. glitch got kicked down the stairs and a hip broken. It was just like, that's rad. That, that's just narrative <laughs> right there. Um, but you're telling the story and then it's like, well, she has to be out for a while because she's having a hip replacement. Um, and this, that, and the other. Obviously, Age of Sigma, you don't get hip replacements. Well, maybe you do. But there was a lot of focus on narrative with like some of the books and stuff. And with Jervis Gary and some of the others, it feels like that's just going to die off. And I've, I'm not saying that that's the case yet, but it just I, I worry for the storytelling, the, the layman's sort of approach to, to war game, which is just turn up with some models, have some fun, enjoy it. I do worry that it'll become more match play tournament focused. Um, do, do you think though that which isn't bad, but it's... no, no. But do you think though with the way because I feel like there's a significant number of people that that say, speak, feel the same way that you and I do, mm. um, and you'll know this more than I do. But do you think that people, as a business, as a company, Lenton Road in general, will go? We can hear actually people being concerned about this. We're gonna. We're going to actually focus on bringing some of this in. Is that something they do, or, I think or are they so. kind of yeah, I've, too I've, insular to um, care? There's some people I think that it, it becomes like, um, well, at least in the past, it's almost like you've you personally attacked them, so they double down and don't do it. Um, <laughs> I'm like that. Though. Yeah, well, I, I mean, we all are. I mean, I do that. I mean, I got told off for not drilling my barrels, so I choose not to drill my barrels <laughs> just to annoy those people. <laughs> so I can see how that happens. But um, there are some people that do listen. So I think with the noise that happened with the only hands, um, and then there not being faces for the presenters got to the point where it was a bit too much, yeah. and it was too loud, that marketing were a bit like, we probably need to correct that. Same with Curse City having a bad communication. Eventually, Curse City was not a, a one-off. Um, they then made it main range. It's still yeah. available. Um, you can still get the game, whereas before it was like, it's limited. They heard the noise, they didn't like the noise, that changed. That's good. Um, That's so there positive. Are, I yeah, I think there are some people that do care. Uh, there's a lot of people that do care. I think sometimes some people can just take it to heart and maybe get a little bit too sort of childish about yeah. their, their response to it. Okay. Um, like I've done with drilling barrels. <laughs> I like it though. I double down. I'm the same. People go, we want more top down on the streams. And I just make a real big thing about it on the next show. <laughs> and then we inev invariably don't offer more top down. So, but hey. Right, what we're going to do right now though, team, is if you team. if you don't care about the Thanes questions, actually often they have some great questions yeah. here as well, then you can stop watching right now. We're going to have a quick bathroom break and I'm going to refresh your cup of tea. <gasps> Fantastic. And then what we're going to do, we're going to come back and answer the Thanes questions. So if you are, what the hell is he talking about uh, one of our highest level memberships is the Thane tier membership they get their own private whatsapp community there's multiple threads and one of those threads is about guest questions and every time we have a guest come on the show I say hey I've got such and such in the studio ask any questions you want any questions you want and they throw them in that chat and I'll look at them for the first time in a minute and we'll read them out nice and that'll be how we finish the video off basically those questions but I need to this has been hang on a minute Pete. Hang on. oh my Two hours and 20 minutes before Thane's questions. Oh, wow. Last time Thane's questions took an hour. Okay. And the, the Josh video was two hours and, and 57 minutes long. We'll, we'll fast fire it. We'll fast fire it. Well, he doesn't want you to be longer. So if we go two hours and 58 minutes. What was it going to be the same? Minutes, <laughs> exactly the same. <laughs> we'll do two hours and 58 minutes and then he'll just be jealous. So bathroom break tea and then we'll be right back. Okay, I feel better now. Good, sorry. I feel yeah. much better now. <laughs> I, um, had that, I, can't, I, don't, I can't remember which chat it was. I don't think it was yours, but I'd like... I had a tea baby. <laughs> and I was just like, my belly had distended a bit. I was like, I really need a wee. <laughs> Can't remember yeah. who it was, no? I, It's not often, but then sometimes, because we, we had a couple of tea before we started as well, obviously, because you just turned up and Joe wanted to do some fangirling, so. 
Uh, hey, uh, we're back. We have fresh tea because mm. I feel like peachy tips. You know, I do I, like my tea. I get the play on words. Yeah. Uh, so I needed to make sure you were filled Some with people tea. have a go at me because it's not Yorkshire tea. I was like, it's very hard to get my name into Yorkshire tea. Yeah. Whereas peachy tips sounds like PG tips. You'll so. be glad. You'll be glad that this is in fact PG tips. Oh, that's, that's okay. <laughs> it's, it's not Yorkshire, but it, it does. It's, 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 the, it's the good. It's the good brother. It's well, I. This is my preference, but I'm from the south. No, no. Um, <laughs> I, honestly, uh, I'll drink any tea apart from some. American tea, which was oh, I'm at, yeah, I'm pretty much the same actually. I don't really care what it is. I'm not, snob, I'm not massively first, but I was I spent a decade in the army. Is it wet and warm? Yeah. That'll do. That's all I care about. And sometimes we're not even talking about drinks. Uh, anyway, we got some incredible questions from the Thanes there. I've had a quick scan. There's a fair few. We'll have to probably quick fire through these. Mm. Some of these anyway. Um, but these guys are amazing. These are like our most supportive people in the community, um, and I love them. So I want to give them something extra. Hence, we have the. Uh, Thanes Unfiltered, which is just their questions. Uh, so we'll say, firstly, we'll say thank you, Carl, who says, Peachy's Pet Peeves. Pet Peeves. Oh, uh, ooh, yeah, I've got a few. Um, I oh, I hate it when people judge models at the level they're painted. It, like, uh, let's say, for instance, like there's a high-end painter looking at a child painting. Like, That's not very good. I hate that because it's like, judge it by the age and the standard yeah, of what yeah, you're yeah. trying to go for. Um, I don't like tabletop... Uh, so, sorry, uh, armchair generals. I hate them. Okay. So when you're playing a game, I used to get this in the store a lot. You or like in like um, like warm when you're playing, you get some. You, you'll be having a game. You'll be with your mate. You're just there for a bit of fun. You get a rule wrong. You're like, oh, we'll sort that next time. You get someone coming going, oh, I think you'll find that that rule's wrong that you've just done there, and it's not actually that. It's this, and we're like, we don't care. Just, just you're going to fucking love the comment section after you do the stream later. <laughs> <laughs> is that what they're all like? All YouTube is is, is armchair generals on the comment section, PG. <laughs> yeah, sorry guys. Uh, just you know, read the room, read the room. The thing is, th this will come out after the stream, which will be amazing because they'll, they won't notice your pet peeve until they've written the rule in the comments. Like, don't worry. You can't delete it, you already look like a knob. <laughs> and I got low, I can't, usually when, if I hear this whilst watching the show, I'll be like, oh, what are my pet peeves and listening? But when it's yourself in the seat, you're like, yeah, oh. Yeah, yeah, it's I'm, horrible. I mean, it? there's like, like like stuff about driving. Oh, um, I'm gonna go for a, a driving one as a motorcyclist. You'd probably appreciate this as well. Uh, you ride motorcycles, don't you? Yes. Yeah. We definitely talked about that. We had sure. wasn't going yeah. wrong. So I hate it when I'm, um, I'm filtering. To, to come onto a... That means going through traffic, but lane splitting if you're yes, American. Yeah, filtering and people just like see you and you can tell that they've seen you and they just move a bit further into the middle. Mm. That gets me. I also hate it when I join us, I'm on a slip road and I'm joining like an A road, excuse me, or a, a motorway. And there's a car in one of the fast lanes or the far lane and you're joining and then they come into the left hand lane so you can't join. So you have to slow yeah. down or try and speed up. And then after they've gone past, they then go back in onto like the right end lane. You literally did it just to, just to yeah, get Yeah, I'm just way. like, why did you just, could you not just stay in that? Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. The filtering thing really gets to me as well. Yeah, like, yeah. They're like, no, you can't get ahead of me. I'm like, why not? Yeah. I literally am not going to impact you at all. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually helping like not being a car. And that's yeah, I'm not in the flow of traffic. I, I did do something a while back and I had to double down on it. Um, I don't normally, I'm quite zen when I'm on my bike and stuff like that, but I was riding, I was filtering, I was taking my time. And this car like kind of just did the thing and it did it as I was filtering. So it started pushing me. There was a skip lorry on, on my left and this car in black was like pushing me basically into the skip lorry. So I was like going to crash into yeah. the lorry. Um, honked my horn, pulled back as much as I could. They then kind of moved a bit. And then I kind of, we kind of got to some lights, stopped. I was like, I don't normally do this, but I drove right up, tapped on the window. And I was like, what the F do you think you're doing? It was a car full of soldiers. And I was just like, oh, I've started out, there's four of them in there, oh well. <laughs> Trust me. Trust me, soldiers, they're the biggest bellends. Um, <laughs> but it goes to show the uh, the discipline of the British Army. They kind of just like looked at me and, went, uh, and carried on. <laughs> well, I, uh, the, the worst I had, it wasn't quite that bad, to be fair. But the worst I had, I was coming back from Salisbury. Traffic was absolutely rammed. There's a dual carriageway part before a roundabout. If you live in the area, you'll know which one I'm talking about. It's down by the, the university. And it was fucking pissing me. 
And when I'd gone to where I was, I was going to Factorium, which is in Warminster, mm. when I'd gone there, it was lovely weather. But of course, we live in Britain. So you can leave in clear blue skies and sunshine, yep. be there for two hours and come back in dark black clouds and pissing rain. Yeah. And it was, I was getting absolutely drenched. I was so grumpy. And I was filtering down this road. And the, oh, my, only, my only saving grace was I don't have to sit in this traffic in, on my bike. I can yeah. get back. And this car did that. He, he moved into the middle and stopped me. It was a white van, actually. And I couldn't get past him, so I couldn't bang on the window. And by the time he moved out the way, I obviously went and carried on yeah. and I didn't stop and talk to him. But I was sat there behind him going, why have you done this? Yeah, yeah. You're sat in your warm van. Yeah. I'm getting soaking wet. Yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah. sure he was laughing his nuts off at me. <laughs> I guess it made him feel better. Maybe he had a tough day and he just needed perhaps. to take it out on someone. Perhaps, perhaps. But anyway, yeah. thank you, Carl. You're a legend. Sam, thank you. Uh, Star Pilot says, Peachy's dream model. Dream model. Ooh. It can be a group of models, if mm. you'd rather. I feel... Um, a, ra a limited edition Imperial Guard regiment that's Sean Bean in every movie he's played. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, oh, I don't know why I didn't assume it would go in the way of Sean Bean. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, a, a sharp based Aston Ritarm squad. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that, yeah. that, that. There we go. Right, cool. Perfect. Uh, Chris Sanford says, thank you, Sam. Chris Sanford says, have you ever hit a wall in your painting where you felt good enough but not progressing, scared to try new things? How would you break out of the box when that happens? I have, actually. Um, I had a small... Uh, well, I say small. I, I, I was painting with heavy metal. It was like a couple of weeks. I was doing a Stegodon, and I hit the wall pretty quickly because, yeah. to me, to do like a Stegodon monster for me was like a three, four-day job. Yep. Um, and I'd... Got to the three, four days, done the crew, done the Stegodon, done the Howder. Um, and then Nibs, who was next to me, he's been there decades, was just like, no, you're not done. You've still got like seven more days on the project. I was like, I've, I can't see past, I'm, I'm done. And then he showed me lots of little techniques. He, he, Cause Stegodon, even though it's got like textured scales, it's actual underbelly, it's quite flat. So he showed me how to like paint texture, which was quite nice, I learned that. Show me how to do some cool effects just using washes on horns to get a nice like, gradient on horns, then highlight them up. So I learned a lot of cool techniques which I then incorporated into my army painting. Um, but for me, a, a lot of that stuff is like, can I be asked to, to spend hours doing all these like little neat lines on a horn? Or should I just do the flat colour with the washes and wipe it with my finger? I'll do that instead. Um, so I learned a lot from doing that and it got me past a certain wall, but I do tend to find that if I hit a wall, I try and find a way that makes it look cool, but yeah. quicker, as opposed to high-end painting. Um, I guess working at the studio, though, was probably incredibly good for Lurt, because, mm. well, I mean, was it quite a collaborative space? Was there lots of people that would all show each other and help each other? Yeah, I mean, we'd when we finished a project, there was a table at the end. Usually, if it was like, let's say, the Chaos Warrior project, um, I'd be putting my units near the heavy metal stuff, so when people would walk past, it was had black cloth, very nice velvet black cloth. And you'd see like Peach's units. No one ever looked at my units because it's just a unit painted by like some random chump. Uh, but they'll be looking at all the heavy metal colour variants and stuff, which I did as well because they're quite nice. But um, you'd get like heavy metal painters come along giving you some advice and feedback. And vice versa sometimes, you know, like I'd, I'd randomly do a colour scheme. So I did some um, Jakari, which were called the Red Grief. I don't think they had the name when I started doing them. But I did them all with red armour, black undersuits. Um, and then did like punchy blue hair. And then that became like a colour variant because they're like, we really like that colour combo. That's cool. We'd never would have thought about doing that as a colour combo. So we're going to stick that in the book. We're going to get one of the heavy metal painters to paint one that looks like that. I was like, oh, that's amazing. Cool. Wicked. Oh, super powerful. So, so yeah, so like, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm okay with colour. It's just pushing things to that yeah, higher yeah. level that. I think a lot of the time is me just being lazy. But also most of us don't care about. Yeah. To be fair. Yeah, I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Anyway, Nick says, I love this one, by the way, and it has many laugh emojis on it, right? <sighs> if Peachy could fight any Warhammer employee, past or present, in any car park in the world, who would it be and where? Hmm. <laughs> <Tyler. laughs> There's a few I'd definitely like to fight. Uh, <laughs> but I think there's always that chance of losing, so I think I might go with uh, the old cleaner lady, because I reckon I could win that. Uh, Sorry, old cleaner lady. Yeah. She's, like, you know, she's, she's a lovely lady. Yeah. But, uh, she, uh, uh, actually, no. Donna, not, not you, Donna, a different old cleaner lady. Um, Donna would probably be able to knock me out flat. Um, 
not the same Donna's old. I'm not saying. <laughs> <laughs> There's not, a lot of digging going on. Yeah. <laughs> not that Donna's going to be watching this, but <laughs> but yeah, I reckon uh, old cleaner lady from the golden era. I reckon I could take her. In which car park? Warhammer World's car park? Oh yeah, one World car park. Okay. So everyone could see. Where all the fights take place. Where all the fights do take yeah. place, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nick, you're a legend. Uh, Adrian says, uh, what got him so hooked on Sharp? What is his best memory related to Sharp? What's, uh, but the best memory, hang on. What is his best memory related to Sharp? But the best memory, oh, and the best memory related to the hobby. is a typo there, okay. So what got you so hooked on Sharp? So I didn't know who Sean Bean was at that time. Okay. Never heard of him. Uh, it was not until Sharp that I started I to love Sean. Yeah, Bean. amazing. That, that's when I was like, "Oh, that's that guy. For, that's Sharp. He's in Patriot Games. Why is he Irish? Don't get it." Um, and it was one day because I was already into like my war gaming with my dad. We did a bit of uh, Warhammer stuff, but I'm a big historical fan and I like Napoleonic stuff. I got loads of like books with like cool bits of art. And there's this TV show called Sharp, and it was like, oh. He looks like one of those guys in green that are like supposed to be like really good. And there's, well, there's all the guys in red there as well. I know about them. Um, obviously, didn't know that much about them. And then it was just this TV show that went on, and it became like mandatory viewing for the Peach family because um, <laughs> it was like it was almost like a, a, in those days you, you didn't stream. It was like it was on TV when it was on TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was no pause, and you wait for the, yeah, the commercial break. And everyone breaks. sits around the TV. And, yeah, 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 yeah. So it was like that was it was what. Tw- uh, not, um, I think 91 was the first one. So oh, I was wow. definitely in secondary school and I was definitely in the first year or second year because I remember having chats with my mates about Sharp around one of the buildings where we used to go into the form. Um, and I just loved like the old kind of like adventure action. Yeah, It was kind of a bit of everything. There was like romance in it. There was like, ooh, a bit of boob, a bit of side boob if you're lucky. Um, <laughs> and then like, you know, just like a guy punching people, going against the establishment, like, oh, I'm a common man for the common people. But, you know, oh, I'm going to beat up that officer, punch him in the face, because I'd already understood, because I was at cadets as well, so officers are tops. Don't ever admit to that. Um, why? Don't ever admit to being in cadets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, I enjoyed it, it was great. I learned, I learned a lot, uh, kind of. What I did learn, this is a great thing, when I was in cadets at school, because the school I was at was quite a posh school, um, which was to the point where, you know, my mum and dad had to like, get savings and, like... Uh, not you know, get sa- well, yeah, to get savings that, but like borrow money to buy the blazer and the tie. Oh wow! Because it was the only school in the catchment area. It's like absolutely insane. But it was it was full of lots of snobby kids. But they were the worst. They were like the thieves and the and the scumbags. Yeah. And well, it was always like a, a small group of like ruffians, which were just like the farming community, who would always get accused of like theft and this that, and the other. It wasn't until I joined the cadets that I realised all these ruffians were actually really nice people. And they had their own little safe community. So when things happened at school, you were just like, ah, yeah, I'm just going to hang around with those guys. Yeah. Because we're all cadets and we're not snobs. <laughs> uh, and it felt very much like Sharp. <laughs> Brilliant. So what's your favourite Sharp memory? Uh, I think my favourite Sharp memory is, um, oh, there's a few, but I would probably say watching Sharp's Waterloo because I read the book um, and it was the first big book I really read on my own. Um, no, it wasn't because I read the Gaunt, uh, the Gaunt's Ghost ones before that, but I'd, um, I'd got a Sharps one and uh, the Waterloo came up. And it, a lot of the things in the movie was very much like I remember in the book, but completely because me and my dad were just ripping it to pieces because it was like a handful of Ukrainian extras. So it was like, there wasn't like a big square. There wasn't like, you know, like swathes of soldiers. It was just like fun because <laughs> yeah. it was like a handful of, it was like 50 guys representing a British square. Um, and yeah, we had a, a good good laugh at that. Going, Perfect. Uh, and your favourite me- hobby memory? Favourite hobby memory? Um, oh, I'll still need to draw upon. I bet yours, but this must be difficult for you, actually. I reckon there's millions. There, there is a lot. I think if I was to, to pick like one, just like in an incident that comes to me, it's probably like sitting down at the, the kitchen table. It's not like one particular hobby, but a like moment, but it's definitely like a collection of moments. Sitting down at the kitchen table with my dad, painting. That's amazing. Um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll take that in my head for a long, long time. There's lots of other ones where I've done like fun games with friends and stuff like that, but that was the first one that came to my mind. A bit jealous of it, actually. It's amazing because my dad did a lot of airfix. Mm. That's what he, what he was into. And I started hobbying pretty much after he'd finished hobbying. Mm. Like he stopped hobbying. I started, so I never really had that. So oh, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, he has asked another one, which I'm going to jump to very quickly. Favourite way to make tea and what's your most memorable brew? <laughs> memorable brew? Uh, so, so first of all, is it tea bagging? So it depends. So if you're doing a, I know there are rules. If you're if you're doing a pot of tea that's in like you know fine china, 
then the milk goes in first because you don't want to crack the china. Uh, that is a rule. So hot in China can uh, hot hot tea or hot liquid in China can crack it. That's why you have milk in first with those. But mugs, mugs of tea, it's it's. But the it's milk's not into it first, though, is it? Because the water's in the tea bag first because it's in the pot. So it's still it's still tea bag water and then milk. Oh, technically, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah, important. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's that, important that, that, tea. that is a very good point. <laughs> I think we're, we're, when I'm making a mug of tea, I put the tea bag in, I put the hot water in, give it a bit of a stir, and then I do like three or four dunks, do another stir, take it out, because Yorkshire tea, you can get two good teas out of it. I once in retail managed to squeeze 10 out. Number 10 was horrid. Uh, it was dishwater, pretty much. Uh, but it was hot. Uh, <laughs> so that was my worst tea. <laughs> Most memorable tea, I think. <laughs> I get the most memorable tea every day, which is the first cup of tea of the day. It's amazing. Mm. My uh, my darling wife. I'm going to sound like a right spoiled twat here, by the way. I don't, <laughs> I don't like. I'm not a morning person. I'm a late to bed person. Mm. My darling wife gets up. She has an alarm that goes off at half six, and she gets up, and then she'll ine- invariably be up at about ten past seven in the morning after letting the dog out of feeding her and blah. And she sets up the breakfast for the kids downstairs, and she comes up with a tray with a a pint mug of tea on it for me. <sighs> And she puts it on the bedside table and lets, just lets me come round and drink my hot tea in bed. That's amazing. Oh, she's the bestest. Yeah. Mrs. Peach does that once in a while, but I do. Mrs. Peach doesn't drink tea. Do you not? Hates it. Likes coffee. But she makes the best cup of tea. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, which is mad. Uh, they're Joe, my favourite teas. Joe makes fucking terrible tea. <laughs> just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they'll be able to hear that. Uh, what was the most... So thank you so much, Adrian. You're a legend. Sean says, what was the most painful thing you had to paint for Warhammer TV? Oh, oh! I mean, let me think, because there's some projects I really didn't enjoy. Um, for Wama TV, though. Yeah, yeah. For for Wama TV, I think there was. It wasn't painful from a painting point of view. It was painful from a process point of view, and that was the Achillean Leviden, um, right. because it took ages to decide on a colour scheme because we normally do box packaging, and there's no way I'm doing the box packaging of that colour scheme, that is not something you can achievably do. That, that is heavy metal going full on. Um, and it's sort of like a weird colour scheme. So in the end, I wanted to do the one that was in the army book, which had like green turtle skin, brown Yeah, it's the, big, it's the big turtle on the yeah, shelf yeah, there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. 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 And it, uh, kind of, everything was sub-assembled though. So like the howder I had separate, which I sprayed white and then painted bone. The crew were all spray, like separate. Some of them were sprayed silver. Um, and then it was just trying to get them in shot because sometimes like the camera could only go so far back before you see like the black around them because you had this like blue cyan white to fade. So it could only go so far back. So it was like constantly trying to keep it in in shot because um, it was so big. I mean, Marathi had her own flaws, but I actually enjoyed painting Marathi, but I didn't enjoy painting the Achilles Leviden um, <laughs> for many you? reasons. I mean, there was elements to it. I was like, this is dry brushing. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm all good with that. But yeah, there's so many bits broke on it as well. I have a grey one next door. You've just completely put me off that temporarily. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> there's a really good paint guy on Warmer TV though. <laughs> yeah, is there? This guy that you know. Yeah. Uh, thanks for anyway. Alan says, "Well, thank you, Alan. Why are there fewer tabletop ready creators on YouTube than parade ready ones? Which I mean, we've kind of talked about this at the start, whereby you're doing, hey, here's how you get your army ready, and it's quick and it's easy. Yeah. You can do a whole army. And we've talked about how a ton of current content creators out there are making. Here's how you make something you could probably into a competition. Um, I've got my views on this one, but why do you think there's more parade ready than tabletop ready? So I'm in a unique position um, because I've built up a reputation over years. Some of that was from Warmer TV, granted. If you knew me before that, you knew what the stuff I did in White Dwarf, the books, <laughs> you, you know my skill set. So when I put stuff on my paint guides, you know I can paint to a high level. Yep. I just choose to paint to a level that's achievable, that anyone can follow and I show the mistakes, and I'm rough, and I'm dirty. If you aren't that well known, and you go in doing that content, the internet is horrible and full of horrible people. Yeah. And I even still get this. I get horrible comments about my painting. I had it when I was on the painting phase. I had it when I was in Warmer TV. I still have it now. There, there's just people that like to feel better about themselves, and they will judge you based on your skill set. And I think a lot of people have... Um, I don't think it's ego. I just think it's sort of like if they lower the standard, they open themselves to more criticism. I mean, even Richard Gray gets told he can't glaze properly. I mean, you know, that guy is the king of glazing. So when people are reaching out to Richard saying he's not very good at glazing, that tells you the kind of people that are yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because I, I don't care. I, I respond sometimes and, you know, there, there are some comments on me like, that's a bit off. 
But for the most part, I don't care about those people reaching out and saying you're not very good at painting because this clearly this video is not for them. Yeah, it's for the other ninety five percent of people that want to get stuff on the tabletop, and I will carry on with that mindset and carry on doing those paint guides. But I think there's a lot of other people out there that might be a bit more concerned about doing that. I think when you do YouTube, you have to have a relatively thick skin anyway. But I think when you do specifically things like painting guides, I think you have to have a slightly thicker skin, mm. if I'm honest. Um, people can criticise me for getting a rule wrong. The likely is I probably got the rule wrong. Cool, that's fine. All the staff at workshop get the rules wrong. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't going to go down that path. Um, Even the guys that wrote the rules get the rules wrong. Often, yeah. <laughs> Imagine needing 20 odd pages of clarifications to get a rule set right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but when it comes to painting, especially when some of it's artistic choice or stylistic yeah. choice as well, and a lot of it is based on ability rather than interpretation of rules, I feel like that hits a bit more personal sometimes yeah. as well. Yeah. So. No, agreed. Uh, I think part of the reason as well is I think, if, again, if you haven't been known, I think by putting out Parade Ready, you're showing, hey, look, I can do it. Yeah, yeah. And that yeah. It, it gives you some sort of sort of gravity to your content. In the, and then I think often algorithmically it's more rewarding or it's more heavily rewarding when it's an impressive paint job because potentially more people will watch it because the end result's more impressive. Um, that's how it works in my head. I don't know because yeah. I, I I've never made any painting content. Yeah. Really, so. I mean, I, I have, and this is the intention with the channel as well, I will do the sort of like tabletop level, battle ready level, what you want to call it. And then I do like the next steps. I mean, I, sh I could, if I wanted to do a third video, which is like how to win a golden demon. Not yeah. that I've ever won a golden demon, so I'm not a, at all equipped to talk about that. But I can certainly paint it to a level that can then get you to then look at the Duncans and the Richard Greys yeah, yeah. and all that out there, the Ninjons, the Miniacs, and then you can, you know, my, mine is a set of fundamentals to get you on that path. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy to do that. And I think it needs people to to do that um, and that aren't concerned about what people think of them. Um, yeah. Because there's always going to be people out there, and you're right, from an artistic point of view, you know, like when I sat and chatted with uh, Paint Perspective, Seed Studio, James and the, the guys, you know, they're amazing painters. And I'm like, why have they got me on the channel? I mean, I'm just a, an army painter. I just paint stuff fast. I'm nowhere as talented as like Joe and like uh, James and all. So why, why do they want to talk to me? But I guess from their point of view, they see something different. So. Well, I think, I think their level from the majority of people from 90% plus of people is essentially unachievable, yeah. really. Yeah. And, I, and I guess to some extent, Siege probably want it to be unachievable because mm. then you pay them to do it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think you know, like your kind of perspective is significantly more interesting for the wider audience because dare I say this without being rude about your skill set over the last 20 odd years, it looks more achievable, yeah. so people can do it. They yeah. can replicate it. I think that makes it more well, the, accessible. Uh, one of the biggest heartwarming things that happens to me and the, the biggest win for me is when someone follows my guide, puts a picture on Instagram or Twitter, sh or DMs me a photo, and it looks identical to the one I've done in the video, that means I've done my job right. Yeah. Because they've copied the video and it looks the same. There's so many videos out there where you'll see the owl get drawn from like one, two, three, finished owl, and then you're still at like, two and a bit and you're still struggling. Yeah, How do yeah. I get to that point? To see the owl the same as mine, and I'm using the owl as the weird analogy no, I get it. here, but, um, and it looks no different, and, it, and sometimes it looks a little bit better. Um, there was a, oh, I forget the name of the channel now, some uh, battle report channel I was watching the other night, and they painted up a load of Inquisitorial Stormtroopers, and I could tell they used my guide, because it was the exact same way I painted mine. It was the exact same glows, the exact same way the armor's chipped, the exact same red, I was just like, that looks better than mine. I had a guy. I had a guy yesterday. I mean, it's not quite the same, but I had a guy yesterday who showed, sent me some pictures of his space walls on Instagram and DMs. I get warm fuzzies. I haven't even given the painting guide, but I like the fact that he's proud enough of them to want me to see them. I think yeah, it's yeah. amazing as well, which yeah. is really really good. Uh, and it, like he was sending me all these photos. I was like, I'm so, I'm so, like it's so heartwarming that you're so proud of what you've done that you're showing me. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really good. Right, uh, thank you. Anyway, you legend, Alan James says, what games workshop models do you think are actually awful? either from a building, painting, or general aesthetic perspective? Two, well, there's a lot, um, and that's for different reasons. Some of them are of their time. But I think current range, there's two awful ones for different reasons. Okay. Awful, Bliss Barb Arches, they look beautiful. Bliss Barb Arches, okay. They're Slanesh Bowmen. Okay. Bow, bowmen, Bowwomen. They look beautiful, right? They are rank and file. They are not easy to paint. They are not easy to build. They, they are not easy to build at all. They are they they have elements to them that like that there's a finger and a thumb separate on one of them, whereas the other nine don't have that when they're shooting the bows. It's like someone made the choice to make the finger and thumb separate. When I built mine, lost it on the carpet, can still not find it to this day. So I now have a model I can't use um, in the in the unit, and there's so much detail on them. Um, 
I managed to find a, like a, a shortcut because they have all these banding, like sort of gladiatorial strap sort of sandals that come up to here yeah. and all these other straps on their arms. And it's like skin and then black strap, skin, black strap, skin, black strap. They are a nightmare to paint and a nightmare to build. They're one. Yeah. And then number two is those new Space Marines with the massive over the top cannons. It just feels, and I, I, this is not oh, against the, the sculptor, desecrators, de yeah, desolation marines, desolation marines. It, it t-shirt launchers. Yeah, it reminds me of someone that's new to the hobby that's first found kit bashing and has gone, I'm going to stick every gun on the model. <laughs> that, that is literally what it feels like, and it feels like someone in miniatures should have gone, you've gone too far. Let's take some off. Now it looks cool, um, yeah. and that's the only time if. I would criticise a sculptor's sort of vision because sculptors know what they're doing. They've been doing it for years, but somewhere along the line in that department, because I know how the department works, someone didn't do their job and look at that and goes, that looks cack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you've said it. I've said it for ages. I saw a bunch of people do conversions with that. It's like Adrian from Tabletop Titans yeah. took the missile launcher and shoulder mounted it and it instantly looked better. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. it's the, such a simple... Like... There's things you can do with them that, that look better. And, and I'm not going to throw names out, but there was one of the painters, no one wanted to paint it. And one of the painters <laughs> was just like, I'll do it because he didn't care. Um, and I was just like, and that goes to show that even the painters didn't want to paint them because they look ridiculous. And I think it was getting to the point where they just wanted to do Marines for the sake of doing Marines. Yeah. And it, I used to get kids coming to the retail store that have got like a, a Land Raider or a Razorback. And in a Land Raider, you get spare guns. In a Razorback, you get spare guns. They don't realize that that's options. They just go, I'm 10. I've got loads of spare guns. I'm going to glue them on top yeah. of the guns that are already on there. And that's something a 10-year-old would do. <laughs> and it feels like it. They, they had that. There you go. That's an internal, but I fucking hate Desolation Marines. I'm so happy you said that. It just looks silly. Uh, Sean then says, not a question. So thank you, James. Sean says, not a question, but the game of Blackstone Fortress you did with Duncan and Suggs yeah. and Becca Scott and the crazy adverts around the time was the pinnacle of Whammer mm. TV. And nobody can tell me differently. I miss fun Whammer TV. I miss fun Whammer TV. I miss fun Whammer TV. I used to look forward to getting like a new mad video um, to do during that period. And there was like, there was, like one where I was donning my armor for Citizen Sigma at the time. And then like, I'm doing all this speech. It was all my voiceover. And the, it was one of my favorite ones because the editor did a really good job. And then I just lift up my helmet because I'm imagining myself being this heroic guy and then I'm just playing a game with Duncan and then I can't move the figures because I've got it. gauntlets on and stuff like that. But there was a, there was a fun story. I'm going to throw this in there now. Um, we did a range of contrast videos. The first one was like Fifty Shades of Grey with this really nice guy. I forget his name now. I think, I think it was Adam or Andy. He was an underwear model and they, he was an attractive man. So they wanted an attractive man to help sell contrast. So oh, they didn't ask me. I know, and they didn't ask me. Yeah. Uh, and I was a little bit disappointed, but you know, it happens. Um, so they, he came and he did like the Fifty Shades of Plastic, where he basically takes this woman into show his secret and it's just like a shelves of plastic. This was like the first video. Then there was the one where I dressed up as Morpheus and we did like the contrast, take the blue, pa sorry, the painted model or the unpainted model. And then there was Duncan doing what was best in life as Conan. Uh, it was like three videos all linked to like the build up of contrast. And my favorite, there's such a weird thing that the, um, I get dressed up as Morpheus. They found some place somewhere in the Peak District to do some filming. They got like some leather chairs that were, which were like uh, green. And uh, we, we set up, it was the most, not very health and safety aware place to film. There was like so many things that were ready to fall on and killers. Um, <laughs> but we had fun and I was told that I just, uh, you know, I'm not an actor, right? Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a presenter of paint guides, and there's an actor, a trained actor, who's also an underwear model, who came and he did two big videos with lots of words, and this one he had one word, which was contrast, question mark. I had everything Morpheus would say, and I was like, <laughs> I've never done this before. I don't know how to, I, I, I've got a terrible recall. They're like, don't worry, we'll just do a couple of lines at a time because we can cut to different cameras. I luckily like started memorizing it, driving back for two weeks on my, on my bike to work and back, trying to memorize it. Trying to, and this was just like one scene, uh, trying to memorize it. Then we went to um, to do the filming and they were like, okay, go. And I was like, are we not doing it in like sets? They're like, no, just do it all in one take. And I was like, it's a good job I spent like two <laughs> weeks learning these lines and in it. But the worst bit was after, uh, one of the managers came along and went, um, I'm not sure about the chairs. We're like, what do you mean? Because they look the same. They're like, yeah, but in the film, they're red. Oh. And you've got green. And then one of the editors is like, and that's the colour issue you have. Because I'm a white Morpheus. 
<laughs> and he, and he decided to get all up sticks about the colour of the chairs, not the actual, uh, you know. Amazing. Yeah. That concert was peak, though. Like, yeah. I remember, I think it was, um, there's, there was a number of videos I remember where it was like popping out of a bin with a sister's battle sprue and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, like, those yeah. sorts of things. So I was like, this is so many great. Things. So many. I mean, like Duncan and Gavin, a hissy fit about Titans, no, Knights, Imperial Knights. Yeah. So many. Yeah, well, that, was, that was the pinnacle. It was the pinnacle. Of, Thanks, Sean. Entertainment. Thanks for reminding us of all those moments. James says, what Imperial Guard regiment would you like to see in plastic, either returning or entirely newly done? Uh, Mordy Nine Guard. Oh, okay. As much as I love the event really nobles, I do love the Mordy Nine Guard. I would go straight in Valhallens. Ooh. Love Valhallens. You see, I had this sort of idea that they could have done a thing where, because if you look at the Talon Desert Raider, sort of like tunic. It's a little bit long, but it's kind of the same length as the Steel Legion guys. And I always had this idea that they could do a twofer kit. And Death Corps Krieg, potentially, Valhallens could be the same kit with different heads. It's exactly what that twat next door said. Yeah. I, and that's why our Valhallens are all Kriegers with head hmm. swaps. Perfect. That's exactly what they were. Because Mordians could be Praetorians. Yep. Um, they can, they 100% they can do that. Yeah, so they, they, yeah, I was, we always talked about like two for kits and stuff yeah. like that, and that was a perfect opportunity to do that. But there you go. Did. James, you'd have Mordians. Uh, thank you, James. What Jill says, what speaks to you when looking at new model or game system? Uh, game system, can I learn it and retain that information? That's why I like Warcry. That's why I like things like Chosen Men, Silver Bayonets, really simple, straightforward rules. I don't have a million books. More times brilliant for it as well, because you've got one book, everything you need is in that one book. Yeah. Uh, unless you do all the extra uh, warbands after. Um, and models, how can I convert it? Because I like converting models. And I think that's helped me. I had this conversation with um, the Siege Studio guys. I've never painted anything that's box cover, unless I've had to do something very specific for work. Um, I've never painted anything that's box cover, so I've never felt my painting's been like not quite as good yeah. as the box cover because I've always done a head swap, an arm swap, or a completely different colour scheme. So I often look at like how can I change that when I see a new kit. That's Citizen cool. Sigma, looked at the Citizen Sigma going, how can I 40k them? Oh, really? How can I make an Imperial Guard regiment out of them? I love it. So, yeah. I love that stuff. I, I'm so obsessed with the, with the Age of Sigma range in general there at the moment. Thanks, Joey Legend. Carl says, you worked for Games Workshop since I was a fetus. Oh, God. <laughs> in that time, what are the best and worst changes you saw in terms of the hobby, not the business? Uh, hobby. I think, uh, God, there's a lot of changes that happened over that time. Mm. I think going mainstream with videos, uh, I think, is the best move they yep. did for the hobby because... It's interesting to see the scale of talent jump in comparison. I had to learn everything the hard way and through lots of mistakes where you get something that just, I started the hobby a year ago and they show someone on Instagram and be like, how the hell have you painted that in a year? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of content out there and I think that helped encourage other people to start doing their own content. So I think it's been a really sort of like good melting pot of ideas and seeing other talent come from that and then they do their own thing because, you know, as bad as the internet can be, it's also an amazing tool as well. Agree, strong. And I think... Um, that was the best move Workshop ever did was have a personality and put it out there as short-lived as some of that was which we just alluded to a minute ago the worst thing oh I think the way they handled blowing up the old world yeah I think a lot of people would agree with that one it's not the fact that they blew it up and started afresh and they could have they handled that differently and moved it to Forge World and did the whole specialist game old world stuff as a separate here's Warhammer historical and here's the new angle I want to go down. It was the fact that they brought out these End Times books and we were playing through them as well because I had my Empire Army, I had my Undead Army um, and we were excited about like the storyline and like Nagash was the first one that came out so we'd start playing for all the scenarios in that. But by the time we were like halfway through Nagash, the second book had come out, the third book had come out, the fourth book was on its way. And I'm like, huh? I've not even done this one Can't yet. keep up, yeah. You couldn't keep up with, and I, even then I think after, after it had all been done, a couple of the managers that were in charge of the, the whole kind of thing at the time were like, we should have left it a little bit longer. And I think if we had, we would have had a better sort of starting point for Age of Sigma as well, because that was a bit rushed. Yeah, I think people would have bought into it more. Yeah. Because yeah. they'd have been able to play along and, and kind of live the story, I guess. I understand why they did it. And I, I liked why they did it. And I was able to make up cooler stuff. But I, I think in hindsight, and hindsight it is always a great thing, but I think it could have been handled differently. I think that's yeah. the worst Mistake, okay. really. Thanks, G uh, thanks, Jill. No, Jill, not Jill. Thanks, Carl. It's because Jill's got another question. Ooh. Is it time we saw a resurgence of wooden clothes pegs, or are you just after easy mode pegging? 
A uh, bit of both, a bit of both. Uh, I do need to make some pegs and peg people at Salute, actually. Um, uh, that's this weekend, I don't think I can get a... I might just start just like just bringing in a, a little bit of loot. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. She then says, what hobbying skill took you the longest to be happy with? Ooh, I would say scenery. Scenery? Building scenery, because okay. I used to build some scenery when I was a kid. It was always like cardboard, or always warp, and then... I did some stuff for the store and it was like wood and sort of wood glue and filler. And I, can't, then, I can't do it. And then I got into the studio and it was like, yeah, you're using all these really either thin materials or these really heavy materials. And then it was like foam card and then plastic card and like bolster wood and all that kind of stuff. And it was like a lot lightweight. Um, it didn't sort of, there was, I forget what it's called now. It's like, if you go to Audi, they have these, and keep meaning to go to Audi and ask to get some, you get the signs that are up. It's not the cardboard signs, it's another material. I want to say UPVC, but it's not. It's like a PVC, it's like a thick board. And Dave Andrews, when he used to make the scenery, he'd use that as the initial sort of like molding process before okay. it would go off. And you can carve into it, you can cut into it. You also get that expanded blue foam, which is really good for like cutting into and stuff. So once I realized that I could use that kind of thing to build scenery as well, that opened up so many I'm more doors. I'm terrible with scenery. <laughs> like, GW, give me the kits. I'm yeah, yeah. Use those. I mean, the kits are great. It's just, and they don't stay in, in long enough as well. That, that annoys me. That's, they, that's, that's another a peeve. peeve. Yeah. Yeah, because Jeez, the, that makes Joe angry. Yeah, I mean, there's the best scenery they did, and I love it for Warcry, is the stepped sort of like um, temple stuff. Yeah. Which was what was the replacement to the old arcane ruins, which we used to use as Lego bricks pretty much for making cool sort of scenery. We'd just like get loads and like do all sorts of things. And then they got rid of it. And it yeah. was such a good set. Half the time the scenery's up for sale for five minutes and gone. And yeah. when it goes up for sale, it's extortionately priced yeah, as well, yeah. I find. Uh, thank you so much, Jill, you legend. Luke says, which of the chosen men from Sharp is his favorite and why? They, they know you like Sharp. Well, I can't say Harper because technically a sergeant, he, he was a chosen man for a time, but I would say Hagman. I always liked Hagman. He always felt like a knight. He, he would be a good grandpa to sit on the knee of and tell his stories of his time in the Polonics until he got his head blown off. Uh, that was sad. Spoilers. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's been out for a while. Yeah, yeah. To be fair. Hagman, Hagman. Good shot. Yeah. He was never cocky. Cool, yeah, I like love it. it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Luke. <laughs> Ross says, uh, what's your favourite flavour of paint and why is it Null Noil? Uh, Null Noil has a nice taste to it. I actually quite like Corax White. Uh, if I was to go GW paint, yeah. Corax White tastes a bit minty. I don't know, it seems to be like a mintiness to it. <laughs> is it? Okay. Uh, it's got like a freshness. You know when you have like a tree bomb and you get that kind of like, like yeah. freshness? It's a bit like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's brilliant. Uh, Carl <laughs> says, weirdest place you've ever painted? Uh, mm. Have you ever painted any? I've, see, I see these kinds of questions. I'm like, I've never painted in a weird place. I'm trying to think. I, I'm, I kind of have because I did a little video where I was. I'd got a Frontier War game in uh, box. It was in a mine. I was painting a figure in a mine. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah. That's pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can have that one. So cool. yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Carl. Kev says free do's and do nots, but doesn't elaborate. But then says top tips for maintaining a top tip with your brushes. Uh, try not to get paint in the ferrule. I'm, I'm terrible for that and I still do it. Um, thin your paint down a bit more. Yeah. Um, usually, like when you're doing eyes and stuff, they always end up like going, oh, I'm going to get a little bit. And you go to the eye and it dries and you get like a little bobble. Yeah, paint, yeah, yeah. Which is really annoying. So the more you thin it down, the less like that's going to happen. Um, and some people won't do it, which is fine, but I tend to use my mouth to get things to a nice point, use my own saliva which artists have been doing for hundreds of thousands of years, probably not that long. Maybe they have, cave paintings, maybe they have. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, a, it's just technique. A lot of artists just use the mouth to pull the... I do, yeah. To a point. Although I also use the palette quite a lot and I'll twizzle the brush. Even with the, the twizzling, you don't quite get that perfect point. Something about your, just like knowing, like your lips are very sensitive, right? So you can... Yeah, so, so I, I'm terrible. So I'll, I'll wash the brush and the paint. Mm. I'll then straight to the mouth of the point, I'll touch it in the paint and, and keep twisting it. Yeah, and yeah. I, then I touch it on my hand. And uh, <laughs> it's like yeah, a four oh stage my process. Days. <laughs> four, four stages. <laughs> Just to get there. Uh, he then says, dog or cat person, but also adds a prerequisite that there's only one correct answer. Okay. Uh, I mean, I've been bought with both. But if I was, if you a gun to my head and I had to pick one, dogs. Correct. Well done. I don't know if that is his answer, yeah, yeah. but that is the correct answer. Yeah, yeah. And then favourite tabletop game system setting, Games Workshop or otherwise, and why? Ooh, favourite game uh, setting. Um, mm, oh, God, there's so many, but I 
quite like Star Wars stuff, but I also like Warcry. Not Age of Sigma. I like Age of Sigma, but I like Warcry okay. because it feels a little bit like Mordheim, but not the same. But it's, it, it, the initial war cry was different chaos tribes fighting against different chaos tribes to see which is the, the, the toughest tribe to then join Archaeon's invasion of the mortal realms. Okay. And then, obviously, to make it inclusive for all of the players, you'd um, get, oh, here's a good guy, warband you can use, here's another warband, here's a list for all the warbands. But the initial sort of thing of it was chaos warbands vying for control and being it's the It's narrative toughest. focus. As yeah, well. really like that. Which we are, we found out is definitely a you thing, right? Yeah, narrative yeah. focused. Like these stories. Uh, Sean says, why did Games Workshop get it so right with War, the studio get it so right with the Warcry and drop the ball so badly with Kill Team? I, I ask that question to myself every time. <laughs> uh, it was kind of an open goal, really, because they could have just reskinned Warcry and I don't think anyone would care because a lot of the 40k players probably never played Warcry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the same when Age of Sigma was out I got so a lot of people said Age of Sigma is rubbish, 40k is a better game. Then they changed 40k um, to Dark Imperium, which pretty much used a lot of Age of Sigma engine related stuff with a few tweaks here and there. And everyone loved it. That was a 40k player. I remember being in the expo and the guy goes, Oh, this is a great game. Not like that Age of Sigma game. I was like, Have you played Age of Sigma? He was like, No, this is the exact same rule system pretty much. He was like, What? I was like, Yeah, yeah. It's just reskinned. And I wish they'd done that with Kill Team. They ended up having this. Yeah. Sometimes I think they make changes for the sake of make changes, reinventing the wheel. Warcry is easy to pick up. It's so like intuitive. Um, I, I, I wish I'd done it now. I could have brought that today, I suppose. I'd, I wouldn't need to bring a rule book because I know all the rules and I can yeah. just tell you the rules. It's just those fighter cards are really easy. Once you like, I point out what all the things mean, you never need to look at words again. You just know what you're doing, and you just enjoy the story and hit stuff. Well, with next swords. time we can play some Warcry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel I feel silly not bringing Warcry. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. So, uh, Dave then says, Ugh. "So what? Do, right? You might or might not understand this. It depends how much of the channel you've watched." He mm. says, "So what does Stu Black really think of Liam? And is it Stu? Is it true that Stu says you can take Liam out with a single judo chop?" <laughs> right. So I, I, obviously, I know Stu. Uh, what's the what's the what's the, the context beef? is as I've caught I've called him many horrible names on content. Okay. Typically, from when he comes on TV on Meta Watch articles and just babbles absolute nonsense that is actually, in fact, just nonsense. And I, I've always I've always added caveats after mm. the fact where I'm like, "Hey, look." He's the mouthpiece for GW. He's mm. probably heavily restricted to what he can and can't say. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately for him, he's also the face at that point yeah, in time. So yeah. he's typically uh, the target of a lot of my vitriol when I get quite wound up <laughs> about these bullshit Metal Watch articles about armies being balanced and stuff. It's like he's fucking talking nonsense from just a flat statistics perspective. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks Dave, dickhead. Uh, he then says, who was the most influential, <laughs> this is a more sensible question, who was the most influential in terms of hobby and painting for you? Uh, Dave Andrews, without a doubt. There you go, uh, good answer. Yeah, because he's taught me so much. It, Mark, Mark Jones, I sat with him, and he, he taught me quite a lot, but I've learned more from Dave, I think, in all my years. Yeah. Up to the point, like recently, I was doing like a load of Napoleonic stuff for, I was gonna go to the games night, I was like painting like all my bayonets on all the French and the British. And I'd gone around to play a game at his, and I was like, "Have you got your um, bayonet so shiny? Because it's like glittering off the sunlight, as if the off the light, as if the sun's touching it." It was like, oh, "I'll just use chrome pens on the bayonets and swords." It's like, "I've got chrome pens at home." <laughs> I said, Does that Genius. work? And I went and I did it. I was like, "Oh!" <laughs> so yeah, even now the guy's still teaching me stuff. He's probably forgot more. Yeah, than we, than than we, we all know. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Dave. You're a legend. Gas says, "Overall, do you think?" Having an organised competitive scene has been a positive or negative influence on army and core rules. I guess this is 40k focused. I don't think it has. Uh, I think it's the people behind the scenes thinking that's the majority of the customer base. Yeah. I think there's a lot of effort put into narrow, um, into tournament and match play because that's what they like. Yeah. And because that's what they like, they don't understand narrative. And the narrative rules writers and developers kind of understand match play is match play and it's balanced and this and the other but I, 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 and this is why I, I, I worry for the future is because it's narratives harder to describe in a rule book but you can make scenarios and make good things I mean Warcry is a great example you 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 can make it match play quite easily with the card system because you have a card for deployment you have a card for scenery I get that card for scenery I put that in the bin because I like to make up my own scenery 
Um, I don't actually put it in the bin because that's a waste. Um, and then you have like um, a victory conditions and a twist. But from a narrative point of view, you'd like look through like the ones before and go, that feels right for this setup, that yep. feels right for this setup. From a match play point of view, you just go, no, nope, the cards are going to tell me what the cards are going to tell me. Um, and I think a lot of the people there at the moment don't understand narrative. Yeah. And I think it's them not, it's not the players playing, it's the people doing the thinking and the writing. That I'd agree. I'd actually agree with you. We've, I mean, we spoke about it a lot in the painting phase as well, to be honest mm. with you. So. Uh, thanks, Gaz. He then says, less serious question, using your artist knowledge of hobby materials and colours, if you were to get a Merkin, what hobby materials and colours would you go for? I'd just use every possible colour of ta grass tough. <laughs> every possible colour of grass tough. <laughs> yeah, Love quite it. A lot out there. The most impressive part of that whole question is that PG instantly knew what a Merkin was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. It'll be my technical and Merkin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gaz. Uh, Alan says, are Games Workshop actually worried about leaks or do they encourage it in certain circumstances? Uh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> See, I always think, and I know you're never saying that you shouldn't do, but I always. I've always had this notion that Varak is sort of like being told the stuff as opposed to being a leak. And sometimes from the past and seeing how things have worked, that giving that information builds hype in its own way. Um, so I sometimes think it's a bit of both. Sometimes there are leaks because people screw up. A prime example, I had a member of the painting team uh, who accidentally left the model at home. A photo was taken of the Primaris Lieutenant. This was before any Primaris things were announced. Um, lots of people were talking about it on the internet. There was obviously a bit of a to-do. He kept his job. Um, but that was an accidental leak. There's definitely leaks that I think that's purposeful. Yeah, again, we talked about this when I went mm. on the painting phase. That video is still up on their channel, obviously. Um, I question... I, the, 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 so the reason why I have the theory is, is my honest belief is they wanted to find the leaker. Games Workshop is a bigger corporation, but it's not a giant yeah, in yeah. terms of like, if you look at um, massive, massive global companies like Google, it's not that big. So they only have X number of staff at, at Warhammer World uh, and they have probably a relatively limited supply chain in general. I think if they really wanted to find the leaker, they'd have found the leaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So agreed. either they found the leaker and they let it carry on, yeah. or it's intentional, Yeah, is, is where I think. I have my theories on who it could be. There's some people that are too, like, cut them in the middle and it says Games Workshop to the core kind of thing. <laughs> I don't think that it, it feels wrong for them to be doing it. Yeah. Like, as in, like, a deception, like, they're going against Workshop and, like, leaking the stuff. So, but there is a couple of people I'm like, but you're in such a position of power that it feels like it's too... Yeah. Contrived and too well thought out. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks, Tricky Alan. one. Tricky one. Interesting. Uh, Tom says, what paint tastes the best? We've touched that one. Corex White, apparently. Corex That's white. one you should all eat yeah. uh, in the future. Uh, Carl says, what did you make sure to swipe plenty of when you left Games Workshop? Uh, so you get your Dead Man's Order. Uh, there was a few Outriders. Uh, they're the oh, mentor. you actually get an order, do you? Oh, no, I just do I, you, oh, it. Was, okay. It's basically... You, you before know, you lose your stuff. You've got discount. a couple of weeks before you, 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 you leave, so it's good to like get some orders in. Yeah. I made sure I got a few Outrider pistol ear sets, so I've got plenty of entry <laughs> noble heads. Um, sad that they're now no longer available. I'm sure they'll come back with Old World. Um, bases, I do a lot of rebasing of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so having lots of round bases of multitudes of sizes. Because I sometimes look at a base and go, that model looks puny on that size base because I don't care about the rules. I love that. Um, so I, I put my daughters a cane, fly ladies on slightly larger bases. And I remember Dan Bradshaw going, they're on the wrong size bases. And I was like, I know. He's like, you won't be able to play them. I was like, against you. <laughs> 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 and he was like, but you, I was like, is it bad for you or is it bad for me? I was like, well, it's bad for you because I can get more models around it. I was like, well, why are you complaining? Yeah, who cares? <laughs> I remember ninth edition, I remember getting super stressed about bolt base sizes. Where I, was, I can't remember what I was building. And I was like, I want to put it on a slightly bigger base because it's a character or something. And I don't feel like this looks right. And it doesn't mm. look like prestigious enough to be the character. And I was messaging people going, do you think they'll care that I've gone from 27.5 or 28 mil to 32 mil? two millimetres either side, right? Yeah. And, I, and oh, it should be fine. And I got to the point where I was like, why am I fucking out yeah. four millimetres? Who really cares? So something you'll notice with my Venturally Nobles is all my leaders are on 32 mil rounds and all my infantry are on 25 because then my leaders stand out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, that's just mm. the thing. <laughs> there you go. Bases, right? Bases. <laughs> Andy. <laughs> Was it a 2v1 or two rounds of 1v1 in the car park when you left the painting phase? Uh, it was uh, 2v1. And you won? 
I won. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> Helped that I tied the shoelaces <laughs> down before the, uh, we finished the chat. <laughs> Uh, Joe says, "What did Liam offer you behind the scenes, which was the tipping for, p- tipping point for your appearance?" Uh, Merkin made out of grass tufts. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all stuck on by me. Uh, have you named Have you named any of the houses of your ventrally nobles, and what are they? Uh, I haven't, no. Um, but I I'm going to say this now because it will be coming out soonish. Um, there is a 40k D and D thing that me and Suggs are a part of. That's going to be hitting sometime in the middle of springtime. Oh, I think to... I saw some photos of you filming. That. Yes, yeah. So it was there was supposed to be an announcement trailer a couple of weeks back, but um, the two um, producers that did it and they're quite busy. We've got quite a big workflow to do, um, so they're still working through it. But I have a character in that who is it's kind of like, imagine Necromunda adjacent style kind of storyline. There's a hive city. And I've got a noble who's from like one of the upper hive noble houses that's called Darjeeling. He, or da, he, he, their surname is Darjeel, and they're the, known as the Darjeelings. And their house symbol is a tea bag, like a diamond. Love it. Um, and it has lots of different things on it, but uh, I, I, I got too in depth in making tea bag symbologies <laughs> for my house. Um, of course you did. To the, to the fact that I made like lesser versions of the house that do other parts of trade of tea. There's the pyramids, there's like the rounds, because obviously the traditional square put sideways looks like a diamond. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there was a lot involved in that. <laughs> so that's I should rab- bring that into the Venture of the Nobles. That's the rabbit hole we dumbled down. I love, it. <laughs> I love that stuff. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, we've got a few left. Jake says, do you still have contact with Duncan? If so, can you convince him to come on Liam's show or do an X Games Workshop group interview? Group interview or group therapy? Oh, a bit of, uh, yeah, definitely a bit of both, I think. Um, he's busy. I mean, I tried to get him onto the painting phase and usually it was not that he didn't want to come onto the painting phase because I would joke often, like, ask Duncan, he wouldn't come on. It was more of a joke because uh, he did reach out to me and went, uh, I've been getting all this noise from my, my followers saying that you've asked me and I've not come on. I'm like... Well, I was only joking. I, yeah. I, I, I've asked you, that was ages ago, but you were busy at LVO and this, that, and the other. The thing I found with Duncan is he's very busy. He yeah, just yeah. Do, And his workflow is intense. I tend to um, focus my filming for the first half of the week, which in there includes editing as well, so my patrons can get it, and then they give me feedback. So I use Thursday for my feedback, and then Friday's like one-to-one tuitions with... Um, the higher tiers of yeah. patrons. So my, my week tends to be like one video a week on average, whereas Duncan, I still think he's like doing two, two, three yeah, a videos lot, yeah. a week. So he has quite, and I've said many times, like, you know, do you want to come on the channel or do you want to go for a tea or something like that? And it's always like late at night. And I'm like, well, that's when I'm tucking my lad in. So, yeah. uh, but I'm sure at some point, stars will align. Amazing. But yes. It's nice that you're still in touch with me. Yeah, least. yeah, I dropped a message. You um, mentioned about the... <laughs> The one thick coat uh, April Fools that I did. I just said, "Oh, by the way, I've just done this. Um, hope you're not going to get offended." And he was like, "Oh, I'm Poland at the minute, so I'll watch it when I get back." And I was like, "Well, hope you won't get offended then." <laughs> <laughs> Which you won't, because I already talked to um, yeah. Transatlantic Games mentioned that I was doing it. So cool. Yeah, it's fun. Thank you, Mr. Jake. Always looking out for me. Kieran says, with the release of the previously unreleased Bretonian Lord for Old World, do you think there is a chance that some of the unreleased models, like the Dwarf Tank, will be greenlit for Old World or Age of Sigmar? Yeah, I, I don't know about the Dwarf Tank. Um, I don't know if I've made that awkward or not by doing my own video about the Dwarf Tank, but it is the assets there, the mould is still there somewhere at office because it will be a steel mould because it's a plastic kit. Um, I do know some story about that Bretonian Knight because the sculptor and the painter didn't want that to be released because there was both tests for both the sculptor and the painter and someone went ahead and released it without checking if that was actually like, they, they weren't proud of those models. But then, you know, if you want the content, sometimes if it's there, do it. I, I suppose they've done the thing for workshop, they don't get a say. But I do think if you're a sculptor and you've got ownership and like that was a test for your trainee program, you probably don't want the world to see it. Yeah. Because if you're a really, really good high-end sculptor now and they see that, they'll be like, oh, he's lost his touch, hasn't he? Bearing yeah. in mind that was 15 years ago. Um, so, yes, I foresee there being some old stuff coming out, um, but there's a reason why it wasn't released the first time round. Well, when we saw that Britannian Lord, I was like, oh, no. Mm-hmm. That should have never been released. Yeah. They should have kept that behind closed doors. That, that, that's, that, I mean, I agree. It, there's a reason why it wasn't released the first time, because people had standards <laughs> yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kieran. Adrian says, uh, which is the best UK event and what makes it stand out? Excluding Salute, I think he says. Okay, yeah. I, so I've been... There's one, a small one called Chillcon. It's quite chilled. I took my wife to that because it's chilled. 
She still hated it. No, she didn't, she didn't hate it. She's just not, she doesn't like going to events. I have to go through all the clothes shops when she goes yeah, shopping. Yeah, oh, don't, don't. And, you know, sometimes I, she, she goes to like, she goes through the door, goes in, and I'm like, I'm just going to go around town and have a look at some of my shops and come back. She's still there. Yeah. And that's like been 20 minutes. So like, Does she look on. through that shop for 20 minutes and then go through 14 other shops for 20 minutes and then go back to the first one that she was in and finally buy something? Used to, not so much these days. <laughs> but yes, that definitely used to be the case. But um, yeah, yeah, I have to do that. But she, you know, she had to endure one event, um, which was, no, it was great. It was chill kind of, I, I'd say that's quite nice and chilled. If you've never been to one or you want to go to an event, that's, that's got a few retail stands. It's got like some gaming areas you can jump, join in on. The Expo, I'd say, is the best, but it is quite hectic and busy. UK especially Games Saturday. Expo. Yeah, UK Games Expo. Yeah, it's a big one, isn't it? But it's good for the whole family because there's lots of like wargaming stuff, lots of board gaming stuff, lots of other random stuff. But if you've got kids, there's areas for kids as well, like gaming areas that you can like, like there was like pigs on trampolines last year, and I was like, oh, I bet China would like that. So I'm taking my lad this year. Okay. So he'll probably go on the Sunday because I think Saturday will be a bit too much for him because he doesn't do well with loud noises. Yeah, fair. Um, so, um, okay. and we'll see. How it goes, but cool. yeah, I'd say UK Games Expo. I've not been. I need to go actually. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. It's huge. Carl says, "Do you?" I think we've kind of answered this one, but I'll, I'll read it anyway because I read all the famous questions. Do you think focus on being super competitive can spoil tabletop war games in general? I mean, we kind of touched on that with the, yeah. the previous question. I think our kind of overarching. I think it depends is yes. on the focus, but yeah, if the focus is just you being focused on it, then that's fine because that's your choice, right? But yeah, for the companies to be so super focused yeah. on it, then definitely not a good idea. We've got three more. Oh wow. The, Quite interesting, actually. If you were CEO of Games, this is from Dave. If you were CEO of Games Workshop, what overarching strategic change would you make? Mm. So, I'm not a CEO. I know nothing about running businesses, even my own. Uh, <laughs> I would. I would not tell anyone I'm the CEO, and I would sit in every department across the business for a week to see how each department's run. And then, because that, there was one CEO who used to hang around departments and sit with them. Um, he did get a bit of stick for a time, uh, Mark Wells. I think he's a great guy because he knew everyone by name. He knew a little bit about each of you, but he also knew what you did and where you were. Um, so there'll be times that I'd be sitting painting. And I was probably, I'd moved from retail to the design studio. At this point, I probably didn't even have much in the way of like White Dwarf articles or uh, a presence. But he'd come and just sit down and go, oh, Chris, I, I, I know you, you do armies and stuff. Can you help me with this? I'm, my, my lad wants to do a thing and <laughs> he'll be talking about hobby and stuff. But he knew me by name and there was like one year I was getting a cup of tea and he'll be like, um, hey, how you doing, Chris? How's it going? I'll be like, oh, that's good. Hey, what, what are you painting at the moment? See, yeah, of course I'm going to tell him what I'm painting. He's like, you know, he's, the, he's, he's in charge of the business. There's no NDA required here. So I'll be talking, he's like, oh, well, you're coming up for your anniversary soon, aren't you? You got married last year, didn't you? I was like, how do you know all this? Unless there's someone with like a, an yeah, earpiece, yeah, yeah. like going, going, yes, Chris Peach got married last year to Elizabeth, blah, 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 blah. Uh, um, so, he, but he used to spend time going round, yeah. and I think that he had a lot more um, respect from the staff as well, and people could approach him. I'm not saying that the current CEO doesn't have that, but I do think there's a lot of disconnect between like the higher ups in comparison to what the staff do. And I think that's filtered by the <laughs> bullshit of the middle managers because the middle managers screw up. They then lie to the managers above them yep. to cover their backs as opposed to being honest going, I screwed up, yep. I need to fix this. And I then that gives you even more work and that's, that's not changed for like 10, 10 If you understand your people, I, I say this a million times, I've said it a million times before, I've said it a million times again, I, I used to have this attitude when I used to manage myself. If you look after your staff, your staff look after your business. Yeah. This is very, very, very simple. Yeah, yeah. So if you, as a CEO, had that level of respect, that level of engagement with individuals, and you understood their trials, their tribulations, their difficulties, you know, et cetera, then ultimately, and, and you work to help fix those, ultimately you end up with start, like happier, more engaged staff, mm. and they do better work. Yeah, yeah. It's just how it works, yeah. right? So that's interesting. Yeah. It's a bit, little bit of undercover boss for a few weeks. Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, you'd have your own responsibilities as CEO, so you'd have to, like, manage that, but then, you know, I'm sure you can find a way of doing it because others have done it yeah. in the past. But I definitely think if some of the higher ups knew what was actually going off in the departments, they'd have a bit more clued up that it's the middle managers that tend to be the problem. And it's not get rid of the middle, middle managers, it's educate them to yes. be better managers. Because I've had it so many times where they've just lied and then put the onus on you, so then you have more work to do. Yep. And it's like, why am I 
why am I in the, the shit here? Because all I've done is like, I've hit my deadline that you gave me, but the deadline that you gave me was wrong because you didn't get the information correctly yeah, or you yeah, didn't yeah. ask the right questions. Um, and that's happened loads of times. So, it's yeah. a shame. Yeah. Anyway, that's a good question, Dave. Carl says... Very good question. Uh, actually, we'll leave Carl's one to right at the end, and there's a reason for it. Oh. Uh, Joe then just joined the group. Okay. I mean, he's next door, <laughs> and said, if you were to have a model made of you, yeah. what game would it be for, and what would you be armed with? I would... Oh, can I pick two? Yes. Can I pick two, Joe? I'd be eventually noble. I'd have eventually noble as a collector's edition. Yeah. Um, I would be armed with a sabre and a plasma pistol, because I like to overcharge my plasma pistol. I'd also like an option in that set, which is just two smoking boots, <laughs> uh, which should said las- uh, um, pl- plasma pistol explode, um, which I'll share later with some of my figures. Um, and I'd also have an Age of Sigma um, figure as well, yeah. uh, which would probably be a normal Citizen Sigma guy, just a, just a rank and file Citizen Sigma guy, dressed in the same armor that I wear when I do reenactment. And it's just like really bare bones. A really naff character that when the when he joins the unit, he makes the unit worse because he's not very good at fighting. <laughs> he's a negative modifier. He's a negative modifier. Yeah, I like it. But you have to put him in one unit in your army. Yeah, it's you, mad. When you have that model, he has to go in one unit. Yeah. And it makes it worse. Perfect. You Jeff. can't remove him as a casualty. So yeah. he just stays bad to the end. He has to stay until the end. Love it. <laughs> uh, and then, so thank, you, thank you, Joe, despite being next door. He has to get involved, doesn't he? Anyway, the last question was from Carl, and I actually quite like it as a way to sort of wrap this mm. up before we then say goodbye. It just simply says, what's next for Peachy? <sighs> Ooh. Yeah, good, it's good, that good. One, isn't it? Yes, I like that. Um, there's lots of things that are next, I think, for Peachy. I, um, I'm looking at doing a podcast with Suggs, um, which is just me and her just w- waffling. Yeah. Um, Rob's going to look at doing some of the tech to that. Um, I don't think it's going to compete with anything you're doing, so you should be fine. Um, I don't know. We don't even have a name. You and Louise were oh, Rob producing so it. So I think. Hey, Liam, let's show you. Do we just piss all over it? Uh, people. So knowing how I am and knowing how Louise is, we will probably never finish a conversation. <laughs> 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 so it'll be very much sidetracking all the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's just a bit of fun. I don't know how that will work. So that's something down the line. For me personally, I would like to see. Um, me try lots, do, do lots more stuff like this, yeah. you know, more collaborations with folks. Um, just because, like, like we were saying earlier, it's just nice to be able to do this kind of stuff. And actually, when I was driving down, I was like, this is my life now. This is yeah, great. Cool, isn't it? Um, I'm driving down to go and chat some cool hobby and play some cool games, and I'm all for it. I could never have done this before. Um, so it was really exciting. Down the long term, um, I mentioned this on the Siege Studio thing, because um, I know how hard it is and how awkward it is. I'd like to, at some point, I don't know, even if it's possible with my skill set or the finances I have, but to have a place, imagine like this, but with like slightly bigger, um, with like 20 booths. Not saying this is small, but like bigger to have like lots of like booths for people to launch their own little channel that's then rented. So it's like a rented space potentially. Um, that you could be, it could be a fully equipped one that has lights, laptop, cameras in it, and that obviously the rent depends on what's yeah. in there, or you can just have an empty space that you bring your stuff to um, until you, you're happy with your channel and it builds up enough that you can go and get your own space, or it might be something you rent for the, for the foreseeable, depending on how well your channel does or whatever. It doesn't that have to be. That sounds phenomenal. Just in a thought, it was just something I was thinking, right, from my own journey, it was hard, and if there was a space, like even now, like my spare bedroom is small. Um, to do my filming, and, I'm, and I was looking at, there's a local area, and they, they do these, um, you know you get storage companies, they have loads of cargo containers, which yeah. are turned to small like micro offices, and I was like, oh, I'll have a look at that. It's quite costly yep. for the size. I would expect <clears> a little bit more space for the, the amount you're paying. Um, so I'll be like, hmm. So you could get a, a room, which is a re- reasonable rate, but then if you, if you had the finances or you had savings and you can get all the equipment with it, you don't have to worry about anything. Um, but yeah, it's like 20 years from now. Probably. I like that concept. Well, yeah. we, when, I, when I incorporated the business recently, um, because the channel's been growing, uh, I incorporated it as a media group. Because, mm. And I like the concept. I, we, I spoke about this on stream in the past, actually. I like the concept of selling some kind of service where we help get people off the ground, which is similar. Maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe there's conversations there in the future, Peachy. Yeah, like that, that sounds super cool, though. I like that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's one angle. Definitely having my own rule system and my own models. Oh, love it. Big fan of XCOM, the computer game, so I'd love to, at some point, have a range of figures. I know there's a board game out there and stuff, but yeah. 
bespoke figures that are customizable as well. Because um, the great thing, if you, I don't know if you've ever played XCOM, it's sort of like a strategy game. You, you're basically Earth's last defense against aliens, and there's an XCOM 2 where the aliens warning you the resistance and, and whatever. But it's just good fun where you just go around shooting different types of aliens and you equip your guys with different weaponry and this, that, and the other. It's like any kind of generic sci fi, yeah. but I just, I don't know, there's something about that game that I, that, I don't know, I really like. And it's what well, it was always good initially, you'd like have a pool of recruits, and they're all from different nations of the world. And you just, that it's not really about the, the person you get, because it could be a man or a woman. You get a man or a woman, and it could be like, I don't know, Priya from India, and then like, I don't know, Dick Stroker from the US or whatever. <laughs> and you were like, cool, well, he's going to be a ranger and she's going to be heavy weapons and then see how they cope. And then you might get really attached to them. You play lots of games, very much like Necromunda, more time, you get really attached to them. One game, just one alien snipers them in the face and the dead. And you're like, <laughs> do I restart the entire <laughs> game? Because I've nearly finished it. I once was res myself, because I named myself in this game, I had a peachy model, and I was rescuing Jason Statham because he got taken out. Jason Statham was like my top sniper, and he'd been taken out, and you have like a time limit on XCOM 2, and one of the ones you had to um, evacuate, you had to get a scientist, which we got off, and he, they got exfilled, um, and then we had to you know, get all the rest of the guys. We had so many turns, and then Jason Statham, like an idiot, gets shot, falls off a building, and he's bleeding out. He's got a three turns to bleed out. I'm kind of like a medic stroke uh, close combat guy. So I go down, staunch the blood, carry him on my shoulder, start rappelling up. I'm literally about to, to get into the, because um, you, you click where you want your guys to move because you have like a couple of actions and you like, oh, I can make it to the, uh, the Sky Ranger. And I go to the Sky Ranger and then I'll rappel up. Fantastic. And the, the aliens can overwatch and they snipered me and Jason Statham off the hill. I died oh, no. and he carried on bleeding out. All that for like some I other believe, bold guy. I believe that one day you probably could rescue Jason Statham. Well, actually, the, this is a great thing. I, I accepted my fate uh, and died, <laughs> continued, and then there was a mission to rescue Jason Statham because the aliens will, if they're bleeding out of the wounded, they get captured and can become like a, an objective for a capture yeah. um, scenario later on. So we was able to get Jason Statham again. I didn't realise this at the time, otherwise I would have just left him. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Jason. You're watching. You'd have just left you. I'll just, just you know, left I leave men behind. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. I love it. So more collaborations, big future plans to help other people, maybe a game system and rules. Yeah, I love yeah. it. There's some I, I love one of the, the things I love about where we are now, where you and I are now, is actually really the future can be anything you want it to be yeah, to some yeah. degree. Um, back to your one of your points, collaborations for me has been one of the most things, mm. most fun things I've been doing since doing this. And now with this space, which allows us to do more of it, yeah. it's been great. So, you know. Awesome. I mean, who doesn't want to sit on one of these leather chairs yeah. stroking real deer? Exactly. Real deer. Exactly. <laughs> real deer. Uh, anyway, you've been absolutely fucking incredible. This, did, this, I beat, did I beat Josh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think considerably. <laughs> Like, I think we're half an hour over Josh's timeline. Sorry. And there's an actual part in that podcast with Josh where he's like, if I see Peachy's interview with you is longer than my one, you're coming off my Christmas card list. <laughs> I'll send you one instead. So I'm getting one less Christmas card this year. Um, but thank you so much for coming down. You've been absolutely incredible. Um, oh, like I said to you me. right at the start, like it, for me, it's a bit surreal. As a person I used to watch on Warhammer TV, mm. now having you sat here, it was surreal anyway when I went to Painting Phase back in, I think it was January time. Yeah, yeah. Chatted. Yeah, it was um, after Christmas, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm hoping this won't be the last time we see you in the studio. No, no. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice, as you call it, a kind drive. It's a kind drive, isn't it? It's, it's a right. kind drive. Yeah. It is a kind drive. I enjoyed the drive. I was, so I, as a motorcyclist, been riding motorcycles for years. Um, I've only done two trips on my own, uh, three trips on my own in the car. Um, one was to like some RAF base, RAF Lake and Heath, which was fun. Um, I can't remember what one was. And then obviously this one. So I actually, I feel so liberated just doing yeah. it. Because on the bike, I could do it on the bike. I've done loads of trips on, on my own on the bike, but in a car, hire a car. It's just like, it's warm. Well, you will be it's more great. than welcome whenever you want to come down. No, so thank we you can, very I much reckon we could probably do another three, three and a half hour podcast anyway, quite easily. When I get a sense. larger space, I'll have you and we'll do you, some painting. 100% sounds amazing. Painting thank you so much sharp. for coming. Uh, if you guys haven't already, uh, I, if you've made it this far, by the way, well done. <laughs> if you haven't already, check out those links below. Make sure you hit subscribe to Peachy's new channel and all the cool content that will be coming up soon. The man's amazing, and we wish him obviously all the best. Uh, with your channel. Uh, if you are watching this, like I said at the start, if you're watching this early and you're watching this when it came out, thank you so much for being a channel member. You guys are incredible. And if you're watching after the fact, you can get access to these early if you're a channel member. But otherwise, thanks for watching anyway. Stick your comments below. 
talk about anything we've talked about. I read every single comment. I might not reply to all of them, but I read every comment. It's mm. hard work, actually. It is. By yeah, the way, it is. it's really it, there's, there's a lot of comments. A lot yeah. Of uh, I've got a tea, baby. I need to go for a pee. Do you? Mm. Okay, we should probably let him go there. You people are incredible. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.